The Path of Daggers by Robert Jordan Who would sup with the mighty must climb the path of daggers. Anonymous notation found inked in the margin of a manuscript history believed to date to the time of Arthur Hawkwing of the last days of the Tovan conclaves. On the heights, all paths are paved with daggers. Old Shanchan saying. Prologue Deceptive Appearances Ethaniel had seen mountains lower than these misnamed black hills, great lopsided heaps of half-buried boulders webbed with steep, twisting passes. A number of those passes would have given a goat pause. You could travel three days through drought-withered forests and brown-grassed meadows without seeing a single sign of human habitation, then suddenly find yourself within half a day of seven or eight tiny villages, all ignorant of the world. The Black Hills were a rugged place for farmers, away from the trade routes, and harsher now than usual. A gaunt leopard that should have vanished at the sight of men watched from a steep slope not forty paces away as she rode past with her armored escort. Westward vultures wheeled patient circles like an omen. Not a cloud marred the blood-red sun, yet there were clouds of a sort. When the warm wind blew, it raised walls of dust. With fifty of her best men at her heels, Ethaniel rode unconcernedly and unhurriedly. Unlike her near-legendary ancestor, Surasa, she had no illusion that the weather would heed her wishes just because she held the throne of the clouds, while, as for haste, their carefully coded, closely guarded letters had agreed on the order of march, and that had been determined by each person's need to travel without attracting notice. Not an easy task. Some had thought it impossible. Frowning, she considered the luck that had let her come this far without having to kill anyone, avoiding those fly-speck villages even when it meant days added to the journey. The few Ogier steading presented no problem. Ogier paid little heed to what happened among humans most times, and less than usual of late, it seemed. But the villages... They were too small to hold eyes and ears for the White Tower, or for this fellow who claimed to be the Dragon Reborn. Perhaps he was. She could not decide which way would be worse. Too small, yet peddlers did pass through eventually. Peddlers carried as much gossip as trade goods, and they spoke to people who spoke to other people, rumor flowing like an ever-branching river through the Black Hills and into the world outside. With a few words, a single shepherd who had escaped notice could light a signal fire seen five hundred leagues off, the sort of signal fire that set woods and grasslands aflame, and cities, maybe, nations. Did I make the right choice, Sarila? Vexed at herself, Ethaniel grimaced. She might not be a girl any longer, but her few gray hairs hardly counted her old enough to let her mindless tongue flap in the breeze. The decision was made. It had been on her mind, though. Light's truth she was not so unconcerned as she wanted to be. Ethaniel's first counselor healed her dun mare closer to the queen's sleek black gelding. Round face placid, dark eyes considering, Lady Sarila could have been a farm wife suddenly stuck into a noblewoman's riding dress, but the mind behind those plain, sweaty features was as sharp as any eyes that eyes. The other choices only carry different risks, not lesser, she said smoothly. Stout, yet as graceful in her saddle as she was at dancing, Sarila was always smooth. Not oily or false, just completely unflappable. Whatever the truth, Majesty, the White Tower appears to be paralyzed as well as shattered. You could have sat watching the blight while the world crumbled behind you. You could have, if you were someone else. The simple need to act. Was that what had brought her here? Well, if the White Tower would not or could not do what had to be done, then someone must. What good to guard the blight if the world did crumble behind her? Ethaniel looked to the slender man riding at her other side, 
white streaks at his temples giving him a supercilious air, the ornately sheathed sword of Kiru Khan resting in the crook of one arm. It was called the sword of Kiru Khan, at any rate, and the fabled warrior queen of Aramail might have carried it. The blade was ancient, some said power wrought. The two-handed hilt lay toward her as tradition demanded, though she herself was not about to try using a sword like some fire-brained Saldean. A queen was supposed to think, lead, and command, which no one could manage while trying to do what any soldier in her army could do better. And you, sword-bearer, she said, do you have any qualms at this late hour? Lord Baldir twisted in his gold-worked saddle to glance back at the banners carried by horsemen behind them, cased in tooled leather and embroidered velvet. I don't like hiding who I am, Majesty, he said fussily, straightening around. The world will know us soon enough and what we've done, or tried to do. We'll end dead, or in the histories, or both, so they might as well know what names to write. Baldir had a biting tongue, and he affected to care more for music and his clothes than anything else. That well-cut blue coat was the third he had worn already today. But as with Sarila, appearances deceived. The sword-bearer to the throne of the clouds bore responsibilities much heavier than that sword in its jeweled scabbard. Since the death of her husband some twenty years ago, Baldir had commanded the armies of Kandor for her in the field, and most of her soldiers would have followed him to Sheol Ghul itself. He was not counted among the great captains, but he knew when to fight and when not, as well as how to win. The meeting place must be just ahead, Sir Isla said suddenly, just as Athenial saw the scout Baldir had sent forward, a sly fellow named Lomas, who wore a fox-head crest on his helmet, rein in atop the peak of the pass ahead. With his lance slanted, he made the arm gesture for assembly point in sight. Baldir swung his heavy-shouldered gelding and bellowed a command for the escort to halt. He could bellow, had a mind to, then spurred the bay to catch up to her and Sarila. It was to be a meeting between long-standing allies, but as they rode past Lomas, Baldir gave the lean-faced man a curt order to watch and relay, should anything go wrong. Lomas would signal the escort forward to bring their queen out. Athenial sighed faintly when Sarila nodded approval at the command. Allies of long standing, yet the times bred suspicion like flies on a midden. What they were about stirred the heap and set the flies swirling. Too many rulers to the south had died or vanished in the last year for her to feel any comfort in wearing a crown. Too many lands had been smashed as thoroughly as an army of Trollocs could have achieved. Whoever he was, this Al Thor fellow had much to answer for. Much. Beyond Lomas, the pass opened into a shallow bowl almost too small to be named a valley, with trees too widely spaced to be called a thicket. Leather leaf and blue fir and three-needle pine held to some green, along with a few oaks, but the rest were sheathed in brown if not bare-branched. To the south, however, lay what had made this spot a good choice for meeting. A slender spire like a column of gleaming golden lace lay slanting and partly buried in the bare hillside, a good seventy paces of it showing above the treetops. Every child in the Black Hills old enough to run off leading strings knew of it, but there was not a village inside four days' travel, nor would anyone come within ten miles willingly. The stories of this place spoke of mad visions, of the dead walking, and death at touching the spire. Athenial did not consider herself fanciful, yet she shivered slightly. Neon said the spire was a fragment from the Age of Legends, and harmless. With luck, the Aes Sedai had no reason to recall that conversation of years ago. A pity the dead could not be made to walk here. Legend said Kiru Khan had beheaded a false dragon with her own hands, and borne two sons by another man who could channel, or maybe the same one. She might have known how to go about their purpose and survive. As expected, the first pair of those Athenial had come to meet was waiting, each with two attendants. 
Paitar Nachiman had many more creases in his long face than the stunningly handsome older man she had admired as a girl, not to mention too little hair and most of that gray. Fortunately, he had relinquished the Arafelin fashion for braids and wore his hair cut short. But he sat his saddle straight-backed. His shoulders needed no padding in that embroidered green silk coat, and she knew he still could wield the sword at his hip with vigor and skill. Isar Togita, square-faced and his scalp shaved except for a white topknot, his plain coat the color of old bronze, was a head shorter than the king of Arafel, and slighter, yet he made Pytar look almost soft. Isar of Shinar did not scowl. If anything, a touch of sadness seemed permanent in his eyes, but he might have been made from the same metal as the long sword on his back. She trusted both men, and hoped their familial connections helped secure that trust. Alliances by marriage had always bound the borderlands together as much as their war against the Blight did, and she had a daughter wed to Isar's third son, and a son to Pytar's favorite granddaughter, as well as a brother and two sisters married into their houses. Their companions appeared as different as their kings, as always, Ishigari Teresian looked just risen from a stupor after a drunken feast, as fat a man as she had ever seen in a saddle. His fine red coat was rumpled, his eyes bleary, his cheeks unshaven. By contrast, Kirill Shianri, tall and lean, and nearly as elegant as Baldir, despite the dust and sweat on his face, with silver bells on his boot tops and gloves as well as fastened to his braids, he wore his usual expression of dissatisfaction, and had a way of always peering coolly down his prominent nose at anyone but Pytar. Shianri really was a fool in many ways. Arafelin kings rarely made much pretense of listening to counselors, relying instead on their queens, but he was more than he appeared at a glance. Agomar Jagad could have been a larger version of Isar a simple, plainly garbed man of steel and stone with more weapons hung about him than Baldir carried, sudden death waiting to be unleashed. While Alasun Chulin was as slim as Sarila was stout, as pretty as Sarila was plain, and as fiery as Sarila was calm. Alasun seemed born to her fine blue silks. It was well to remember that judging Sarila by her surface was a mistake, too. Peace and the light favor you, Athenial of Candor, Isar said gruffly as Athenial reigned in before them, and at the same time Pytar intoned, The light embrace you, Athenial of Candor. Pytar still had a voice to make women's hearts beat faster, and a wife who knew he was hers to his boot soles. Athenial doubted that Manuki had ever had a jealous moment in her life, or cause for one. She made her own greetings just as short, ending with a direct, I hope you've come this far without detection. Isar snorted and leaned on his cantle, eyeing her grimly. A hard man, but eleven years widowed and still mourning. He had written poetry for his wife. There was always more than the surface. If we've been seen, Athaniel, he grumbled, then we might as well turn back now. You speak of turning back already? Between his tone and a flip of his tasseled reins, Shianri managed to combine disdain with barely enough civility to forestall a challenge. Even so, Agomar studied him coldly, shifting in his saddle slightly, a man recalling where each of his weapons was placed. Old allies in many battles along the Blight, but those new suspicions swirled. Alice soon made her mount dance a gray mare as tall as a warhorse. The thin white streaks in her long black hair suddenly seemed crests on a helmet, and her eyes made it easy to forget that Shinaran women neither trained with weapons nor fought duels. Her title was simply Shatayan of the Royal Household, yet whoever believed any Shatayan's influence stopped at ordering the cooks and maids and vittlers made a grave error. Foolhardiness is not courage, Lord Shianri. We leave the Blight all but unguarded, and if we fail, maybe even if we succeed, some of us could find our heads on spikes. Perhaps all of us will. The White Power may well see to it, if this Althor does not. 
The blight seems almost asleep, Teresian muttered, whiskers rasping as he rubbed his fleshy chin. I've never seen it so quiet. The shadow never sleeps, Jagad put in quietly, and Teresian nodded as if that, too, was something to consider. Agomar was the best general of them all, one of the best to be found anywhere, but Teresian's place at Pytar's right hand had not come because he was a good drinking companion. What I've left behind can guard the blight short of the Trolloc Wars coming again, Athenial said in a firm voice. I trust you've all done as well. It hardly matters, though. Does anyone believe we truly can turn back now? She made that last question dry, expecting no answer, but she received one. Turn back? A young woman's high voice demanded behind her. Tenobia of Saldeia galloped into the gathering, drawing her white gelding up so that he reared flamboyantly. Thick lines of pearls marched down the dark gray sleeves of her narrow-skirted riding habit, while red and gold embroidery swirled thickly to emphasize the narrowness of her waist and the roundness of her bosom. Tall for a woman, she managed to be pretty, if not beautiful, despite a nose that was overbold at best. Large, tilted eyes of a dark, deep blue certainly helped, but so did a confidence in herself so strong that she seemed to glow with it. As expected, the Queen of Saldea was accompanied only by Kalyan Ramsin, one of her numerous uncles, a scarred and grizzled man with the face of an eagle and thick mustaches that curved down around his mouth. Tenobia Kazadi tolerated the Council of Soldiers, but no one else. "'I will not turn back,' she went on fiercely. "'Whatever the rest of you do. "'I sent my dear Uncle Davram to bring me the head of the false dragon Mazram Taim, "'and now he and Taim both follow this Al Thor, if I can believe half what I hear. "'I have close to fifty thousand men behind me, and whatever you decide, "'I will not turn back until my uncle and Al Thor learn exactly who rules Saldea. The Senniel exchanged glances with Sarila and Baldir while Pytar and Isar began telling Tenobia that they also meant to keep on. Sarila gave her head the smallest shake, made the slightest shrug. Baldir rolled his eyes openly. Senniel had not exactly hoped Tenobia might decide at the last to stay away, but the girl would surely make difficulties. Saldeans were a strange lot. Athenial had often wondered how her sister Ainoni managed so well, married to yet another of Tenobia's uncles. Yet Tenobia carried that strangeness to extremes. You expected showiness from any Saldean, but Tenobia took delight in shocking Domani and making Altaran seem drab. Saldean tempers were legendary. Hers was wildfire and a high wind, and you could never tell what would provide the spark. Athenial did not even want to think of the difficulty in getting the woman to listen to reason when she did not want to. Only Davram Bashir had ever been able to do that. And then there was the question of marriage. Tenobia was still young, though years past the age she should have wed. Marriage was a duty for any member of a ruling house, the more so for a ruler. Alliances had to be made, an heir provided. Yet Athenial had never considered the girl for any of her own sons. Tenobia's requirements for a husband were on a level with everything else about her. He must be able to face and slay a dozen Murdral at once, while playing the harp and composing poetry. He must be able to confound scholars while riding a horse down a sheer cliff, or perhaps up it. Of course, he would have to defer to her. She was a queen, after all except that sometimes Tenobia would expect him to ignore whatever she said and toss her over his shoulder. The girl wanted exactly that. And the light help him if he chose to toss when she wanted deference, or to defer when she wanted the other. She never said any of this right out, but any woman with wits who had heard her talk about men could piece it together in short order. Tenobia would die a maiden, which meant her uncle Davram would succeed— if she left him alive after this, or else Davram's heir. A word caught Athenial's ear and jerked her upright in her saddle. She should have been paying attention. Too much was at stake. Aes Sedai, she said sharply. What about Aes Sedai? 
save for Pytars, their white tower advisers had all left at news of the troubles in the tower, her own Neon and Isar's Iceling vanishing without a trace. If Aes Sedai had gained a hint of their plans, well, Aes Sedai always had plans of their own. Always. She would dislike discovering that she was putting her hands into two hornet nests, not just one. Pytar shrugged, looking a trifle embarrassed. That was no small trick for him. He, like Sarila, let nothing upset him. You hardly expected me to leave Koladara behind, Asenil, he said in soothing tones, even if I could have kept the preparations from her. She had not. His favorite sister was Aes Sedai, and Kiruna had given him a deep fondness for the tower. Esenil had not expected it, but she had hoped. Koladara had visitors, he continued, seven of them. Bringing them along seemed prudent under the circumstances. Fortunately, they require little convincing, none in truth. The light illumine and preserve our souls, Esenil breathed, and heard near echoes from Sarila and Baldir. Eight, sisters, Pytar? Eight? The White Tower surely knew every move they intended now. And I have five more, Tenobia put in, as if announcing she had a new pair of slippers. They found me just before I left Saldea. By chance, I'm sure, they appeared as surprised as I was. Once they learned what I was doing, I still don't know how they did, but they did. Once they learned, I was sure they'd go scurrying to find Mamara. Her brows furrowed in a momentary glare. Elida had miscalculated badly in sending a sister to try bullying Tenobia. Instead, she finished, Elysian and the rest were more intent on secrecy than I. Even so, Ephaniel insisted, thirteen sisters. All that is needed is for one of them to find some way to send a message, a few lines, a soldier or a maid intimidated. Does any of you think you can stop them? The dice are out of the cup, Pytar said simply. What was done was done. Arafelin were almost as odd as Saldaeans in Nathaniel's book. Further south, Isar added, it may be well to have thirteen eyes to die with us. That brought a silence while the implications hung in the air. No one wanted to voice them. This was far different from facing the blight. Tenobia gave a sudden shocking laugh. Her gelding tried to dance, but she settled him. I mean to press south as fast as I can, but I invite you all to dine with me in my camp tonight. You can speak with Elysian and her friends and see whether your judgment matches mine. Perhaps tomorrow night we can all gather in Pytar's camp and question his Koladara's friends. The suggestion was so sensible, so obviously necessary, that it brought instant agreement. And then Tenobia added, as if an afterthought, My uncle Kalyan would be honored if you allowed him to sit beside you tonight, Athaniel. He admires you greatly. Esenil glanced toward Kalyan Ramsin. The fellow had sat his horse silently behind Tenobia, never speaking, hardly seeming to breathe. She merely glanced at him, and for an instant that grizzled eagle unhooded his eyes. For an instant she saw something she had not seen since her Brees died, a man looking not at a queen, but at a woman. The shock of it was a blow, taking her breath. Tenobia's eyes darted from her uncle to Athenial, her tiny smile quite satisfied. Outrage flared in Athenial. That smile made it all clear as spring water, if Kalyan's eyes had not. This chit of a girl thought to marry off this fellow to her? This child presumed to— Suddenly ruefulness replaced fury. She herself had been younger when she arranged her widowed sister Nazelle's wedding. A matter of state, yet Nazelle had come to love Lord Ismic, despite all her protests in the beginning. Athaniel had been arranging others' marriages for so long that she had never considered that her own would make a very strong tie. She looked at Kalyan again, a longer look. His leathery face was all proper respect once more, yet she saw his eyes as they had been. Any consort she chose would have to be a hard man, but she had always demanded a chance of love for her children's marriages, if not her siblings, and she would do no less for herself. 
Instead of wasting daylight on chatter, she said, more breathless than she could have wished, let us do what we came for. The light sear her soul. She was a woman grown, not a girl meeting a prospective suitor for the first time. Well, she demanded. This time her tone was suitably firm. All of their agreements had been made in those careful letters, and all of their plans would have to be modified as they moved south and circumstances changed. This meeting had only one real purpose, a simple and ancient ceremony of the borderlands that had been recorded only seven times in all the years since the breaking, a simple ceremony that would commit them beyond anything words could do, however strong. The rulers moved their horses closer while the others drew back. Athaniel hissed as her belt knife slashed across her left palm. Tenobia laughed at cutting hers. Pytar and Isar might as well have been plucking splinters. Four hands reached out and met, gripped, heart's blood mingling, dripping to the ground, soaking into the stony dirt. We are one, to the death, Isar said, and they all spoke with him. We are one, to the death. By blood and soil they were committed. Now they had to find Randall Thor and do what needed to be done, whatever the price. Once she was sure that Turana could sit up on the cushion unaided, Varen rose and left the slumped white sister sipping water, trying to sip anyway. Turana's teeth chattered on the silver cup, which was no surprise. The tent's entryway stood low enough that Varen had to duck in order to put her head out. Weariness augured into her back when she bent. She had no fear of the woman shivering behind her in a coarse black woolen robe. Varen held the shield on her tight, and she doubted Turana possessed enough strength in her legs at the moment to contemplate leaping on her from behind, even if such an incredible thought occurred to her. Whites just did not think that way. For that matter, in Turana's condition, it was doubtful she would be able to channel a hair for several hours yet, even if she were not shielded. The Aeel camp covered the hills that hid Kyrian, low, earth-colored tents filling the space between the few trees left standing this close to the city. Faint clouds of dust hung in the air, but neither dust nor heat nor the glare of an angry sun bothered the Aeel at all. Bustle and purpose filled the camp to equal any city. Within her sight were men butchering game and patching tents, sharpening knives and making the soft boots they all wore, women cooking over open fires, baking, working small looms, looking after some of the few children in the camp. Everywhere white-robed Guy Shine darted about carrying burdens, or stood beating rugs, or tended pack-horses and mules. No hawkers or shopkeepers, or carts and carriages, of course. A city. It was more like a thousand villages gathered in one spot, though men greatly outnumbered women, and except for the blacksmiths making their anvils ring, nearly every man not in white carried weapons. Most of the women did as well. The numbers certainly equaled one of the great cities, more than enough to envelop a few Aes Sedai prisoners completely, he saw a black-robed woman plodding away not fifty paces off, struggling to pull a waist-high pile of rocks behind her on a cowhide. The deep cowl hid her face, but no one in the camp except the captive sisters wore those black robes. A wise one strolled along close to the hide, glowing with the power as she shielded the prisoner, while a pair of maidens flanked the sister, using switches to urge her on whenever she faltered. Varin wondered whether she had been meant to see. That very morning she had passed a wild-eyed Coiran sail-dane, sweat streaming down her face, with a wise one and two tall Aeel men for escort, and a large basket heaped with sand bending her back as she staggered up a slope. Yesterday it had been Serene Nemdal. They had set her moving handfuls of water from one hide bucket to another beside it, switched her to move faster, then switched her for every drop spilled, when the water spilled because they were switching her to move faster. Serene had stolen a moment to ask Varen why, though not as if she expected any answer. Varen certainly had not been able to supply one, 
before the maidens drove Serene back to her useless labor. She suppressed a sigh. For one thing, she could not truly like seeing sisters treated so, whatever the reasons or need, and for another it was obvious that a fair number of the wise ones wanted what? For her to know that being Aes Sedai counted for nothing here? Ridiculous. That had been made abundantly clear days ago. Perhaps that she could be put into a black robe, too? For the time she thought she was safe from that, at least, but the wise ones hid a number of secrets she had yet to puzzle out, the smallest of them how their hierarchy worked. Very much the smallest, yet life and a whole skin lay wrapped inside that one. Women who gave commands sometimes took them from the very women they had been commanding earlier, and then later it was turned about again, all without rhyme or reason that she could see. No one ever ordered Sorelia, though, and in that might lie safety of a sort. She could not help a surge of satisfaction. Early this morning in the Sun Palace, Sorelia had demanded to know what shamed wetlanders most. Kiruna and the other sisters did not understand. They made no real efforts to see what was happening out here, perhaps fearing what they might learn, fearing the strains knowledge might put on their oaths. They still struggled to justify taking the path fate had pushed them down, but Varen already had reasons for the path she followed, and purpose. She also had a list in her pouch ready to hand to Sorelia when they were alone. No need to let the others know. Some of the captives she had never met, but she thought that for most women that list summed up the weaknesses Sorelia was seeking. Life was going to grow much more difficult for the women in black and her own efforts would be aided no end with luck. Two great hulking Aeel men, each an axe handle wide across the shoulders, sat right outside the tent, seemingly absorbed in a game of cat's cradle, but they had looked around immediately when her head appeared through the tent flaps. Koram had risen like a serpent uncoiling for all of his size, and Mendan waited only to tuck the string away. Had she been standing straight, her head barely would have reached the chest of either. She could have turned them both upside down and paddled them, of course, had she dared. She had been tempted from time to time. They were her assigned guides, her protection against misunderstandings in the camp, and doubtless they reported everything she said or did. In some ways she would have preferred to have Tomas with her, but only some. Keeping secrets from your warder was far more difficult than keeping them from strangers. Please tell Colinda that I'm done with Tirana Noril, she told Coram, and ask her to send Katerina Alruddin to me. She wanted to deal first with the sisters who had no warders. He nodded once before trotting off without speaking. These Aeel men were not much for civility. Mendon settled into a crouch, watching her with startlingly blue eyes. One of them stayed with her, no matter what she said. A strip of red cloth was tied around Mendon's temples and marked with the ancient symbol of Aes Sedai. Like the other men who wore that, like the maidens, he seemed to be waiting for her to make a mistake. Well, they were not the first, and a great way from the most dangerous. Seventy-one years had passed since she had last made a serious mistake. She gave Mendon a deliberately vague smile and started to pull back into the tent, when suddenly something caught her eye and held her like a vice. If the Aeel man had tried to cut her throat right then, she might not have noticed. Not far from where she stood stooped over in the mouth of the tent, nine or ten women knelt in a row, rolling the grindstones on flat stone hand mills, much like those on any isolated farms. Other women brought grain in baskets, and took away the coarse flour. The nine or ten women knelt in dark skirts and pale blouses, folded scarves holding their hair back. One, noticeably shorter than the rest, the only one with hair that did not hang to her waist or below, wore not even a single necklace or bracelet. She glanced up, the resentment on her sun-pinkened face sharpening as she met Varen's gaze, only for an instant, though, before she cringed hurriedly to her task. Varen jerked back into the tent, her stomach roiling queasily. Ergine was green Aja, 
or rather had been green, before Randall Thor stilled her. Being shielded dulled and fuzzed the bond to your warder, but being stilled snapped it as surely as death. One of her gynes, too, apparently had fallen over dead from the shock, and the other had died trying to kill thousands of Aeel without making any effort to escape. Very likely, Ergyne wished she also were dead. Stilled. Varen pressed both hands to her middle. She would not sick up. She had seen worse than a stilled woman. Much worse. There's no hope, is there? Churana muttered in a thick voice. She wept silently, staring into the silver cup in her trembling hands at something distant and horrifying. No hope. There is always a way, if you only look for it, Varen said, absently patting the woman's shoulder. You must always look. Her thoughts raced, and none touched Turana. Her gyne's stilling made her belly feel full of rancid grease the light knew. But what was the woman doing grinding grain, and dressed like the Aeel women? Had she been put to work just there so Varen could see? Foolish question. Even with a Taviran as strong as Randall Thor only a few miles away, there was some limit to the number of coincidences she would accept. Had she miscalculated? At worst, it could not be a large error. Only small mistakes sometimes proved as fatal as large. How long could she hold out if Sorelia decided to break her? A distressingly short time, she suspected. In some ways, Sorelia was as hard as anyone she had ever met, and not a thing she could say that would stop it. A worry for another day. There was no point getting ahead of herself. Kneeling, she put a little effort into comforting Turana, but not too much. Soothing words that sounded as hollow to her as they did to Turana, judging by the bleakness in her eyes. Nothing could change Turana's circumstances except Turana, and that had to come from within herself. The white sister just wept harder, making no sound as her shoulders shook, tears streaming down her face. The entry of two wise ones and a pair of young Aeel men who could not straighten up inside the tent was something of a relief, for Varen, anyway. She rose and curtsied smoothly, but none of them had any interest in her. Davina was a green-eyed woman with yellow-red hair, Losane gray-eyed with dark hair that only showed glints of red in the sun, both head and shoulders taller than she, both wearing the expressions of women given a grimy task they wished on someone else. Neither could channel strongly enough to have any certainty of holding Turana by herself, but they linked as though they had been forming circles all their lives— the light of Sidar around one seeming to blend with that around the other, despite the fact that they stood apart. Varen forced her face into a smile to keep from frowning. Where had they learned that? She would have wagered all she possessed that they had not known how only a few days ago. Everything went quickly then and smoothly. As the crouching men lifted Turana to her feet by the arms, she let the silver cup fall, empty, Luckily for her, she did not struggle, which was just as well, considering that either could have carried her off under one arm like a sack of grain, but her mouth hung open, emitting a wordless keening. The Aeel paid no heed. Davina, focusing the circle, assumed the shield, and Varen let go of the source completely. None of them trusted her enough to let her hold Sidar without a known reason, no matter what oaths she had sworn. Neither appeared to notice, but they surely would have, had she held on. The men hauled Turana away, her bare feet dragging across the layered carpets that floored the tent, and the wise ones followed them out. And that was that. What could be done with Turana had been done. Letting out a long breath, Varen sagged onto one of the bright tasseled cushions. A fine golden ropework tray sat on the carpets next to her, filling one of the mismatched silver cups from a pewter pitcher she drank deeply. This was thirsty work and tiring. Hours of daylight remained, yet she felt as if she had carried a heavy chest twenty miles over hills. 
the cup went back onto the tray, and she pulled the small leather-bound notebook from behind her belt. It always took a little time for them to fetch those she asked for. A few moments to peruse her notes and make some would not be amiss. There was no need for notes about the captives, but the sudden appearance of Cadzuain Malidrin three days ago now gave cause for concern. What was Cadzuain after? The woman's companions could be dismissed, but Cadzuain herself was a legend, and even the believable parts of the legend made her very dangerous indeed, dangerous and unpredictable. She took a pen from the small wooden writing case she always carried, reached toward the stoppered ink bottle in its scabbard, and another wise one entered the tent. Varen scrambled to her feet so quickly that she dropped her notebook. Aeron could not channel at all, yet Varen made a much deeper curtsy for the graying woman than she had for Davina and Losane. At the bottom of her dip she let go of her skirts to reach for her book, but Aeron's fingers reached it first. Varen straightened, calmly watching the taller woman thumb through the pages. Sky-blue eyes met hers. A winter sky. Some pretty drawings and a great deal about plants and flowers, Aeron said coldly. I see nothing concerning the questions you were sent to ask. She thrust the book at Varen more than handed it to her. Thank you, wise one, Varen said meekly, tucking the book back safely behind her belt. She even added another curtsy for good measure, just as deep as the first. I have the habit of noting down what I see. One day she would have to write out the cipher she used in her notebooks, a lifetime's worth of them filled cupboards and chests in her rooms above the White Tower Library. One day, but she hoped not soon. As for the, um, prisoners, so far they all say variations of the same thing. The Karakarn was to be housed in the tower until the last battle. His, um, mistreatment began because of an escape attempt. But you know that already, of course. Never fear, though. I'm sure I will learn more. All true, if not all of the truth. She had seen too many sisters die to risk sending others to the grave without a very good reason. The trouble was deciding what might cause that risk. The manner of young Althor's kidnapping, by an embassy supposedly treating with him, enraged the Aiel to the point of murder, yet what she called his mistreatment barely angered them at all, as far as she could tell. Gold and ivory bracelets clattered softly as Aeron adjusted her dark shawl. She peered down as though trying to read Varen's thoughts. Aeron seemed to stand high among the wise ones, and while Varen occasionally had seen a smile crease those dark-tanned cheeks, a warm and easy smile, it was never directed at an Aes Sedai. We never suspected that you would be the ones to fail, she had told Varen somewhat murkily. There had been nothing unclear in the rest of it, however. Eyes Sedai have no honor. Give me one hair of suspicion and I will strap you till you cannot stand with my own hands. Give me two hairs and I will stake you out for the vultures and the ants. Varen blinked up at her, trying to appear open. And meek, she must not forget meek, docile and compliant. She did not feel fear. In her time she had faced harder stares from women and men without so much as Aaron's slim compunction about ending her life. But a good deal of effort had gone into being sent to ask those questions. She could not afford to waste it now. If only these Aiel let more show on their faces. Abruptly she became aware that they were no longer alone in the tent. Two flaxen-haired maidens had entered with a black-robed woman a hand shorter than either. They were half holding her upright. At one side stood Tialin, a lanky redhead wearing a grim expression behind the light of Sidar, shielding the black-robed prisoner. The sister's hair hung in sweat-soaked ringlets to her shoulders and strands that clung to her face, which bore so much dirt that Varen did not recognize her at first. High cheekbones, but not very high, a nose with just the hint of a hook to it, and the slightest tilt to the brown eyes. Beldine. Beldine Nairam. 
She had instructed the girl in a few novice classes. If I may ask, she said carefully, why was she brought? I asked for another. Belle Dine had no warder despite being green. She had been raised to the shawl barely three years ago, and greens were often especially choosy about their first. But if they started bringing whoever they selected, the next might have two or three warders. She thought she could deal with two more today, but not if either had even one warder and she doubted they would give her a second chance at any of them. Katerina Alruddin escaped last night, Tialin nearly spat, and Varen gasped. You let her escape? she burst out without thinking. Tiredness gave no excuse, but the words spilled from her tongue before she could stop them. How could you be so foolish? She's red, and neither a coward nor weak in the power. The Karakarn could be in danger. Why were we not told of this when it happened? It was not discovered until this morning, one of the maidens growled. Her eyes could have been polished sapphires. A wise one and two cord darai were poisoned, and the guy Shine who brought them drink was found with his throat cut. Aaron arched an eyebrow at the maiden coldly. Did she speak to you, Karahuin? Both maidens suddenly became engrossed in the task of keeping Beldine on her feet. Aaron merely glanced at Tialin, but the red-haired wise one lowered her gaze. Varen was the next recipient of those attentions. Your concern for Randall Thor does you honor, Aaron said grudgingly. He will be guarded. You have no need to know more, or so much. Abruptly her tone hardened. But apprentices do not use that tone with wise ones, Varen Mathwin, I said I. The last words were a sneer. Smothering a sigh, Varen all but fell into another deep curtsy, a part of her wishing she were even as slim as she had been on arriving in the White Tower. She was not really constructed for all this bending and bobbing. Forgive me, wise one, she said humbly. Escaped. The circumstances made everything plain, to her if not to the Aiel. Apprehension must have loosened my wits. A pity she had no way to make sure Katerina met with a fatal accident. I will do my best to remember in the future. Not so much as the flicker of an eyelash told whether Aaron accepted that. May I assume her shield, wise one? Aaron nodded without looking at Tialin, and Varen quickly embraced the source, taking up the shield Tialin released. It never ceased to amaze her that women who could not channel gave orders so freely to women who could. Tialin was not much weaker in the power than Varen, yet she watched Aaron nearly as warily as the maidens did, and when the maidens hurried out of the tent at a gesture of Aaron's hand, leaving Beldine wavering where she stood, Tialin was only a step behind. Aaron did not go, however, not immediately. You will not speak of Katerina Alruddin to the Karakarn, she said. He has enough to occupy his thoughts without giving him trifles to worry over. I will say nothing to him about her, Varen agreed quickly. Trifles? A red with Katerina's strength was no trifle. Perhaps a note. It needed thought. Be certain to hold your tongue, Varen Mathwin, or you will use it to howl. There seemed nothing to say to that, so Varen concentrated on meekness and docility, making yet another curtsy. Her knees wanted to groan. Once Aaron departed, Varen allowed herself a sigh of relief. She had been afraid Aaron intended to remain. Gaining permission to be alone with the prisoners had required nearly as much effort as getting Sorelia and Amis to decide they needed to be questioned, and by someone intimate with the White Tower. If they ever learned they had been guided to that decision, it was a worry for another day. She seemed to be piling up a great many of those. There's enough water to wash your face and hands, at least, she told Beldine mildly. And if you wish, I will heal you. Every sister she had interviewed had carried at least a few welts. The Aiel did not beat the prisoners except for spilling water or balking at a task. 
The haughtiest words of defiance earned only scornful laughter, if that. But the black-robed women were herded like animals, a tap of the switch for go or turn or stop, and a harder tap if they did not obey quickly enough. Healing made other things easier, too. Filthy, sweating, wavering like a reed in the wind, Beldine curled her lip. I would rather bleed to death than be healed by you, she spat. Maybe I should have expected to see you groveling to these wilders, these savages, but I never thought you would stoop to revealing tower secrets. That ranks with treason, Varen, with rebellion, she grunted contemptuously. I suppose if you didn't shy at that, you'll stop at nothing. What else have you and the others taught them besides linking? Varen clicked her tongue irritably, not bothering to set the young woman straight. Her neck ached from looking up at Aiel. For that matter, even Beldine stood a hand or more taller than she. Her knees ached from curtsying, and entirely too many women who should know better had flung blind contempt and foolish pride at her today. Who should know better than an eyes Sedai that a sister had to wear many faces in the world? You could not always overawe people or bludgeon them either. Besides, far better to behave as a novice than be punished like one, especially when it earned you only pain and humiliation. Even Kiruna had to see the sense of that eventually. Sit down before you fall down, she said, suiting her own words. Let me guess what you've been doing today. By all that dirt, I'd say digging a hole. With your bare hands, or did they let you use a spoon? When they decide it's finished, they will just make you fill it again, you know. Now let me see. Every part I can see of you is grubby, but that robe is clean, so I expect they had you digging in your skin. Are you sure you don't want healing? Sunburn can be painful. She filled another cup with water and wafted it across the tent on a flow of air to hover in front of Beldine. Your throat must be parched. The young green stared unsteadily at the cup for a moment, then suddenly her legs gave way and she collapsed onto a cushion with a bitter laugh. They water me frequently. She laughed again, though Verin could not see the joke. As much as I want, so long as I swallow it all. Studying Verin angrily, she paused, then went on in a tight voice. That dress looks very nice on you. They burned mine. I saw them. They stole everything except this. She touched the golden great serpent around her left forefinger, a bright golden gleam among the dirt. I suppose they couldn't find quite enough nerve for that. I know what they're trying to do, Varen, and it won't work. Not with me. Not with any of us. She was still on her guard. Varen set the cup down on the flowered carpet beside Beldine, then took up her own and sipped before speaking. Oh? What are they trying to do? This time the other woman's laugh was brittle as well as harsh. Break us, and you know it. Make us swear oaths to Althor the way you did. Oh, Varen, how could you? Swearing fealty, and worse, to a man, to him. Even if you could bring yourself to rebel against the Amarlin seat, against the White Tower. She made the two sound much the same. How could you do that? For a moment, Varen wondered whether things would be better if the women now held in the Aiel camp had been caught up as she had been, a wood chip in the mill race of Randall Thor's Taviran swirl, words pouring from her mouth before they had time to form in her brain. Not words she could never have said on her own, that was not how Taviran affected you, but words she might possibly have said one time in a thousand under those circumstances, one time in ten thousand. No, the arguments had been long and hot over whether oaths given in that way had to be kept and the arguments over how to keep them still continued, much better as it was. Absently, she fingered a hard shape inside her belt pouch, a small brooch, a translucent stone, carved into what appeared to be a lily with too many petals. She never wore it, but it had not been out of her reach in nearly fifty years. You are Datsang, Beldine. You must have heard that. She did not need Beldine's curt nod. 
telling the despised one was part of Aiel law, like pronouncing sentence. That much she knew, if very little more. Your clothes and anything else that would burn were put to the fire because no Aiel would own anything that once belonged to a Datsang. The rest was hacked to pieces or hammered into scrap, even the jewelry you had with you, and buried under a pit, dug for a jakes. My... my horse? Beldine asked anxiously. They didn't kill the horses, but I don't know where yours is. Being ridden by someone in the city, probably, or perhaps given to an ashaman. Telling her that might do more harm than good. Varen seemed to recall that Beldine was one of those young women who had very deep feelings for horses. They let you keep the ring to remind you of who you were and increase your shame. I don't know whether they would let you swear to Master Althor if you begged. It would take something incredible on your part, I think. I won't. Never. The words rang hollow, though, and Beldine's shoulders slumped. She was shaken, but not sufficiently. Varen put on a warm smile. A fellow had once told her that her smile made him think of his dear mother. She hoped he had not been lying about that, at least. He had tried to slide a dagger between her ribs a little later, and her smile had been the last thing he ever saw. I can't think of the reason you would. No. I fear what you have to look forward to is useless labor. That's shaming to them. Bone shaming. Of course, if they realize you don't see it that way. Oh, my. I'll wager you didn't like digging without any clothes on, even with maidens for guards, but think of, say, standing in a tent full of men that way. Beldine flinched. Varen prattled on. She had developed prattling to something of a talent. They'd only make you stand there, of course. Datsang aren't allowed to do anything useful unless there's great need, and an Aiel man would as soon put his arm around a rotting carcass as— Well, that's not a pleasant thought, is it? In any case, that's what you have to look forward to. I know you'll resist as long as you can, though I'm not sure what there is to resist. They won't try to get information out of you or anything that people usually do with prisoners. But they won't let you go, not ever, until they're sure the shame is so deep in you there's nothing else left, not if it takes the rest of your life. Veldine's lips moved soundlessly, but she might as well have spoken the words, The rest of my life. Shifting uncomfortably on her cushion, she grimaced. Sunburn or welts or simply the ache of unaccustomed work. We will be rescued, she said finally. The Amerlin won't leave us. We'll be rescued or we'll... We will be rescued! Snatching up the silver cup from beside her, she tilted her head back to gulp until it was empty, then thrust it out for more. Varen floated the pewter pitcher over and set it down so the young woman could pour for herself. "'Or you'll escape?' Varen said, and Beldine's dirty hands jerked, splashing water down the sides of the cup. "'Really, now? You have as much chance of that as you do of rescue. You're surrounded by an army of Aiel, and apparently Al Thor can call up a few hundred of those Ashaman whenever he wants, to hunt you down.' The other woman shivered at that, and Varen nearly did. That little mess should have been stopped as soon as it started. No, I fear you must make your own way somehow. Deal with things as they are. You are quite alone in this. I know they don't let you speak to the others. Quite alone, she sighed. Wide eyes stared at her as they might have at a red adder. There's no need to make it worse than it must be. Let me heal you. She barely waited for the other woman's pitiful nod before moving to kneel beside her and place hands on Beldine's head. The young woman was almost as ready as she could be. Opening herself to more of Saidar, Varen wove the flows of healing, and the green gasped and quivered. The half-filled cup dropped from her hands, and a flailing arm knocked the pitcher onto its side. Now she was as ready as she could be. In the moments of confusion that gripped anyone after being healed, while Beldine still blinked and tried to come back to herself, Varen opened herself further, opened herself through the carved flower angreal in her pouch. Not a very powerful angreal, but enough, 
and she needed every bit of the extra power it gave her for this. The flows she began weaving bore no resemblance to healing. Spirit predominated by far, but there was wind and water, fire and earth, the last of some difficulty for her, and even the skeins of spirit had to be divided again and again, placed with an intricacy to boggle a weaver of fine carpets. Even if a wise one poked her head into the tent, with the smallest of luck she would not possess the rare talent needed to realize what Verin was doing. There would still be difficulties, perhaps painful difficulties one way and another, but she could live with anything short of true discovery. What? Veldine said drowsily. Her head would have lolled except for Verin's grip, and her eyelids were half closed. What are you? What is happening? Nothing that will harm you, Verin told her reassuringly. The woman might die inside the year, or in ten, as a result of this, but the weave itself would not harm her. I promise you, this is safe enough to use on an infant. Of course, that depended on what you did with it. She needed to lay the flows in place thread by thread, but talking seemed to help rather than hinder and too long a silence might rouse suspicion if her twin guardians were listening. Her eyes darted frequently to the dangling door flaps. She wanted some answers she had no intention of sharing, answers none of the women she questioned were likely to give freely even if they knew them. One of the smaller effects of this weave was to loosen the tongue and open the mind as well as any herb ever could, an effect that came on quickly. Dropping her voice almost to a whisper, she continued, the Althor boy seems to think he has supporters of some kind inside the White Tower, Beldine. In secret, of course. They must be. Even a man with his ear pressed to the fabric of the tent should be able to hear only that they were talking. Tell me anything you know about them. Supporters? Beldine murmured, attempting a frown that seemed beyond her ability. She stirred, though it hardly deserved the word agitation, feeble and uncoordinated. For him? Among the sisters? It can't be. Except for those of you who— How could you, Verin? Why didn't you fight it? Verin tisked vexedly. Not for the foolish suggestion that she should have fought a Taviran. The boy seemed so certain. Why? She kept her voice low. Do you have no suspicions, Beldine? Did you hear no rumors before you left Harvalon? No whispers? No one who hinted at approaching him differently? Tell me. No one. Who could? No one would. I admired Kiruna so. There was a hint of loss in Beldine's sleepy voice, and tears leaking from her eyes made tracks through the dirt. Only Verin's hands kept her sitting upright. Verin continued to lay down the threads of her weaving, eyes flashing from her work to the door flaps and back. She felt a little like sweating herself. Sorelia might decide she needed help with the questioning. She might bring out one of the sisters from the Sun Palace. Should any sister learn of this, stilling was a very real possibility. So you were going to deliver him to Elida neatly washed and well behaved, she said in a slightly louder tone. The quiet had gone on too long. She did not want that pair outside reporting that she was whispering with the prisoners. I couldn't speak out against Galena's decision. She led by the Armorlin's command. Beldine shifted again, weakly. Her voice was still dreamy, but it picked up an agitated edge. Her eyelids fluttered. He had to be made to obey. He had to be. Shouldn't have been treated so harshly, like putting him to question. Wrong. Verin snorted. Wrong? Disastrous was more like it. A disaster from the first. Now the man looked at any eyes that I almost the way Aaron did. And if they had succeeded in carrying him to Tarvalin? A Taviran like Randall Thor actually inside the White Tower? A thought to make a stone tremble. However it had turned out, disaster would surely have been too mild a word. The price paid at Dumai's Wells was small enough for avoiding that. 
She went on asking questions in a tone that could be heard clearly by anyone listening outside, asking questions she already had answers for, and avoiding those too dangerous to be answered. She paid little heed to the words coming out of her mouth or to Beldine's replies. Mainly, she concentrated on her weaving. A great many things had captured her interest over the years, not all strictly approved of by the Tower. Almost every wilder who came to the White Tower for training, both true wilders who really had begun teaching themselves, and girls who merely had started touching the source because the spark born in them had quickened on its own, for some sisters there was no real difference. Nearly every one of those wilders had created at least one trick for herself, and those tricks almost invariably fell under one of two headings. A way to listen in on other people's conversations, or a way of making people do as they wanted. The first the tower did not care much about. Even a wilder who had gained considerable control on her own quickly learned that as long as she wore novice white— she was not to so much as touch Sidar without a sister or one of the accepted standing over her, which did tend to limit eavesdropping rather sharply. The other trick, however, smelled too akin to forbidden compulsion. Oh, it was just a way to make father give her dresses or trinkets he did not want to buy, or make mother approve of young men she ordinarily ran off, things of that nature. But the tower rooted the trick out most effectively. Many of the girls and women Varen had spoken to over the years could not make themselves form the weaves, much less use them, and a fair number could not even make themselves remember how. From bits and pieces and scraps of half-remembered weaves carried by untrained girls for very limited purposes, Varen had reconstructed a thing forbidden by the tower since its founding. In the beginning it had been simple curiosity on her part. Curiosity, she thought wryly, working at the weave on Beldine, has made me climb into more than one pickling kettle. Usefulness came later. I suppose Elida meant to keep him down in the open cells, she said conversationally. The grill-walled cells were intended for men who could channel, as well as initiates of the tower under close arrest, wilders who had claimed to be eyes to die, and anyone else who must be both confined and blocked off from the source. Not a comfortable place for the dragon reborn, no privacy. Do you believe he is the dragon reborn, Beldine? This time she paused to listen. Yes. The word was a long hiss, and Beldine rolled frightened eyes toward Varen's face. Yes, but he must be kept safe. The world must be safe from him. Interesting. They had all said the world had to be kept safe from him. What was interesting was those who thought he needed protection, too. Some who had said that surprised her. To Varen's eyes, the weave she had made resembled nothing so much as a haphazard tangle of faintly glowing transparent threads all bundled around Beldine's head, with four threads of spirit trailing out of the mess. Two of those, opposite one another, she pulled, and the tangle collapsed slightly, falling inward into something on the edge of order. Beldine's eyes shot wide open, staring into the far distance. In a firm, low voice, Varen gave her instructions. More like suggestions, though she phrased them as commands. Beldine would have to find reasons within herself to obey. If she did not, then all this had been so much wasted effort. With the final words, Varen pulled the other two threads of spirit, and the tangle collapsed further. This time, though, it fell into what seemed perfect order, a pattern more precise, more complicated than most intricate lace, and complete, tied off by the same action that began its shrinking. This time it continued to fall inward on itself, inward around Beldine's head. Those faintly glowing threads sank into her, vanished. Her eyes rolled back in her head, and she began to thrash, limbs quivering. Varen held her as gently as she could, but Beldine's head still whipped from side to side, and her bare heels drummed on the carpets. Soon only the most careful delving would tell that anything had been done, and not even that would identify the weave. Varen had tested that carefully, and if she did say so herself, 
none surpassed her at delving. Of course, the thing was not truly compulsion as ancient texts described it. The weaving went with painful slowness, cobbled together as it was, and there was that need for a reason. It helped a great deal if the object of the weave was emotionally vulnerable, but trust was absolutely essential. Even catching someone by surprise did no good if they were suspicious. That fact cut down its usefulness with men considerably. Very few men lacked suspicion around Aes Sedai. Distrust aside, men were very bad subjects, unfortunately. She could not understand why. Most of those girls' weaves had been intended for their fathers or other men. Any strong personality might begin to question his own actions, or even forget doing them, which led to another set of problems. But all things being equal, men were much more likely to. Much more likely. Perhaps it was the suspicion again. Why, once a man had even remembered the weaves being woven on him, if not the instructions she had given him. Such a lot of bother that caused. Not something she would risk again. At last, Beldine's convulsions lessened, stopped. She raised a filthy hand to her head. What? What happened? She said, almost inaudibly. Did I faint? Forgetfulness was another good point about the weave, not unexpectedly. After all, Father must not remember that you somehow made him buy that expensive dress. The heat is very bad, Varen said, helping her to sit up again. I have felt light-headed myself once or twice today. From weariness, not heat. Handling that much of Sidar took it out of you, especially when you had already done it four times today. The Angreal did nothing to buffer the effects once you stopped using it. She could have used a steadying hand herself. I think that's about enough. If you're fainting, perhaps they'll find something for you to do out of the sun. The prospect did not seem to cheer Beldine at all. Rubbing the small of her back, Varen stuck her head out of the tent. Koram and Mendan stopped their game of cat's cradle once more. There was no sign that either had listened, but she would not wager her life on it. She told them that she was finished with Beldine, and after a moment's thought added that she needed another pitcher of water, since Beldine had overturned hers. Both men's faces darkened beneath their tans. That would be passed along to the wise one who came for Beldine. It would serve as something more to help her reach her decision. The sun still had a long way to fall to the horizon, but the ache in her back told her it was time to stop for the day. She could still do one more sister, but if she did, by morning she would feel it in every muscle. Her eyes fell on Ergine, now with the women carrying baskets to the hand mills. How would her life have gone if she had not been so curious, Varen wondered? For one thing, she would have married Edwin and remained in far matting instead of going to the White Tower. She would be long dead for another and the children she had never had, and her grandchildren, too. With a sigh, she turned back to Coram. When Mendan returns, would you go tell Kolinda that I would like to see Ergain Fatamed? The pain in her muscles tomorrow would be a small penance for Beldine's suffering over that spilled water, but that was not why she did it, or even her curiosity, really. She still had a task. Somehow she had to keep young Rand alive until it was time for him to die. The room might have been in a grand palace, except that it had neither windows nor doors. The fire on a golden marble hearth gave no heat, and the flames did not consume the logs. The man seated at a table with gilded legs, centered on a silk carpet, woven with glittering threads of gold and silver, cared little for the trappings of this age. They were necessary to impress no more. Not that he really needed more than himself to overawe the stiffest pride. He called himself Moradin, and surely no one had ever had more right to name himself Death. From time to time he idly stroked one of the two mind traps that hung on plain silken cords around his neck. At his touch, the blood-red crystal of the Kursuvra pulsed, swirls moving in endless depths like the beating of a heart. His real attention was on the game laid out before him on the table. 
33 red pieces and 33 green, arrayed across a playing surface of 13 squares by 13. A recreation of the early stages of a famous game. The most important piece, the fisher, black and white like the playing surface, still waited in its starting place on the central square. A complex game, Shara, ancient long before the War of Power. Shara, Charan, and Nori, the game now called simply Stones, each had adherents who claimed it encompassed all the subtleties of life, but Moradin had always favored Shara. Only nine people living even remembered the game. He had been a master of it, much more complex than Charan or Nori. The first object was capture of the fisher. Only then did the game truly begin. A servant approached, a slim, graceful young man clad all in white, impossibly handsome, bowing as he presented a crystal goblet on a silver tray. He smiled, but it did not touch his black eyes, eyes more lifeless than simply dead. Most men would have felt uncomfortable having that gaze on them. Moradin merely took the goblet and motioned the servant away. The vintners of this time produced some excellent wines. He did not drink, though. The fisher had his attention, baiting him. Several pieces had varying moves, but only the fisher's attributes altered according to where it stood. On a white square, weak in attack, yet agile and far-ranging in escape. On black, strong in attack, but slow and vulnerable. When masters played, the fisher changed sides many times before the end. The green and red goal row that surrounded the playing surface could be threatened by any piece, but only the fisher could move on to it. Not that he was safe even there. The fisher was never safe. When the fisher was yours, you tried to move him to a square of your color behind your opponent's end of the board. That was victory, the easiest way, but not the only one. When your opponent held the fisher, you attempted to leave him no choice for the fisher but to move on to your color. Anywhere at all along the goal roll would do. Holding the fisher could be more dangerous than not. Of course, there was a third path to victory in Shara, if you took it before letting yourself be trapped. The game always degenerated into a bloody melee, then victory coming only with complete annihilation of your enemy. He had tried that once, in desperation, but the attempt had failed, painfully. Fury boiled suddenly in Moradin's head, and black flecks swam across his eyes as he seized the true power. Ecstasy that amounted to pain thundered through him. His hand closed around the two mind traps, and the true power closed around the fissure, snatching it into the air, a hair from crushing it to powder, crushing the powder out of existence. The goblet shattered in his hand. His grip bordered on crushing the kusuvra. The sa were a blizzard of black, but they did not hinder his sight. The fisher was always worked as a man, a bandage blinding his eyes and one hand pressed to his side, a few drops of blood dripping through his fingers. The reasons, like the source of the name, were lost in the mist of time. That troubled him sometimes, enraged him, what knowledge might be lost in the turnings of the wheel. Knowledge he needed, knowledge he had a right to. A right. Slowly he set the fisher back on the board. Slowly his fingers uncurled from around the kursuvra. There was no need for destruction. Yet. Icy calm replaced rage in the blink of an eye. Blood and wine dripped from his gashed hand, unnoticed. Perhaps the fisher did come from some dim remnant of a memory of Randolph Thor. The shadow of a shadow. It did not matter. He realized he was laughing, and made no effort to stop. On the board the fisher stood waiting, but in the greater game Althor moved already to his wishes. And soon now? It was very hard to lose a game when you played both sides of the board. Moradin laughed so hard that tears rolled down his face, but he was not aware of them. Chapter 1 To Keep the Bargain The wheel of time turns, and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth, and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. 
In one age, called the Third Age by some, an age yet to come, an age long past, a wind rose above the great mountainous island of Tremalking. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time, but it was a beginning. East the wind blew across Tremalking, where the fair-skinned Amayar farmed their fields, and made fine glass and porcelain, and followed the peace of the waterway. The Amayar ignored the world beyond their scattered islands, for the waterway taught that this world was only illusion, a mirrored reflection of belief. Yet some watched the wind carry dust and deep summer heat where cold winter rains should be falling, and they remembered tales heard from the Atha'an Mier, tales of the world beyond and what prophecy said was to come. Some looked to a hill where a massive stone hand rose from the earth, holding a clear crystal sphere larger than many houses. The Amayar had their own prophecies, and some of those spoke of the hand and the sphere and the end of illusions. Onward the wind blew into the sea of storms, eastward beneath the searing sun in a sky abandoned by clouds, whipping the tops of green sea swells, battling winds from the south and westward winds, shearing and swirling as the waters below heaved. Not yet the storms of winter's heart, though winter should have been half gone, much less the greater storms of a dying summer, but winds and currents that could be used by ocean-faring folk to coast around the continent from World's End to Mei Yen and beyond, then back again. Eastward the wind howled over rolling ocean where the great whales rose and sounded, and flying fish soared on outstretched fins two paces and more across. Eastward, now whirling north, east and north, over small fleets of fishing ships dragging their nets in the shallower seas. Some of those fishermen stood gaping, hands idle on the lines, staring at a huge array of tall vessels and smaller that purposefully rode the wind's hard breath, shattering swells with bluff bows, slicing swells with narrow, their banner a golden hawk with talons clutching lightning, a multitude of streaming banners like portents of storm. East and north and on, and the wind reached the broad, ship-filled harbor of Ebu Dar, where hundreds of sea-folk vessels rode as they did in many ports, awaiting word of the Koramor, the Chosen One. Across the harbor the wind roared, tossing small ships and large, across the city itself, gleaming white beneath the unfettered sun, spires and walls and color-ringed domes, streets and canals bustling with the storied southern industry. Around the shining domes and slender towers of the Tarasin Palace the wind swirled, carrying the tang of salt, lifting the flag of Altara, two golden leopards on a field of red and blue, and the banners of ruling house Mitzabar, the sword and anchor, green on white. Not yet the storm, but a harbinger of storms. Skin prickled between Avienda's shoulder blades as she strode ahead of her companions through palace hallways tiled in dozens of pleasing bright hues. A sense of being watched that she had last felt while still wed to the spear. Imagination, she told herself. Imagination and knowing there are enemies about I cannot face. Not so long ago that crawling sensation had meant someone might be intending to kill her. Death was nothing to fear. Everyone died, today or on another, but she did not want to die like a rabbit kicking in a snare. She had toe to meet. Servants scurried by close along the walls, bobbing bows and curtsies, dropping their eyes almost as if they understood the shame of the lives they lived, yet surely it could not be them that made her want to twist her shoulders. She had tried schooling herself to see servants, but even now, with the skin creeping on her back, her gaze slid around them. It had to be imagination and nerves. This was a day for imagination and nerves. Unlike the servants, rich silk tapestries snagged at her eye, and the gilded stand lamps and ceiling lamps lining the corridors. Paper-thin porcelain in reds and yellows and greens and blues stood in wall niches and tall openwork cabinets, 
alongside ornaments of gold and silver, ivory and crystal, scores upon scores of bowls and vases and caskets and statuettes. Only the most beautiful truly caught her gaze. Whatever wetlanders thought, beauty held more worth than gold. There was much beauty here. She would not have minded taking her share of the fifth from this place. Vexed with herself, she frowned. That was not an honorable thought beneath a roof that had offered her shade and water freely. Without ceremony, true, but also without debt or blood, steel or need. Yet better that than thinking about a small boy alone somewhere out in this corrupt city. Any city was corrupt. Of that much she was certain now, having seen some part of four. But Ebudar was the last where she would have let a child run loose. What she could not understand was why thoughts of Alver came unless she worked hard to avoid them. He was no part of the toe she had to Elaine and to Randall Thor. A Shido spear had taken his father, starvation and hardship his mother. Yet had it been her own spear that took both, the boy was still a pre-killer, Kyrienen. Why should she fret over a child from that blood? Why? She attempted to concentrate on the weave she was to make, but although she had practiced it under Elaine's eye until she could have formed it sleeping, Alver's wide-mouthed face intruded. Birgitta worried about him even more than she, but Birgitta's breast held a strangely soft heart for small boys, especially ugly ones. Sighing, Avienda gave up trying to ignore her companion's conversation behind her, though irritation crackled through it like heat lightning. Even that was better than upsetting herself over a son of tree-killers, oath-breakers, a despised blood the world would be better off without, no concern or worry of hers, none. Matt Cawthon would find the boy in any case. He could find anything, it seemed. And listening settled her somehow. The prickling faded away. I don't like it one bit, Nynaeve was muttering, continuing an argument begun back in their rooms. Not a bit, Lan, do you hear me? She had announced her dislike at least twenty times already, but Nynaeve never surrendered just because she had lost. Short and dark-eyed, she strode fiercely, kicking her divided blue skirts, one hand rising to hover near her thick, waist-long braid, then thrust down firmly before rising again. Nynaeve kept a tight hold on anger and irritation when Lan was around, or tried to. An inordinate pride filled her about marrying him. The close-fitting embroidered blue coat over her yellow-slashed silk riding dress hung open, showing far too much bosom in the wetlander way, just so she could display his heavy gold finger ring on a fine chain around her neck. "'You have no right to promise to take care of me like that, Lan Mandragoran,' she went on firmly. "'I am not a porcelain figurine.' He paced at her side, a man of proper size, towering head and shoulders and more above her, the eye-wrenching cloak of a warder hanging down his back. His face seemed hacked from stone, and his gaze weighed the threat in every servant who passed, examined every crossing corridor and wall niche for hidden attackers. Readiness radiated from him, a lion on the brink of his charge. Avienda had grown up around dangerous men, but never one to match on a line. Had death been a man, she would have been him. You are Eyes Sedai, and I am Warder he said in a deep, level voice. Taking care of you is my duty. His tone softened, conflicting sharply with his angular face and bleak, never-changing eyes. Besides, caring for you is my heart's desire, Nynaeve. You can ask or demand anything of me, but never to let you die without trying to save you. The day you die, I die. That last he had not said before, not in Avienda's hearing, and it hit Nynaeve like a blow to the stomach. Her eyes started half out of her head, and her mouth worked soundlessly. She appeared to recover quickly, though, as always. Pretending to resettle her blue-plumed hat, a ridiculous thing like a strange bird roosting atop her head, she shot a glance at him from beneath the wide brim. 
Avienda had begun to suspect that the other woman often used silence and supposedly significant looks to cover ignorance. She suspected Nynaeve knew little more about men, about dealing with one man, than she did herself. Facing them with knives and spears was much easier than loving one. Much easier. How did women manage being married to them? Avienda had a desperate need to learn, and no idea how. Married to Anne Aline only a day, Nynaeve had changed much more than simply in trying to control her temper. She seemed to flit from startlement to shock, however much she attempted to hide it. She fell into dreaminess at odd moments, blushed at innocuous questions, and, she denied this fiercely even when Avienda had seen her, she giggled over nothing at all. There was no point in trying to learn anything from Nynaeve. I suppose you're going to tell me about Warders and I Sedai again as well, Elaine said coolly to Burgita. Well, you and I aren't married, I expect you to guard my back, but I will not have you making promises about me behind it. Elaine wore garments as inappropriate as Nynaeve's, a gold-embroidered Ebudari riding dress of green silk, suitably high-necked, but with an oval opening that bared the inner slopes of her breasts. Wetlanders spluttered at the mention of a sweat tent or being unclothed in front of Guy Shine, then walked about half exposed where any stranger could see. Avienda did not really mind for Nynaeve, but Elaine was her near sister, and would be more, she hoped. The raised heels of Brigitte's boots made her almost a hand taller than Nynaeve, if still shorter than Elaine or Avienda. In dark blue coat and wide green trousers, she carried herself with much of the same wearily confident readiness as Lan, though it seemed more casual in her. A leopard lying on a rock, and not nearly so lazy as she appeared. There was no arrow knocked in the bow Brigitte carried, but for all her stroll and smiles, she could have a shaft out of the quiver at her waist before anyone could blink, and be loosing her third before anybody else could have fitted a second to bowstring. She gave Elaine a wry grin and a shake of her head that swung a golden braid as long and thick as Nynaeve's dark one. "'I promise to your face, not behind your back,' she said dryly. "'When you've learned a little more, I won't have to tell you about warders and eyes to die.' Elaine sniffed and lifted her chin haughtily, busying herself with the ribbons of her hat, which was covered with long green plumes and worse than Nynaeve's. "'Perhaps a great deal more.' Birgitta added, "'You're tying another knot in that bow.' Had Elaine not been her near sister, Avienda would have laughed at the crimson that flooded her cheeks. Tripping someone who tried to walk too high was always fun, or watching it done, and even a short fall was worth a laugh. As it was, she leveled a firm stare at Birgitta, a promise that more might bring retribution. She liked the woman despite all her secrets— but the difference between a friend and a near sister was a thing these wetlanders seemed unable to comprehend. Brigitte only smiled, glancing from her to Elaine, and murmured under her breath. Avienda caught the word kittens. Worse, it sounded fond. Everyone must have heard. Everyone. What's gotten into you, Avienda? Nynaeve demanded, prodding her shoulder with a stiff finger. Do you intend to stand there blushing all day? We are in a hurry. Only then did Avienda realize by the heat in her face that she must be as red as Elaine, and standing still as stone besides when they had need for haste. Cut by a word, like a girl newly wedded to the spear and unused to the banter among maidens. She had almost twenty years, and she was behaving like a child playing with her first bow. That added flames to her cheeks, which was why she all but leaped around the next turning and very nearly ran headlong into Teslin Baradon. Skidding awkwardly on red and green floor tiles, Avienda half fell backward, catching herself against Elaine and Nynaeve. This time she managed not to blush herself to fire, but she wanted to. She was shaming her near sister as much as herself. Elaine always held her composure no matter what. Luckily, Teslin Baradon took the encounter a little better. The sharp-faced woman recoiled in surprise, gaping before she could stop herself, 
then shifting her narrow shoulders irritably. Gaunt cheeks and a narrow nose hid the ageless quality of the red sister's features, and her red dress, brocaded in a blue that was nearly black, only made her appear bonier, yet she quickly gathered a clan roofmistress's self-possession, dark brown eyes as cool as deep shadows. They slid past Avienda dismissively, ignoring Lan like a tool she had no use for, burned a brief moment at Brigitta. Most Aes Sedai disapproved of Brigitta being a warder, though none could give a reason beyond sour mutters about tradition. Elaine and Nynaeve, however, the woman fixed by turns. Avienda could have tracked yesterday's wind before reading anything on Teslin Baradon's face now. I did already tell Merililla, she said in a thick Ileana accent, but I may as well put your minds at rest also. Whatever mischief you do be about, Jolene and I will no interfere. I did see to that. Elida may never learn of it if you do have some care. Stop gaping at me like carp, children, she added with a grimace of distaste. I be neither blind nor deaf. I do know of sea folk windfinders in the palace, and secret meetings with Queen Tylan, and other things. That thin mouth tightened, and though her tone remained serene, her dark gaze flared with anger. You will pay dearly yet for those other things. You and those who do allow you to play at being eyes, said I, but I will look aside for now. Atonement can wait. Nynaeve took a tight grip on her braid, back straight, head high, and her own eyes blazed. Under different circumstances, Avienda might have found some sympathy for the target of the tongue lashing plainly about to erupt. Nynaeve's tongue carried more spines than a hair needle cigada and sharper ones. Coldly, Avienda considered this woman who thought she could look right through her. A wise one did not stoop to thrashing someone with her fists, but she was still only an apprentice. Perhaps it would not cost her G if she just bruised this Teslin Baradon a little. She opened her mouth to give the Red Sister a chance to defend herself at the same instant Nynaeve opened hers, yet Elaine spoke first. "'What we are about, Teslin?' she said in a chill voice, is none of your business. She too stood straight, her eyes blue ice. A chance ray of light from a high window caught her golden-red curls, seeming to set them afire. Right then, Elaine could have made a roof mistress seem a goat herd with too much usquai in her belly. It was a skill she honed well. She delivered each word with cold, crystal dignity. You have no right to interfere in anything we do, in anything that any sister does. No right whatsoever. So pull your nose out of our coats, you summer ham, and be glad we do not choose to take issue with you supporting a usurper on the Armorlin seat. Perplexed, Avienda glanced sideways at her near sister. Pull her nose out of their coats? She and Elaine, at least, were not wearing coats. A summer ham? What did that mean? Waitlanders often said peculiar things, but the other women all looked as puzzled as she. Only Lan, staring at Elaine askance, appeared to understand, and he seemed startled, and perhaps amused. It was difficult to tell. Anna Line controlled his features well. Teslin Baradon sniffed, pinching her face even tighter. Avienda was trying hard to call these people by only part of their names, the way they themselves did. When she used a whole name, they thought she was upset. But she could not begin to imagine being so intimate with Tesla and Baradon. I will leave you foolish children to your business, the woman growled. Be sure you do no get your noses caught in a worse crack than they already do be. As she turned to go... Gathering her skirts grandly, Nynaeve caught her arm. Wetlanders usually let emotion gild their faces, and Nynaeve's was the image of conflict, anger struggling to break through fixed determination. Wait, Teslin, she said reluctantly. You and Jolene may be in danger. I told Tylin, but I think she may be afraid to tell anyone else. Unwilling, anyway. It's nothing anybody really wants to talk about. She drew a long, deep breath, 
and if she was thinking of her own fears in the matter, she had cause. There was no shame in feeling fear, only in giving way to it, or letting it show. Avienda felt a flutter in her own belly as Nynaeve went on. Mogedian has been here in Ebudar. She might still be, and maybe another of the Forsaken, too. With a golam, a kind of shadow spawn the power won't touch. It looks like a man, but it was made, and made to kill Aes Sedai. Steel doesn't seem to hurt it either, and it can squeeze through a mouse hole. The Black Aja is here as well, and there's a storm coming, a bad storm. Only it isn't a storm, not weather. I can feel it. That's a skill I have, a talent, maybe. There's danger headed for Ebudar, and trouble worse than any wind or rain or lightning. The Forsaken? A storm that is no a storm, and some shadow spawn I did never hear of before, Teslin Baradon said wryly. Not to mention the Black Aja. Light the Black Aja. Than the Dark One himself, perhaps? Her twisted smile was razor thin. She plucked Nynaeve's hand from her sleeve contemptuously. When you do be back in the White Tower where you belong, in white as you all truly belong, you will learn no to waste your hours with wild fancies, or to carry your tales to sisters. Running her eyes over them and once more skipping past Avienda, she gave a loud sniff and marched off down the hallway so quickly that servants had to leap from her path. That woman has the nerve to... Nynaeve spluttered, glaring after the retreating woman and strangling her braid with both hands. After I made myself... She almost choked on her spleen. Well, I tried, and now regretted the attempt by the sound. You did, Elaine agreed with a sharp nod, and more than she deserves, denying that we're eyes to die. I won't put up with that any more. I won't. Her voice had only seemed cold before. Now it was cold and grim. Can one like that be trusted? Avienda muttered. Maybe we should be sure she cannot interfere. She examined her fist. Teslin Baradon would see that. The woman deserved to be caught by the shadow sold by Mogedian or another. Fools deserved whatever their foolishness brought. Nynaeve appeared to consider the suggestion, but what she said was, if I didn't know better, I'd think she was ready to turn on Elida. She clicked her tongue in exasperation. You can dizzy yourself trying to read the currents in eyes to die politics. Elaine did not say Nynaeve should know that by now, but her tone did. Even a red might be turning against Elida for some reason we can't begin to imagine. Or she could be trying to make us lower our guard so she can somehow trick us into putting ourselves into Elida's hands. Or... Lan coughed. If any of the Forsaken are coming, he said in a voice like polished stone, they could be here any moment, or that Golam could. In either case, it would be best to be elsewhere. Where thy said I, always a little patience, Brigitta murmured as though quoting. But the Windfinders don't seem to have any, she continued, so you might do well to forget Teslin and remember Renyla. Elaine and Nynaeve turned stairs on the warders cold enough to give ten stone dogs paws. Neither liked running from the shadow soul than this golem, for all they were the ones who had decided there was no choice. Certainly neither liked being reminded that they needed to run to meet the windfinders almost as much as to escape the forsaken. Avienda would have studied those looks. Wise ones did, with a glance or a few words, what she had always needed the threat of spear or fist for only they usually did it faster and with more success. She would have studied Elaine and Nynaeve, except that their glares had no visible effect on the pair at all. Birgitta grinned and cut her eyes toward Lan, who shrugged back at her with obvious forbearance. Elaine and Nynaeve gave over. Unhurriedly and unnecessarily straightening their skirts, they each took one of Avienda's arms before setting off again without so much as a glance to see that the warders followed. Not that Elaine needed to, with the warder bond, or Nynaeve, if not for the same reason. Ah, Elaine's bond might belong to another, but his heart hung alongside his ring on that chain around her neck. 
They made a great show of strolling casually, unwilling to let Brigitte and Lamb think they had been brought to hurry. Yet the truth was, they did walk faster than before. As if to make up for that, they chatted with deliberate idleness, choosing the most frivolous subjects. Elaine regretted not having a chance to truly see the festival of birds two days before, and never gave a blush for the scant garments many people had worn. Nynaeve did not blush either, but she quickly began talking about the feast of embers to be held that night. Some of the servants claimed there would be fireworks, supposedly made by a refugee illuminator. Several traveling shows had come to the city with their strange animals and acrobats, which interested both Elaine and Nynaeve, since they had spent some time with such a show. They talked of seamstresses and the varieties of lace available in Ebudar, and the different qualities of silk and linen that could be bought. And Avienda found herself responding with pleasure to comments on how well her grey silk riding dress looked on her, and the other garments given to her by Tylen Quintara fine woolens and silks, and the stockings and shifts to go with them, and jewellery. Elaine and Nynaeve also had received extravagant gifts. Altogether their presence filled the number of chests and bundles that had been carried down to the stables by servants, along with their saddlebags. "'Why are you scowling, Avienda?' Elaine asked, giving her a pat on the arm and a smile. "'Don't worry. You know the weave. You will do just fine.' Nynaeve leaned her head close and whispered, I'll fix you a tea when I have a chance. I know several that will soothe your stomach, or any woman's troubles. She patted Avienda's arm, too. They did not understand. No comforting words or teas would cure what ailed her. She was enjoying talk of lace and embroidery. She did not know whether to growl in disgust or wail in despair. She was growing soft. Never before in her life had she looked at a woman's dress except to think where it might be hiding a weapon, never to notice the color and cut, or think how it would look on her. It was past time to be away from this city, away from wetlander palaces. Soon she would start simpering. She had not seen Elaine or Nynaeve do that, but everyone knew wetlander women simpered, and it was obvious she had become as weak as any milk-water wetlander strolling arm in arm, chatting about lace. How was she to reach her belt knife if someone attacked them? A knife might be useless against the likeliest assailants, but she had had faith in steel long before she knew she could channel. Should anyone try to harm Elaine or Nynaeve, especially Elaine, but she had promised Matt Cawthon to protect them both as surely as Brigitte and Anna Line had. Should anyone try, she would plant steel in their hearts. Lace! As they walked, she wept inside at how soft she had become. Huge paired stable doors fronted three sides of the palace's largest stable yard, the doorways crowded by servants in green and white livery. Behind them in the white stone stables waited horses, saddled or loaded with wicker panniers. Seabirds wheeled and cried overhead, an unpleasant reminder of how much water lay nearby. Heat shimmered up from pale paving stones, but it was tension that thickened the air. Avienda had seen blood spilled where there was less strain. Renaila Din Callan, in red and yellow silks, arms crossed arrogantly beneath her breasts, stood before nineteen more barefoot women with tattooed hands and brightly colored blouses, most in trousers and long sashes just as brilliant. Sweat glistening on dark faces did not lessen their grave dignity. Some sniffed at lacy gold boxes filled with heavy scent that hung about their necks. Five fat gold rings pierced each of Renaila Den Callan's ears, a chain from one dripping medallions as it ran across her left cheek to a ring in her nose. The three women close behind her each wore eight earrings and slightly fewer bits of dangling gold. That was how the sea folk marked rank among themselves, with the women at least. All deferred to Renaila Din Callan, windfinder to the mistress of the ships, to the Afan Mier, but even the two apprentices at the rear, in dark trousers and linen blouses instead of silk, added their own golden shimmers to the air. When Avienda and the others appeared, 
Renaila Din Callan ostentatiously looked to the sun, past its noon peak. Her eyebrows climbed as she directed her gaze back to them, eyes black as her white-winged hair, a demanding stare of impatience so loud she might as well have shouted. Elaine and Nynaeve stopped short, dragging Avienda to an abrupt halt. They exchanged worried glances past her and deep sighs. She did not see how they were to escape. Obligation bound her near sister and Nynaeve hand and foot, and they themselves had tied the knots tight. I'll see to the knitting circle, Nynaeve muttered under her breath, and Elaine said a little more stoutly, I'll make sure the sisters are ready. Releasing her arms, they went in opposite directions, holding their skirts up to step quickly, and followed by Brigitta and Lan. That left her facing Renaila Din Callan's gaze alone, the eagle stare of a woman who knew she held the high ground and could not be dislodged. Fortunately, the windfinder to the mistress of the ships quickly turned to her companions, so quickly that the ends of her long yellow sash swung wide. The other windfinders gathered around her, intent on her quiet words. Hitting her even once would surely ruin everything. Avienda tried not to glare at them, but as much she attempted to look elsewhere, her eyes returned. No one had the right to catch her near sister in a cleft stick. Nose rings. A good grip on that chain and Renaila then Callan Blue Star would wear a very different expression. Clustered together at one end of the stable yard, tiny Marililla, Sian Devon, and four more Aes Sedai also regarded the windfinders most with annoyance ill-concealed behind cool serenity. Even slender, white-haired Van Deen Namel and her mirror image first sister Adelius, who usually looked the most imperturbable of them all. Now and then one or another adjusted a thin linen dust cloak or brushed at divided silk skirts. Sudden gusts did raise a little dust and stir the color-shifting cloaks of the five warders just at their backs, Yet clearly annoyance moved their hands. Only Saritha, standing guard over a large, white, disc-shaped bundle, did not twitch, but she frowned. Marililla's maid, Paul, scowled from behind them. The Aes Sedai heatedly disapproved of the bargain that had brought the Athan Mier from their ships and given them a right to stare at Aes Sedai with demanding impatience but that bargain tied the sisters' tongues and choked them on their own irritation, which they tried to hide. They might have succeeded with the wetlanders. The third group of women, in a tight knot at the opposite end of the yard, earned almost as much of their study. Rihanna Corley and the other ten survivors of the kin's knitting circle stirred uneasily under that disapproving scrutiny, dabbing their sweaty faces with embroidered handkerchiefs, adjusting their broad, colorful straw hats, smoothing sober woolen skirts sewn up on one side to expose layers of petticoats as bright as the sea folk's garb. In part, it was the stares of the Aes Sedai that had them shifting from foot to foot. Fear of the Forsaken and the Golam added to it, and so did other things. The narrow, plunging necklines of those dresses should have been enough. Most of these women showed at least a few lines on their cheeks, yet they looked like girls caught with their hands full of stolen nut bread. All but stout Sumiko, fists planted on broad hips, who met the Aes Sedai stare for stare. A bright glow of Sidar surrounded one of their number, Kirstian, who kept glancing over her shoulder. With a pale face perhaps ten years older than Nynaeve's, she appeared out of place among the others. That face grew whiter every time her black eyes met those of an Aes Sedai. Nynaeve hurried to the women who led the kin, her face beaming encouragement, and Rihanna and the others smiled with visible relief. Marred a little, true, by the sidelong glances they directed at Lan, him they regarded as the wolf he resembled. Nynaeve, however, was the reason Sumiko did not wilt like the rest whenever an Aes Sedai glanced in her direction. She had vowed to teach those women that they possessed backbones, though Avienda did not completely understand why. Nynaeve was Aes Sedai herself, 
No wise one would ever tell anyone to stand up to wise ones. However well that might be working with respect to the other eyes, Sadai, even Sumiko wore a slightly fawning air for Nynaeve. The knitting circle found it strange, to say the least, that women as young as Elaine and Nynaeve gave orders to the other eyes, Sadai, and were obeyed. Avienda herself found it peculiar. How could strength in the power, something you were born with as surely as your eyes, weigh more heavily than the honor that years could bring? Yet the older eyes Sadai did obey, and for the kinswomen that was enough. Iaini, nearly as tall as Avienda herself and almost as dark as the sea folk, returned Nynaeve's every glance with an obsequious smile, while Jimana, white streaking her bright red hair, ducked her head constantly under Nynaeve's eyes and yellow-haired Sibella hid nervous giggles behind a hand. Despite their ebudari garments, only Tamarla, lean and olive-skinned, was Altaran, and not even from the city. They parted as soon as Nynaeve came close, revealing a woman on her knees, wrists bound behind her, a leather sack covering her head, and her fine clothes torn and dusty. She was as much the reason for their uneasiness as Marililla's frowns or the forsaken, perhaps more. Tamarla dragged the hood off, leaving the woman's thin, bead-studded braids tangled. Ispan Shafar tried to rise and managed to reach an awkward crouch before she staggered and sank back down, blinking and giggling foolishly. Sweat ran down her cheeks and a few bruises from her capture marred her ageless features. She had been treated too gently for her crimes, to Avienda's mind. The herbs Nynaeve had forced down the woman's throat still fogged her wits, as well as weakening her knees, but Christian held a shield on her with every shred of the power she could summon. There was no chance the Shadow Runner might escape. Even had she not been dosed, Christian was as strong in the power as Rihanna, stronger than most eyes Sedai Avienda had met. Yet even Sumiko plucked her skirts nervously and avoided looking at the kneeling woman. Surely the sisters should have her now, Liana's high-pitched voice carried, unsteady enough to belong to the black sister Kirstian shielded. Nynaeve Sedai, we, we should not be got, uh, in charge of an eyes Sedai. That's right. Sumiko put in quickly and anxiously. The Aes Sedai should have her now, Sibella echoed her, and nods and murmurs of agreement rippled through the kinswomen. They believed in their bones that they stood far below Aes Sedai. Very likely they would have chosen guarding Trollocs over holding an Aes Sedai. The disapproving stares from Marililla and the other sisters changed once Ispan Shafar's face was revealed. Sarisa Tomaris, who had worn her brown-fringed shawl only a few years and still did not have the ageless appearance, glared with a disgust that should have flayed the Shadow Runner at fifty paces. Adelius and Van Deen, hands tightening on their skirts, appeared to struggle with hatred for the woman who had been their sister and betrayed them. Yet the stares they gave the knitting circle were not that much better. They, too, knew in their hearts that the kin stood a very long way below them. There was much more to it than that, but the betrayer had been one of their own, and no one but they had the right to her. Avienda agreed. A maiden who betrayed her spear sisters did not die quickly or unshamed. Nynaeve pulled the sack back down over Ispan Shafar's head with some force. You've done well so far, and you'll continue to do well she told the kinswomen firmly. If she shows signs of coming round, pour some more of that mixture down her. It'll keep her giddy as a goat full of ale. Hold her nose if she tries not to swallow. Even an eyes Sedai will swallow if you hold her nose and threaten to box her ears. Rihanna's jaw dropped and her eyes sprang wide like most of her companions. Sumiko nodded, but slowly, and goggled nearly as much as the others. When kinswomen said Eyes Sedai, they might have been naming the Creator. The thought of holding an Eyes Sedai's nose, even a shadow runner's, painted their faces with horror. By the popping eyes among the Eyes Sedai, they liked the notion even less. 
Marililla opened her mouth, staring at Nynaeve, but just then Elaine reached her, and the gray sister rounded on her instead, sparing barely a single disapproving frown for Birgitta. It was a measure of her agitation that her voice rose rather than dropping. Normally Marililla was very discreet. Elaine, you must speak to Nynaeve. Those women are confused and frightened out of their wits already. It won't help if she upsets them even more. If the Amerlin seat really does intend to allow them to go to the tower— She shook her head slowly, trying to deny that and perhaps a great deal else. If she does mean to, they must have a clear picture of their places, and the Amerlin does. Elaine cut her off. From Nynaeve, a firm tone was a fist shaken under your nose. From Elaine, it was calm certainty. They will have their chance to try again, and if they fail, they still will not be sent away. No woman who can channel will be cut off from the tower again. They will all be a part of the White Tower. Fingering her belt knife idly, Avienda wondered about that. Egwene, Elaine's Amerlin seat, said much the same. She was a friend, too, but she had wrapped her heart around being Aes Sedai. Avienda herself did not want to be part of the White Tower. She very much doubted that Sora Leah or any other wise one did either. Marililla sighed and folded her hands, yet for all her outward acceptance she still forgot to lower her voice. As you say, Elaine... But about Ispan, we simply cannot allow— Elaine raised a hand sharply. Command replaced mere certainty. Cease, Marililla. You have the bowl of the winds to watch. That is enough for anyone. It will be enough for you. Marililla opened her mouth, then closed it again and bowed her head slightly in acquiescence. Under Elaine's steady gaze, the other eyes to die bent theirs, too. If some displayed reluctance, however small, not all did. Saritha hurriedly picked up the disc-shaped bundle wrapped in layers of white silk that had been lying by her feet. Her arms barely went all the way around as she held the bowl of the winds to her bosom, smiling anxiously at Elaine, as if to show that she really was keeping a close eye on it. The sea folk women stared hungrily at the bundle, almost leaning forward. Avienda would not have been surprised to see them leap across the stones to seize the bowl. The eyes to eyes saw the same, plainly. Saritha clutched the white parcel more tightly, and Marililla actually stepped between her and the Afaan Nier. Smooth eyes to die faces tightened with the effort of remaining expressionless. They believed the bowl should belong to them. All things that used or manipulated the one power belonged to the white tower in their eyes no matter who happened to possess them at the moment. But there was the bargain. The sun moves, I said die, Renaila and Callan announced loudly, and danger threatens, so you maintain. If you think to worm free in some fashion by delaying, think twice and again. Try to break the bargain, and by my father's heart I will return to the ships at once, and claim the bowl for redress. It was ours from the breaking. You watch your tongue with eyes to die, Rihanna barked, scandalized indignation from her blue straw hat to the stout shoes peeking from beneath her green and white petticoats. Renaila Din Callan's mouth curled into a sneer. The jellyfish have tongues, it seems. A surprise they can use them, though, when no eyes to die gave permission. In an instant, the stable yard was full of shouted insults flying between kin and Afan Mier, wilder and spineless and growing worse, strident cries that buried Marililla's attempts to hush Rihanna and her companions on one hand and soothe the sea folk on the other. Several windfinders stopped fingering the daggers thrust behind their sashes and gripped hilts instead. The glow of Sidar sprang up around first one, then another of the brightly clad women. The kinswomen looked startled, though it did not slow their tirade. But Sumiko embraced the source, then Tamarla, 
then willowy, doe-eyed Chilaris, and soon every one of them and every one of the windfinders shone while words flew and tempers boiled. Avienda wanted to groan. Any moment blood would begin to flow. She would follow Elaine's lead, but her near sister was glaring cold fury at windfinders and knitting circle alike. Elaine had small patience with stupidity in herself or others, and shouting insults when an enemy might be coming was the worst sort. Avienda took a firm grip on her belt knife, then after a moment embraced Sidar. Life and joy filled her to near weeping. Wise ones only used the power when words had failed, but neither words nor steel would do here. She wished she had some idea of who to kill first. Enough! Nynaeve's piercing shriek sliced the words short on every tongue. Astonished faces swiveled toward her. Her head swung dangerously, and she stabbed a finger at the knitting circle. Stop behaving like children! Although she had moderated her tone, it was by hairs. Or do you mean to squabble until the Forsaken come to scoop up the bowl and us? And you! That finger thrust at the windfinders. Stop trying to wriggle out of your agreement! You won't get the bowl until you've met every last word. Don't you think you will? Nynaeve swung round on the eyes to die. And you! Met by cool surprise... Her flow of words tapered off into a sour grunt. The Aes Sedai had not joined in the shouting except to try quieting it. None shone with the light of Sidar. That was not enough to calm Nynaeve completely, of course. She tugged fiercely at her hat, plainly still full of anger she wanted to loose. But the kinswomen were staring at the paving stones in red-faced chagrin, and even the windfinders appeared a little abashed. A little muttering to themselves, yet refusing quite to meet Nynaeve's glare. The glow winked out around one woman after another, until only Avienda still held to the source. She gave a start as Elaine touched her arm. She was getting soft, letting people sneak up on her, jumping at a touch. This crisis seems to be weathered, Elaine murmured. Perhaps it's time to go before the next breaks out. A touch of color in her cheeks was the only sign that she had ever been angry, and a bit in Brigitte's. The two reflected one another in some ways since the bonding. Past time, Avienda agreed. Much longer and she would be a milk-hearted wetlander. Every eye followed as she walked out into the open space in the center of the stable yard, to the spot she had studied and felt until she knew it with her eyelids closed. There was a joy in holding the power, a joy in working Sidar that she could not have put into words. To contain Sidar, to be contained by it, was to seem alive beyond any other time. A delusion, the wise ones said, as false and dangerous as a mirage of water in the turmoil. Yet it seemed more real than the paving stones beneath her feet. She fought the urge to draw more, Already she held nearly as much as she could. Everyone crowded close as she began to weave the flows. That there were things many eyes that I could not do still startled Avienda, after all she had seen. Several of the knitting circle were strong enough, but only Sumiko, and surprisingly Rihanna openly studied what she was doing. Sumiko went so far as to shrug off the encouraging pats Nynaeve tried to give her, which earned a look of startled indignation from Nynaeve that Sumiko, her gaze fixed on Avienda, never saw. All of the windfinders had sufficient strength. They watched as hungrily as they had stared at the bowl. The bargain gave them every right. Avienda focused, and the flows wove together, creating identity between this place and the place she and Elaine and Nynaeve had chosen on a map. She gestured as though opening tent flaps. That was no part of the weave Elaine had taught her, but it was almost all she could recall of what she herself had done, long before Egwene made her first gateway. The flows coalesced into a silvery vertical slash that rotated and became an opening in the air, taller than a man and just as wide. 
Beyond lay a large clearing surrounded by trees twenty or thirty feet high, miles north of the city on the far side of the river. Knee-high brown grass came right up to the gateway, swaying through in a small breeze. It had not truly turned, only seemed to. Some of those blades were sliced cleanly, though, some lengthwise. The edges of an opening gateway made a razor seem dull. The gateway filled her with dissatisfaction. Elaine could make this weave with only a part of her strength, yet for some reason it required all but a fraction of Avienda's. She was sure she could have woven a larger, as large as Elaine could, using the weaves she had made without thought while trying to escape Rand Althor what seemed a very long time ago. But no matter how often she tried, only scraps came back to her. She felt no envy. Rather, she took pride in her near sister's accomplishments, but her own failure made shame surge in her heart. Soralia or Amis would be hard on her if they knew that, about the shame. Too much pride, they would call it. Amis should understand she had been a maiden. There was shame in failing at what you should be able to do. If she had not had to hold the weave, she would have run away so no one could see her. The departure had been carefully planned, and the whole stable yard sprang into motion as soon as the gateway opened fully. Two of the knitting circle pulled the hooded shadow runner to her feet, and the wind finders hurriedly formed a line behind Renilad and Callan. The servants began bringing horses out of the stables. Lan, Bergita, and one of Cariana's warders, a lanky man called Sierra Larjuna, immediately darted through the gateway, one behind the other. Like far Darai Smai, warders always claimed the right to scout ahead. Avienda's feet itched to run after them, but there was no point. Unlike Elaine, she could not move more than five or six steps without this weave beginning to weaken, and the same if she tried to tie it off. It was very frustrating. This time there was no real expectation of danger, so the Aes Sedai followed immediately, Elaine and Nynaeve as well. Farms dotted that treed area thickly, and a wandering shepherd or a young couple seeking privacy might need guidance away from seeing too much, but no shadow-souled or shadow-runner could know that clearing. Only she, Elaine, and Nynaeve did, and they had not spoken in the choosing for fear of eavesdroppers. Standing in the opening, Elaine gave Avienda a questioning look, but Avienda motioned her to go on. Plans were meant to be followed, unless there was reason to change them. The wind finders began filing slowly through to the clearing, each suddenly irresolute as she approached this thing she had never dreamed of, taking a breath before she entered, and abruptly the prickling returned. Avienda's eyes rose to the windows overlooking the stable yard. Anyone might be hidden behind the white screens of intricate wrought iron and piercework carving. Tylan had ordered the servants to stay away from those windows, but who would stop Tylan or Jolene or something made her look higher to the domes and towers? Narrow walks ringed some of those slim spires, and on one very high was a black shape haloed by a sharp nimbus from the sun behind. A man. Her breath caught. Nothing in his stance, hands on the stone railing, spoke of danger, yet she knew he was the one who put that crawling between her shoulder blades. One of the shadow souls would not stand there simply watching, but that creature, that golem, ice formed in her belly. He could be just a palace servant. He could be, but she did not believe it. No shame in knowing fear. Anxiously she glanced at the women still edging through the gateway with agonizing slowness. Half the sea folk were gone, and the knitting circle waited behind the rest with the shadow runner firmly in hand, their own unease at the passage warring with resentment that the sea folk women were allowed to go first. If she voiced her suspicions, the kinswomen surely would run. Mere mention of the shadow soul dried their mouths and turned their bowels to water, while the windfinders might well try to claim the bowl straight away. With them, the bowl stood above anything else. 
but only a blind fool stood scratching herself while a lion crept up on the herd she had been set to guard. She caught one of the Afaan Mier by a red silk sleeve. Tell Elaine, a face like smooth black stone turned to her. The woman somehow made full lips seem thin. Her eyes were black pebbles, flat and hard. What message could she send that would not bring down all the troubles she feared from them? Tell Elaine and Nynaeve to be wary. Tell them enemies always come when you least want them. You must say this to her without fail. The windfinder nodded with barely concealed impatience, but surprisingly she waited for Avienda to release her before making her hesitant way through the gateway. The walk up on the tower stood empty. Avienda felt no relief. He could be anywhere, making his way down to the stable yard. Whoever he was, whatever he was, he was dangerous. This was not a dust funnel dancing in her imagination. The last four warders had formed a square around the gateway, a guard who would be last to leave, and much as she despised their swords, she was grateful that someone there besides herself knew the use of sharp metal. Not that they would have any more chance against a golem, or worse, one of the shadows sold, than the servants waiting with the horses, or than she herself. Grimly she drew the power until the sweetness of Sidar grew near to pain. A hair beyond, and pain would almost become blinding agony for the moments needed to die or lose the ability completely. Would those shuffling women quicken their feet? No shame in feeling fear, but she was very much afraid that hers was painted on her face. Chapter 2 Unweaving Elaine stepped to one side as soon as she was through the gateway, but Nynaeve trampled across the clearing, kicking up brown grasshoppers from the dead grass and peering this way and that for evidence of the warders, of one warder anyway. A bright red bird flashed across the clearing and was gone. Nothing else moved except the sisters. A squirrel barked somewhere in the mostly leafless trees, and then there was silence. To Elaine it seemed impossible those three could have passed this way without leaving paths as wide as that behind Nynaeve, yet she could not make out any sign that they had been there at all. She sensed Brigitte somewhere off to her left, roughly southwest, she thought, and feeling quite content, clearly in no immediate danger. Kariana, part of a protective circle gathered around Saritha and the bowl, cocked her head almost as if listening. Apparently her Sierra was to the southeast, which meant Lan was north. Oddly enough, north was the direction Nynaeve had settled down to watch, all the while muttering under her breath. Perhaps being married had created some sense of him in her. More likely she had noticed a track that escaped Elaine. Nynaeve was as skilled at woodscraft as she was with herbs. From where Elaine stood at first, Avienda was clearly visible through the gateway, studying the palace rooftops as if she expected an ambush. By her stance she could have been carrying spears, ready to leap into battle in her riding dress. She made Elaine smile, hiding how distressed she was about her problems with the gateway, so much braver than she herself. But at the same time she could not help worrying. Avienda was brave and no one Elaine knew was better able to keep her head. She also might decide that Je Ito required her to fight when there was no chance except in running. The light around her shone so brightly it was obvious she could not draw much more of Sidar. If one of the Forsaken did appear, I should have stayed with her. Elaine rejected the thought immediately. Whatever excuse she gave, Avienda would know the truth and she was touchy as a man sometimes, most of the time, especially when it bore upon her honor. With a sigh, Elaine let the Athan Mier crowd her further from the gateway as they filed through. She stayed close enough to hear any shout on the other side, though, close enough to leap to Avienda's aid in a heartbeat. And for another reason. The windfinders came through in order of rank, striving to keep their faces smooth but even Renaila relaxed tight shoulders once her bare feet were beating down the tall brown grass. Some gave a little shiver, quickly suppressed, 
or glanced back with round eyes at the opening hanging in midair. One and all they stared at Elaine suspiciously as they stepped by her, and two or three opened their mouths, perhaps to ask what she was doing, perhaps to ask or tell her to move. She was just as glad that they hurried on in obedience to Renaila's curt urgings. They would have their chance to tell Aes Sedai what to do soon enough. It did not have to start with her. That thought made her stomach sink, and the number of them made her shake her head. They had the knowledge of whether to use the bull properly, yet even Renaila agreed, if reluctantly, that the more power directed through the bowl, the better the chances of being able to heal the weather. It must be directed with a precision impossible except for one woman alone, or a circle, though. A full circle of thirteen it had to be. That thirteen certainly would include Nynaeve and Avienda and Elaine herself, and probably a few of the kin, but Renaila plainly intended to jump on the part of the bargain that said they would be allowed to learn any abilities the Aes Sedai could teach. The gateway had been the first, and forming a circle would be the second. A wonder she had not brought every wind finder in the harbor. Imagine trying to deal with three or four hundred of these women. Elaine offered a small prayer of thanks that there were only twenty. She was not standing there to count them, though. As each windfinder passed, barely more than a pace away, she let herself feel the woman's strength in the power. Earlier there had been time to get close enough to only a handful, what with all the trouble of convincing Renaila to come at all. Apparently achieving rank among the windfinders had nothing to do with either age or strength. Renaila was far from the strongest, even in the first three or four, while one woman toward the rear, Senina, had weathered cheeks and thickly grayed hair. Strangely, by the marks in her ears it seemed that Senina might once have worn more than six earrings, and thicker ones than she did now. Elaine sorted and stored away faces and the names she knew with a growing sense of complacency. The windfinders might have secured an upper hand of sorts, and she and Nynaeve might be in deep trouble, very deep, with both Egwene and the Hall of the Tower once the terms of their bargain became known, but none of these women would stand particularly high among Aes Sedai. Certainly not low, but not high. She told herself not to feel smug. It changed nothing in what they had agreed, yet it was very hard not to. These were the best the Atha'an could produce, after all, here in Ebu Dar, anyway. And if they had been Aes Sedai, every one of them, from Kurin with her stony black stare to Renaila herself, would have listened when she spoke and stood when she entered a room, if they were Aes Sedai and behaving as they should. And then the end of the line appeared, and she gave a start as a young windfinder off one of the smaller ships passed her, a round-cheeked woman called Rainin, in plain blue silks, with barely a half-dozen ornaments hanging from her nose chain. The two apprentices, boyishly slim Talan and big-eyed Matara, scurried at the very tail with harried expressions. They had not earned the nose ring yet, much less the chain, and only a single thin gold earring in the left ear balanced the three in the right. Her eyes followed the three of them just short of staring, perhaps not short of it at that. The Atha on Mier clustered with Renaila again, most, like her, glaring hungrily at the eyes Sedai and the bowl. The last three women stood at the rear, the apprentices with the air of those uncertain whether they had a right to be there at all, Rainin folding her arms in imitation of Renaila, yet doing little better than the other two. The windfinder on a darter, the least of the sea folk vessels, likely seldom found herself in company with the windfinder to her clan wave mistress, not to mention the windfinder to the mistress of the ships. Rainin was easily as strong as Lelaine or Romanda, and Matara on a level with Elaine herself, while Talan, Talan, so meek in her red linen blouse, with eyes that seemed permanently downcast, came very close to Nynaeve. Very close. More, Elaine knew she herself had not yet reached her full potential, and neither had Nynaeve. How close were Matara and Talan? 
She had grown accustomed to knowing that only Nynaeve and the Forsaken were stronger than she. Well, Egwene, but she had been forced, and her own potential and Avienda's matched Egwene's. So much for complacency, she told herself ruefully. Linny would have said it was what she deserved for taking things for granted. Laughing softly at herself, Elaine turned back to check on Avienda, but the knitting circle stood rooted to one spot in front of the gateway, twitching at cold stares from Kariana and Saritha. All but Sumiko, and she did not move away either, for all that she had met the sisters' gazes. Kirstian appeared ready to burst into tears. Suppressing a sigh, Elaine herded the kinswomen out of the way of the stable folk waiting to bring the horses through. The knitting circle went along like sheep. She was the shepherd, Marililla and the rest the wolves, and they would have moved faster if not for Ispan. Famella, one of only four among the knitting circle without a touch of grey or white in her hair, and Eldays, a fierce-eyed woman when she was not looking at an eyes Sedai, held Ispan by the arms. They could not seem to decide between holding her firmly enough to keep her upright and not clutching her too tightly, with the result that the black sister moved in a bobbing fashion, sagging halfway to her knees when they loosened their grips, then pulled back up just before she fell completely. Forgive me, I said I, Famella kept murmuring to Ispan with a faint Taraboner accent. Oh, I am sorry, I said I, Eldays winced and gave a little moan every time Ispan stumbled. Just as if Ispan had not helped murder two of their number and the light alone knew how many others. They were fussing over a woman who was going to die. The killings in the White Tower that Ispan had conspired at were enough to condemn her by themselves. Take her over there somewhere, Elaine told them, waving away from the gateway into the clearing. They obeyed, bobbing curtsies and nearly dropping Ispan, murmuring apologies to Elaine and to the hooded prisoner. Rihanna and the rest scurried along, anxiously eyeing the sisters around Marililla. Almost immediately the war of glares started up again. The eyes Sadai at the kinswomen, the knitting circle at the windfinders, and the Afa'an Mier at anybody their eyes fell on. Elaine clamped her teeth shut. She was not going to shout at them. Nynaeve always got better results with yells, anyway. But she did want to shake some sense into every one of them, shake them until their teeth rattled, including Nynaeve, who was supposed to be getting everyone organized instead of staring into the trees. But what if it had been Rand who was going to die, unless she could find a way to save him? Suddenly tears trembled on the edge of falling, stinging her eyes. Rand was going to die, and there was nothing she could do to stop it. Peel the apple in your hand, girl, not the one on the tree. Linny's thin voice seemed to whisper in her ear. Tears are for after. They just waste time before. Thank you, Linny, Elaine murmured. Her old nurse was an irritating woman sometimes, never admitting that any of her charges had really grown up, but her advice was always good. Just because Nynaeve was slacking her duties was no reason for Elaine to slack hers. Servants had started trotting horses through right on the heels of the knitting circle, beginning with the pack horses. None of those first animals carried anything so frivolous as clothes. They could walk if the riding horses needed to be abandoned on the other side of the gateway, and wear what they stood up in if the rest of the pack animals had to be left behind. But what was on those first horses could not be left for the forsaken. Elaine motioned the leather-cheeked woman leading the very first to follow her aside, out of the way of the others. Untying and tossing back the stiff canvas cover on one of the wide wicker panniers revealed a great heap of what appeared to be rubbish, stuffed in every which way, right up to the top some of it wrapped in cloth that was falling to pieces. The greater part of it probably was rubbish. Embracing Sidar, Elaine began sorting. A rusted breastplate quickly went onto the ground, along with a broken table leg, a cracked platter, a badly dented pewter pitcher, and a bolt of rotted, unidentifiable cloth that almost broke apart in her hands. 
The storeroom where they found the bowl of the winds had been stuffed full. Things that should have been on a refuse heap jumbled in with more objects of the power than just the bowl. Some in beetle-riddled casks or chests, some carelessly stacked. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the kin had hidden away all things they found that were connected to the power, fearful of using them and fearful of delivering them to Aes Sedai. Until that very morning. This was the first chance Elaine had had to see what was worth keeping. The light said that the dark friends had not gotten away with anything important. They had taken some, but certainly less than a quarter of what the room had held, rubbish included. The light said she found something they could use. People had died to bring these things out of the Rahad. She did not channel, just held the power as she lifted each item. A chipped clay cup, three broken plates, a child's moth-eaten dress, and an old boot with a hole worn through the side all fell to the ground. A stone carving a little larger than her hand. It felt like stone. It might have been a carving, though it did not exactly look carved for some reason, all deep blue curves vaguely like roots. It seemed to warm faintly at her touch. It held a resonance to Sidar. That was the closest word she could think of. What it was meant to do, she had no idea, but it was a Turangrial without any doubt. It went on the other side of her, away from the pile of rubbish. The heap of refuse continued to grow, but so did the other, if more slowly. Things that had nothing in common except the faint warmth and the sense of echoing the power. A small box that felt like ivory, covered in wavering red and green stripes. She set it down carefully without opening the hinged lid. You could never tell what might trigger a Turangrial. A black rod no thicker than her little finger, a pace in length, stiff yet so flexible she thought she could have doubled it into a circle. A tiny stoppered vial that might have been crystal with a dark red liquid inside. The figure of a stout, bearded man with a jolly smile holding a book. Two feet tall, it appeared to be age-darkened bronze, and took both of her hands to move. Other things. Most was trash, though, and none was what she truly wanted. Not yet. Is this the time to be doing that? Nynaeve asked. She straightened hastily from the small cluster of Turangrial, grimacing and rubbing her hand on her skirt. That rod feels like pain, she muttered. The hard-faced woman holding the pack-horse's head blinked at the rod and edged away. Elaine eyed the rod. Nynaeve's occasional impressions about objects she touched could be useful, but she did not stop sorting. There had been too much pain lately to need any more, surely. Not that what Nynaeve sensed was always that straightforward. The rod might have been present when a great deal of pain was caused without being the cause in itself. The pannier was almost empty. Some of what was on the other side of the horse would have to be shifted to balance the weight. If there's an Angrial in this somewhere, Nynaeve, I would like to find it before Mogedian taps one of us on the shoulder. Nynaeve grunted sourly, but she peered into the wicker basket. Dropping another table leg, that made three, none of which matched, Elaine spared a glance for the clearing. All of the pack horses were out, and the mounts were coming through the gateway now, filling the open space between the trees with bustle and confusion. Marililla and the other eyes to die already sat their saddles, barely concealing their impatience to be off, while Paul fussed hurriedly with her mistress's saddlebags. But the windfinders, graceful afoot, graceful on their ships, they were unused to horses. Renaila was trying to mount from the wrong side, and the gentle bay mare chosen for her danced slow circles around the liveried man who was gripping the bridle with one hand, while tugging his hair in frustration with the other, and vainly trying to correct the windfinder. Two of the stable women were attempting to hoist Dorilla, who served the wave mistress of Clan Somarin, into her saddle, while a third, holding the grey's head, wore the tight face of someone trying not to laugh. Rainin was on the back of a leggy brown gelding, but somehow without either foot in the stirrups or the reins in her hands, and having considerable trouble finding any of them. 
and those three seemed to be having the easiest time of it. Horses whinnied and danced and rolled their eyes, and windfinders shouted curses in voices that could have been heard over a gale. One of them knocked a serving man flat with her fist, and three more stable folk were trying to catch mounts that had gotten free. There was also what she had expected to see, if Nynaeve was no longer keeping her private watch. Lan stood by his black warhorse, Mandarb, dividing his gaze between the tree line, the gateway, and Nynaeve. Birgitta came striding out of the woods, shaking her head, and a moment later Sierra trotted from the trees, but with no sense of urgency. There was nothing out there to threaten or inconvenience them. Nynaeve was watching her, eyebrows raised high. I didn't say anything, Elaine said. Her hand closed on something small, wrapped in rotting cloth that might have been white once, or brown. She knew immediately what was inside. A good thing for you, Nynaeve grumbled, not quite far enough under her breath. I can't abide women who poke their noses into other people's business. Elaine let it pass without so much as a start. She was proud that she did not have to bite her tongue. Stripping away the decayed cloth revealed a small amber brooch in the shape of a turtle. It looked like amber anyway, and it might have been amber once, but when she opened herself to the source through it, Sidar rushed into her, a torrent compared to what she could draw safely on her own. Not a strong Angrial, but far better than nothing. With it she could handle twice as much of the power as Nynaeve, and Nynaeve herself would do better still. Releasing the extra flow of Sidar, she slipped the brooch into her belt pouch with a smile of delight and went back to searching. Where there was one, there might be more. And now that she had one to study, she might be able to reason out how to make an Angrial. That was something she had wished for. It was all she could do not to take the brooch out again and begin probing it right there. Van Dien had been eyeing Nynaeve and her for some time, and now she heeled her slab-sided gelding over to them and dismounted. The groom at the packhorse's head managed a decent, if awkward, curtsy, more than she had for Elaine or Nynaeve. "'You're being careful,' Van Dien said to Elaine, "'and that's very good. But it might be better to leave these things alone until they're in the tower.' Elaine's mouth tightened. "'In the tower?' Until they could be examined by someone else was what she meant. Someone older and supposedly more experienced. I do know what I'm doing, Van Dien. I have made Turangrial, after all. Nobody else living has done that. She had taught the basics to some sisters, but no one had managed the trick of it by the time she left for Ebudar. The older Green nodded, flipping her reins idly against the palm of her riding glove. Martina Janata also knew what she was doing. So I understand, she said casually. She was the last sister to really make a business of studying Terangrial. She did it for over forty years, almost from the time she reached the shawl. She was careful, too, so I was told. Then one day Martina's maid found her unconscious on the floor of her sitting room. Burned out. Even in a conversational tone, those words were a sharp slap. Van Dien's voice did not alter a hair, though. Her warder was dead from the shock. Not unusual in cases like that. When Martina came to, three days later, she couldn't recall what she'd been working with. She couldn't remember the preceding week at all. That was more than twenty-five years ago, and no one since has had the nerve to touch any of the Turangrial that were in her rooms. Her notes mentioned every last one, and everything she had discovered was innocuous, innocent, even frivolous. But Van Dien shrugged. She found something she wasn't expecting. Elaine peeked at Brigitte and found Brigitte looking back at her. She did not need to see the worried frown on the other woman's face. It was mirrored in her mind, in the small patch of her mind that was Brigitte, and in the rest. Brigitte felt her worry, and she felt Brigitte's, until sometimes it was hard to say which was which. She risked more than herself. But she did know what she was doing, more than anyone else there, at least. And even if none of the Forsaken appeared, they needed all of the Angrial she could find. 
What happened to Martina? Nynaeve asked quietly. Afterward, I mean. She could seldom hear of anyone being hurt without wanting to heal them. She wanted to heal everything. Van Deen grimaced. She might have been the one to bring up Martina, but I said I did not like talking about women who had been burned out or stilled. They did not like remembering them. She vanished once she was well enough to slip out of the tower, she said hurriedly. The important thing to remember is that she was cautious. I never met her, but I've been told she treated every Turangrial as if she had no idea what it might do next, even the one that makes the cloth for warders' cloaks, and nobody has ever been able to make that do anything else. She was careful, and it did her no good. Nynaeve laid an arm across the nearly empty pannier. Maybe you really should, she began. No! Marililla shrieked. Elaine spun, instinctively opening herself through the Angreal again, only half conscious of Sidar flooding into Nynaeve and Van Deen. The glow of the power sprang up around every woman in the clearing who could embrace the source. Marililla was straining forward in her saddle, eyes bulging, one hand reaching toward the gateway. Elaine frowned. There was nothing there except Avienda, and the last four warders, startled in the middle of walking away, searching for the threat with swords half-drawn. Then she realized what Avienda was doing, and nearly lost Sidar in her shock. The gateway trembled as Avienda carefully picked apart the weave that had made it. It shivered and flexed, the edges wavering. The last flows came loose, and instead of winking out, the opening shimmered, the view through it of the courtyard fading away until it evaporated like mist in the sun. That is impossible, Renyla said incredulously. An astonished murmur of agreement broke out among the windfinders. The kinswomen gaped at Avienda, mouths working soundlessly. Elaine nodded slowly in spite of herself. Clearly it was possible, but one of the first things she had been told as a novice was that never, ever under any circumstances was she to try what Avienda had just done. Picking apart a weave, any weave, rather than simply letting it dissipate, could not be done, as she had been told, not without inevitable disaster. Inevitable. You fool girl! Van Deen snapped, her face a thunderhead. She strode toward Avienda, dragging her gelding behind. Do you realize what you almost did? One slip, one, and there's no saying what the weave will snap into or what it will do. You could have completely destroyed everything for a hundred paces, five hundred, everything. You could have burned yourself out and it was necessary, Avienda cut in. A babble erupted from the mounted eyes Sedai crowding around her and Van Deen, but she glared at them and raised her voice over theirs. I know the dangers, Van Deen Namel, but it was necessary. Is this another thing you eyes Sedai cannot do? The wise ones say any woman can learn if she is taught, some women more and some less, but any woman, if she can pick out embroidery. She did not quite sneer. Not quite. This is not embroidery, girl. Marililla's voice was deep winter ice. Whatever so-called training you received among your people, you cannot possibly know what you are playing with. You will promise me, swear to me, that you will never do this again. Her name should be in the novice book, Saritha said firmly, glaring across the bowl still held firmly to her bosom. I've always said it. She should be entered in the book. Kariana nodded, her stern gaze measuring Avienda for a novice dress. That might not be necessary for the moment, Adelias told Avienda, leaning forward in her cell. But you must let yourself be guided by us. The brown sister's tone was much milder than the others, yet she was not making a suggestion. A month or so earlier... Avienda might have begun to wilt under all that Aes Sedai disapproval, but not now. Elaine hurriedly pushed in among the horses before her friend decided to draw the knife she was fondling, or to do something worse. Maybe somebody should ask 
why she thought it was necessary, she said, slipping an arm around Avienda's shoulders as much to keep her arms at her sides as for comfort. Avienda did not quite include her in the exasperated look she gave the other sisters. This leaves no residue, she said patiently, too patiently. The residues of a weave this large might be read two days from now. Marililla snorted, a very strong sound to come from that slight body. That is a rare talent, girl. Either Teslin or Jolene has it. Or do you, Aiel Wilders, all learn that as well? Few can do it, Avienda admitted calmly. But I can. That produced a different sort of stare from Elaine as well. It was a very rare talent. She did not seem to notice. Do you claim that none of the shadow sold can? She went on. The tightness of her shoulder under Elaine's hand said she was not so cool as she pretended. Are you such fools that you leave tracks for your enemies to follow? Any who could read the residues could make a gateway to this spot. That would have taken great dexterity, very great dexterity, but the suggestion was enough to leave Marililla blinking. Adelius opened her mouth, then closed it without speaking, and Van Deen frowned thoughtfully. Saritha simply looked worried. Who could say what talents the Forsaken had, what skill? Strangely, all the fierceness drained out of Avienda. Her eyes fell, her shoulders loosened. Perhaps I should not have taken the risk, she muttered. With that man watching me, I could not think clearly, and when he disappeared... A little of her spirit returned, but not a great deal. I do not think a man could read my weaves, she said to Elaine. But if he was one of the shadow sold, or even the golem, the shadow sold no more than any of us. If I was wrong, I have great toe, but I do not think I was. I do not think it. What man? Nynaeve demanded. Her hat had been knocked askew in pushing among the horses, and that, with the tight frown she directed at everyone impartially, made her look ready for a fight. Perhaps she was. Kariana's gelding accidentally nudged her with a shoulder, and she swatted the blue dun's nose. A servant! Marililla said dismissively. Whatever orders Tylan gave, Altaran servants are an independent lot. Or perhaps her son. That boy is too curious by half. The sisters around her nodded, and Kariana said, One of the Forsaken would hardly have stood and watched. You said so yourself. She was patting her gelding's neck and frowning accusingly at Nynaeve. Kariana was one of those who gave her horse the sort of affection most people reserved for infants. She was frowning at Nynaeve, and Nynaeve took the words for her, too. Maybe it was a servant, and maybe it was Beslan. Maybe. Nynaeve's sniff said she did not believe it, or that she wanted them to believe she did not. She could tell you to your face that you were a blind idiot— Yet let anyone else say it, and she would defend you until she went hoarse. Of course, she did not seem ready to decide whether she liked Avienda, but she definitely did not like the older eyes Sedai. She tugged her hat almost straight, and her frown swept across them, then started over. Whether it was Beslin or the Dark One, there's no call to stand here all day. We need to get ready and move on to the farm. Well, move! She clapped her hands sharply, and even Van Deen gave a little start. There was little preparation left to do when the sisters moved their horses away. Lan and the other warders had not sat on their heels once they realized there was no danger. Some of the servants had gone back through the gateway before Avienda disposed of it, but the rest stood with the three dozen or so pack horses, occasionally glancing at the eyes to die, clearly wondering what marvel they might produce next. The wind-finders were all mounted, if awkwardly, and holding their reins as though expecting their horses to bolt any moment, or perhaps sprout wings and take flight. So were the knitting circle, with a good deal more grace, unconcerned that their skirts and petticoats were pushed up past their knees, and with Ispan still hooded and tied across a saddle like a sack. She could not possibly have sat upright on a horse, yet even Sumiko's eyes popped whenever they touched her. 
Glaring about her, Nynaeve looked ready to tongue-lash everybody into doing what they had already done, but only until Lan handed her the reins of her plump brown mare. She had adamantly refused the gift of a better horse from Tylan. Her hand trembled a little when it touched Lan's, and her face changed color as she swallowed the anger she had been about to unleash. When he offered a hand for her foot, she stared at him for a moment as if wondering what he was about, then colored again when he boosted her to her saddle. Elaine could only shake her head. She hoped she did not turn into an idiot when she married, if she married. Brigitta brought her silvery-gray mare and the yellow dun Avienda road, but she seemed to understand that Elaine wanted a private word with Avienda. She nodded almost as if Elaine had spoken, swung up onto her mouse-colored gelding, and rode to where the other warders were waiting. They greeted her with nods and began discussing something in low voices. By the glances directed at the sisters, the something had to do with taking care of Aes Sedai, whether Aes Sedai wanted care taken or not. Including herself, Elaine noted grimly. There was no time now for that, though. Avienda stood fiddling with her horse's reins, staring at the animal like a novice staring at a kitchen full of greasy pots. Very likely, Avienda saw a small difference between having to scrub pots and having to ride. Snugging her green riding gloves, Elaine casually shifted Lioness to block them from the other's view, then touched Avienda's arm. Talking to Adelias or Van Deen might help, she said gently. She had to be very careful here, as careful as with any Turangrial. They're old enough to know more than you might suspect. There has to be a reason you've been having trouble with traveling. That was a mild way of putting it. Avienda almost had failed to make the weave work at all in the beginning. Careful. Avienda was far more important than any Turangrial ever could be. They might be able to help. How can they? Avienda stared stiffly at the saddle on her gelding. They cannot travel. How could any of them know how to help? Abruptly her shoulders slumped, and she turned her head to Elaine. Shockingly unshed tears glistened in her green eyes. That isn't the truth, Elaine. Not the whole truth. They cannot help, but you are my near sister. You have the right to know. They think I panicked at a servant. If I ask for help, it must all come out. That I traveled once to run from a man. A man I hoped in my soul would catch me. To run like a rabbit to run wanting to be caught. How could I let them know such shame? Even if they really could help, how could I? Elaine wished she did not know, about the catching part at least, about the fact that Rand had caught her. Snatching the flecks of jealousy that suddenly were floating through her, she pushed them into a sack and stuffed it into the back of her head. Then she jumped up and down on it for good measure. When a woman plays the fool... Look for the man. That was one of Lini's favorites. Another was, Kittens tangle your yarn, men tangle your wits, and it's simple as breathing for both. She drew a deep breath. No one will know from me, Avienda. I'll help you as much as I can, if I can figure out how. Not that there was much she could think to do. Avienda was remarkably quick at seeing how weaves were formed, much quicker than she herself. Avienda merely nodded and scrambled clumsily into her saddle, showing a bit more grace than the sea folk. There was a man watching Elaine, and he was no servant. Looking Elaine right in the eye, she added, He frightened me. An admission she likely would have made to no one else in the world. We're safe from him now, whoever he was, Elaine said, turning Linus to follow Nynaeve and Lan from the clearing. In truth, it very likely had been a servant, but she would never tell that to anyone, Avienda least of all. We're safe, and in a few more hours we will reach the kin's farm, we'll use the bowl, and the world will be right again. Well, somewhat. The sun seemed lower than it had in the stable yard, but she knew that was only imagination. For once they had gained a clear jump on the shadow. From behind a screen of white wrought iron, Moradin watched the last of the horses vanish through the gateway, and then the tall young woman, 
and the four warders. It was possible they were carrying away some item he could use, an angriol attuned to men, perhaps, but the chances were small. For the rest, the terangriol, the greatest likelihood was that they would kill themselves trying to puzzle out how to use them. Samael was a fool to have risked so much to seize a collection of no one knew what, but then Samael had never been half as clever as he thought. He himself would not disrupt his own plans merely on the off chance to see what scraps of civilization he could find. Only idle curiosity had brought him here. He liked to know what others thought important. But it was dross. He was about to turn away when the outlines of the gateway suddenly began to flex and tremble. Transfixed, he watched until the opening simply melted. He had never been a man to give way to obscenities, but several rose in his mind. What had the woman done? These barbarous rustics offered too many surprises. A way to heal being severed, however imperfectly, that was impossible. Except that they had done it. Involuntary rings. Those warders and the bond they shared with their Aes Sedai. He had known of that for a long, long time, but whenever he thought he had the measure of them, these primitives revealed some new skill, did something that no one in his own age had dreamed of, something the pinnacle of civilization had not known. What had the girl done? Great master, Moradin barely turned his head from the window. Yes, Maddick? Her soul be damned, what had the girl done? The balding man in green and white, who had slipped into the small room, bowed deeply before falling to his knees. One of the upper servants in the palace, Matic, with his long face, possessed a pompous dignity that he tried to maintain even now. Morden had seen men who stood far higher do far worse. Great master, I have learned what the Aes Sedai brought to the palace this morning. It is said they found a great treasure— Hidden in ancient days, gold and jewels and heartstone, artifacts from Shiota and Aharon, and even the Age of Legends. There are said to be things among them that use the one power. It is said that one can control the weather. No one knows where they are going, great master. The palace is a quiver with talk, but ten tongues name ten different destinations. Morden went back to studying the stable yard below as soon as Maddox spoke. Ridiculous tales of gold and quandy are held no interest. Nothing would make a gateway behave that way, unless... Could she actually have unraveled the web? Death held no fear for him. Coldly he considered the possibility that he had been within sight of an unraveling web. One that had been unmade successfully. Another impossibility, casually offered up by these... Something Maddock had said caught his ear. The weather, Maddock? The shadows of the palace spires had barely lengthened from their bases, but there was not a cloud to shield the baking city. Yes, great master. It is called the Bowl of the Winds. The name meant nothing to him. But a Terran Griol to control the weather? In his own age, weather had been carefully regulated with the use of Terran Griol. One of the surprises of this age, one of the smaller, it had seemed, was that there were those who could manipulate weather to a degree that should have required one of those terangrial. One such device should not be enough to affect even a large part of a single continent. But what could these women do with it? What, if they used a ring? He seized the true power without thought, the sob billowing black across his sight. His fingers tightened in the wrought iron grill across the window. The metal groaned, twisting, not from his grip, but from the tendrils of the true power, drawn from the great lord himself that wreathed around the grillwork, flexing as he flexed his hand in anger. The great lord would not be pleased. He had strained from his prison to touch the world enough to fix the seasons in place. He was impatient to touch the world more, to shatter the void that contained him and he would not be pleased. Rage enveloped Moradin, blood pounding in his ears. A moment passed, he had not cared where those women went. But now, somewhere far from here, people fleeing ran as far and as fast as they could, somewhere they felt safe. 
No use sending Maddock to ask questions. No use squeezing anyone here. They would not have been fool enough to leave anyone behind alive who knew their destination. Not to Tarvalan. To Althor. To that band of rebel Aes Sedai. In all three places he had eyes, some that did not know they served him. All would serve him before the end. He would not allow chance slips to spoil his plans now. Abruptly he heard something other than the thundering drumbeat of his own fury, a bubbling sound. He looked at Maddock curiously and stepped back from the spreading puddle on the floor. It seemed that in his anger he had seized at more than the wrought-iron screen with the true power. Remarkable how much blood could be squeezed from a human body. He let what remained of the man fall without regret— indeed thinking only that when Maddock was found, the Aes Sedai would surely be blamed. A small addition to the chaos growing in the world. Ripping a hole in the fabric of the pattern, he traveled with the true power. He had to find those women before they used this bowl of the winds. And failing that, he disliked people meddling with his carefully laid plans. Those who did so and lived lived to pay. The golem stepped into the room cautiously, nostrils already twitching with the scent of still-hot blood. The livid burn on its cheek seemed like a live coal. The golem appeared to be merely a slender man, a little taller than average in this time, yet it had never encountered anything that could harm it, until that man with the medallion... What might have been smile or snarl, bared its teeth. Curious, it peered around the room, but there was nothing beyond the crushed corpse on the floor tiles. And, a uh, feel of something. Not the one power, but something that made it itch, if not quite in the same way. Curiosity had brought it here. Parts of the grill over the window were crushed pulling the whole thing loose at the sides. The golem seemed to remember something that made it itch in that manner, yet so much of what it recalled was fogged and dim. The world had changed, as it seemed, in the blink of an eye. There had been a world of war and killing on a huge scale, with weapons that reached across miles, across thousands of miles. And then there was... this. But the golem had not changed... It was still the most dangerous weapon of all. Its nostrils flared again, though it was not by scent that it tracked those who could channel. The one power had been used below and most to the north. To follow or not? The man who had wounded it was not with them. It had made sure of that before leaving the high vantage place. The one who commanded it wanted the man who had wounded it dead, perhaps as much as he did the women. But the women were an easier target. The women had been named, too, and for the time being it was constrained. For its entire existence it had been compelled to obey one or another human, but its mind held the concept of not being constrained. It must follow the women. It wanted to follow. The moment of death, when it felt the ability to channel vanish along with life, produced ecstasy. Rapture. But it was hungry, too. And there was time. Where they could run, it could follow. Settling fluidly beside the mangled body, it began to feed. Fresh blood, hot blood, was a necessity. But human blood always held the sweetest savor. Chapter 3 a pleasant ride. Farms and pastures and olive groves covered most of the land around Ebudar, but many small forests stretched a few miles across as well, and while the ground was much flatter than the Ramon Hills to the south, it rolled and sometimes rose in a prominence of a hundred feet or higher, sufficient to cast deep shadows in the afternoon sun. All in all, the country provided more than enough cover to keep unwanted eyes, from what might have passed as some odd merchant's pack train, nearly fifty people mounted, 
and almost as many afoot, especially when it had warders to find unfrequented paths through the undergrowth. Elaine did not sight a mark of human habitation beyond a few goats cropping on some of the hills. Even plants and trees used to heat were beginning to wither and die, yet at any other time she might have enjoyed merely seeing the countryside. It could have been a thousand leagues from the land she had seen riding down the other bank of the Eldar. The hills were strange knobby shapes, as though squeezed together by huge careless hands. Flocks of brilliantly hued birds soared up at their passing, and a dozen sorts of hummingbirds flitted away from the horses, hovering jewels on blurred wings. Thick vines hung like ropes in some places, and there were trees with bundles of narrow fronds at the top for foliage, and things that looked like green feather dusters as tall as a man. A handful of plants, fooled by the heat, struggled to put out blossoms, bright reds and vivid yellows, some twice as wide as her two hands. Their perfume was lush and sultry came to mind. She saw some boulders she would have wagered had once been toes on a statue, though why anyone would make a statue that large with bare feet she could not imagine, and another time the way led through a forest of thick fluted stones among the trees, the weathered stumps of columns, many toppled, and all long since mined almost to the ground for their stone by local farmers. A pleasant ride, despite the dust the horse's hooves raised from parched soil. The heat did not touch her, of course, and there were not very many flies. All the dangers lay behind them. They had outrun the forsaken, and no chance any of them or their servants could catch up now. It could have been a pleasant ride, except... For one thing, Avienda learned that the message she had sent about enemies coming when least expected had not been delivered. At first, Elaine felt relief at anything to change the topic from Rand. It was not the jealousy come back. Rather, more and more, she found herself wanting what Avienda had shared with him. Not jealousy. Envy. She would almost have preferred the other. Then she began really hearing what her friend was saying in a low monotone, and the hair on the back of her neck tried to stand. "'You can't do that,' she protested, reining her horse closer to Avienda's. Actually, she supposed Avienda would not have much trouble drubbing Kurin or tying her up or any of the rest, if the other seafolk women stood still for it anyway. "'We can't start a war with them, certainly not before we use the bowl. And not over this,' she added hastily. "'Not at all.' They certainly were not going to start a war before or after the bowl was used. Not just because the windfinders were behaving more high-handedly by the hour. Not just because... Drawing breath, she hurried on. If she had told me, I would not have known what you meant. I understand why you couldn't speak more clearly, but you do see, don't you? Avienda glared ahead at nothing, absently brushing flies away from her face. Without fail, I told her, she grumbled. Without fail. What if he had been one of the shadows sold? What if he had managed to get by me through the gateway, and you with no warning? What if— She turned a suddenly forlorn gaze on Elaine. I will bite my knife, she said sadly. But my liver may burst for it. Elaine was about to say that swallowing her anger was the right thing to do— and she could pitch as large a fit as she wanted, so long as she did not hurl it at the Afaan Mier. That was what all that about knives and livers meant. But before she could open her mouth, Adelias brought her rangy grey up on her other side. The white-haired sister had acquired a new saddle in Ebudar, a gaudy thing worked with silver on pommel and cantle. The flies seemed to avoid her for some reason, though she wore a scent as strong as any of the flowers. Pardon me, I could not help overhearing that last. Adelias did not sound at all apologetic, and Elaine wondered just how much she had overheard. She felt her cheeks coloring. Some of what Avienda had said about Rand had been remarkably frank and straightforward. Some of what she had said had been, too. It was one thing to talk that way with your nearest friend, quite another to suspect someone else had been listening. Avienda seemed to feel the same way. She did not blush— but the sour look she shot at the brown would have done Nynaeve proud. Adelias merely smiled, 
a vague smile as bland as water soup. It might be best if you gave your friend there free reign with the Asa Anmir. She peered past Elaine at Avienda, blinking. Well, a loose rein. Putting the fear of the light into them ought to be sufficient. They're almost there already, in case you haven't noticed. They're much more wary of the savage Aeel, forgive me, Avienda, than they are of Aes Sedai. Marilillo would have suggested it, but her ears are still burning. Avienda's face rarely gave much away, but right then she looked as puzzled as Elaine felt. Elaine twisted in her saddle to frown behind her. Marililla rode abreast with Van Deen, Kariana, and Saritha not far back, all very studiously looking at anything except Elaine. Beyond the sisters were the sea folk, still in single file, and then would come the knitting circle, keeping themselves out of sight for the moment just ahead of the pack horses. They were threading away through the glades of truncated columns. Fifty or a hundred long-tailed red and green birds winged over their heads, filling the air with chattering cries. Why? Elaine asked curtly. It seemed foolish to add to the turmoil already bubbling just below the surface, and sometimes on the surface, but she had seen no hint of the fool in Adelius. The brown sister's eyebrows rose in apparent surprise. Maybe she was surprised. Adelius usually thought anyone should see what she saw. Maybe. Why? To restore a little balance. That is why. If the Afaan Mier feel they need us to protect them from an Aeel, it might be a useful balance against... Adelius paused slightly, suddenly absorbed in adjusting her pale gray skirts. Other things. Elaine's face tightened. Other things. The bargain with the sea folk was what Adelius meant. You may ride with the others, she said coolly. Adelius made no protest. No attempts to press her argument. She just inclined her head and let her horse fall back. Her small smile never altered a whit. The older eyes Sedai accepted that Nynaeve and Elaine stood above them and spoke with Egwene's authority at their backs, but the truth was that changed little beyond the surface. Perhaps nothing. They were outwardly respectful. They obeyed. And yet... After all was said and done, Elaine, at least, was Aes Sedai at an age when most initiates of the Tower still wore novice white, and very few had reached the accepted. And she and Nynaeve had agreed to that bargain, hardly a display of wisdom and acumen. Not just the sea folk getting the bowl, but twenty sisters going to the Atha An Mier, subject to their laws, required to teach anything the Windfinders wanted to learn— and unable to leave until others came to replace them. Windfinders allowed to enter the tower as guests, allowed to learn whatever they wished, leave whenever they wished. Those alone would make the hall scream, and probably Egwene as well, yet the rest. Every last one of the older sisters thought she would have found a way around making that bargain. Perhaps they really could have. Elaine did not believe it, but she was not sure. She did not say anything to Avienda, but after a few moments the other woman spoke. "'If I can serve honor and help you at the same time, I do not care whether it serves some Aes Sedai end.' She never seemed to take it in that Elaine was also Aes Sedai, not completely. Elaine hesitated, then nodded. Something had to be done to temper the sea folk. Marililla and the others had displayed a remarkable forbearance so far, but how long would that last?' Nynaeve might explode once she actually turned her attentions to the windfinders. Matters had to be kept as smooth as possible for as long as possible, but if the Atha An Mier went on believing they could stare down any eyes to die, there would be trouble. Life was more complex than she had imagined back in Camelin, no matter how many lessons she had received as daughter heir. So much more complicated since she entered the tower. Just don't be too emphatic, she said softly, and please have a care. There are twenty of them, after all, and only one of you. I wouldn't want anything to happen before I could help you. Avienda gave her a grin with a good bit of wolf in it, and drew her dun mare off at the edge of the stones to wait for the Atha An Mier. From time to time Elaine glanced back, 
but all she saw through the trees was Avienda riding next to Curin, speaking quite calmly and not even looking at the sea folk woman, certainly not glaring, though Curin seemed to stare at her with considerable astonishment. When Avienda thumped her horse back up to join Elaine, flapping her reins, she would never be a horsewoman. Curin rode forward to speak with Renaila, and a short time later Renaila angrily sent Rain in to the head of the column. The most junior of the windfinders sat her horse even more awkwardly than Avienda, whom she pretended to ignore on Elaine's other side, just as she ignored the small green flies buzzing around her dark face. Renaila den Callan Blue Star, she said stiffly, demands that you snub in the Aiel woman, Elaine I said I. Avienda grinned toothily at her, and Rainin must have been watching at least a little because her cheeks reddened beneath the sheen of sweat. Tell Renaila that Avienda is not I said I, Elaine replied. I will ask her to be careful. No lie there, she had and would again. But I can't make her do anything. On impulse, she added, You know how Aiel are. The sea folk had some very odd ideas of how the Aiel were. Raynan stared wide eyed at a still grinning Avienda, her face going gray, then jerked her horse around and galloped back to Renaila, bouncing in her saddle. Avienda gave a pleased chuckle, but Elaine wondered whether the whole notion had been a mistake. Even with a good thirty paces between them, she could see Renaila's face swell up at Raynan's report, and the others began to buzz like bees. They did not look frightened, they looked angry, and the glares they directed at the eyes to die ahead of them grew baleful. Not at Avienda, at the sisters. Adelias nodded thoughtfully when she saw that, and Marililla just barely failed to hide a smile. At least they were pleased. If that had been the only incident during the ride, it would have taken the edge off any enjoyment of flowers and birds, but it was not even the first. Beginning shortly after leaving the clearing, the knitting circle had made their way forward to Elaine one by one, all but Christian, and no doubt she would have come too had she not been ordered to keep Ispan shielded. One by one they came, each hesitant, smiling timorously until Elaine wanted to tell them to act their ages. They certainly made no demands, and they were too smart to ask straight out for what already had been denied, but they found other paths. It occurred to me, Rihanna said brightly, that you must want to question Ispan Sadai quite urgently. Who can say what else she was up to in the city besides trying to find the storeroom? She pretended to just be making conversation, but from time to time she darted quick looks at Elaine to see how she was taking it. I'm sure we'll take over an hour to reach the farm, the way we're going, perhaps two, and you certainly don't want to waste two hours. The herbs Nynaeve said I gave her make her quite talkative, and I'm sure she would sit up for sisters. The bright smile faded when Elaine said that questioning Ispan could wait and would. Light! Did they really expect anyone to ask questions riding through forests on paths that barely deserved the name? Rihanna rode back to the other kinswomen, muttering to herself. Forgiveness, Elaine said I, Chilaris murmured a short time later, the traces of Murundi clinging to her accent. Her green straw hat matched some of her layered petticoats exactly. Your forgiveness, if I intrude. She did not wear the red belt of a wise woman. Most of the knitting circle did not. Famella was a goldsmith, and Eldays supplied lacquerware to the merchants for export. Chilares was a rug seller, while Rihanna herself arranged shipping for small traders. Some worked at simple tasks. Kirstian ran a tiny weaver's shop, and Dimana was a seamstress, though a prosperous one. But then in the course of their lives they had all followed many crafts, and used many names. Ispan Sadai appears to be unwell. Chilares said, shifting uneasily in her saddle. Perhaps the herbs are affecting her more than Nynaeve said I thought. It would be terrible if anything happened to her. Before she can be questioned, I mean. Perhaps the sisters would look at her? Healing, you know. She trailed off, blinking those big brown eyes nervously. As well she might, with Sumiko among her companions. 
A glance back showed the stout woman standing in her stirrups to peer past the windfinders until she saw Elaine looking and sat back down hurriedly. Sumiko, who knew more of healing than any sister except Nynaeve, perhaps more than Nynaeve. Elaine simply pointed to the rear until Chilaris colored and reined her mount around. Marililla joined Elaine only moments after Rihanna left, and the gray sister made a much better pretense at simple chat than the kinswoman had. In her manner of speaking, at least, she was poise itself. What she had to say was another matter. I wonder how trustworthy those women are, Elaine. Her lips pursed in distaste as she brushed dust from her divided blue skirts with a gloved hand. They say they do not take in wilders. But Rihanna herself may well be a wilder, whatever she claims about failing her test for accepted. Sumiko as well, and certainly Christian. A slight frown for Christian, a dismissive shake of her head. You must have noticed how she leaps at any mention of the tower. She knows no more than she might have picked up in conversation with someone who really was put out. Marilella sighed, regretting what she had to say. She really was very good. Have you considered that they may be lying about other things? They could be dark friends, for all we know, or dupes of dark friends. Perhaps not, but they are hardly to be trusted very far. I believe there is a farm, whether they really use it for a retreat or not, or I would not have agreed to this. But I will not be surprised to find a few ramshackle buildings and a dozen or so wilders. Well, not ramshackle. They do seem to have coin— but the principle is the same. No, they are simply not trustworthy. Elaine began a slow burn as soon as she realized the direction Marilella was taking, and it grew hotter. All this slipping around, all this may and could, so the woman could insinuate things she herself did not believe. Dark friends? The knitting circle had fought dark friends. Two had died. And without Sumiko and Iaina, Nynaeve might be dead instead of Ispan, a prisoner. No, the reason they were not to be trusted was not because Marilella feared they were sworn to the shadow, or she would have said so. They were not to be trusted because if they were not to be trusted, then they could not be allowed to hold Ispan. She swatted a big green fly that had settled on Lioness's neck, punctuating Marilella's last word with a loud crack and the grey sister jerked in surprise. How dare you, Elaine breathed. They faced Ispan and Phalian in the Rahad and the Golam, not to mention two dozen or more toughs with swords. You weren't there. That was hardly fair. Marililla and the rest had been left behind because Aiz Sedai in the Rahad, obvious Aiz Sedai, might as well be trumpets and drums for the attention they attracted. She did not care. Her anger grew by the moment, and her voice rose by the word. You will never suggest such a thing to me again. Never. Not without hard evidence. Not without proof. If you do, I'll set you a penance that will make your eyes pop. No matter how high she stood above the other woman, she had no authority to set her any penance at all, but she did not care about that either. I'll make you walk all the way to Tarvalon, eating nothing but bread and water the entire way. I'll put you in their charge and tell them to slap you down if you say boo to a goose. It dawned on her that she was shouting. Some sort of gray and white birds went flittering past overhead in a broad band, and she was drowning out their cries. Drawing a deep breath, she tried to calm herself. She did not have a voice for shouting. It always came out as a shriek. Everyone was looking at her, most in astonishment. Avienda nodded approvingly. Of course, she would have done the same had Elaine plunged a knife into Marililla's heart. Avienda stood beside her friends no matter what. Marililla's Kyrian in paleness had become dead white. I mean what I say, Elaine told her, in a much cooler tone. It seemed to make even more blood leave Marililla's face. She did mean every word. They could not afford that sort of rumor floating among them. One way or another she would see it done, though the knitting circle very likely would faint. She hoped that was the end of it. It should have been. 
But when Chilares left, Saritha replaced her, and she too had a reason the kinswomen were not to be trusted. Their ages. Even Kirstian claimed to be older than any living Aes Sedai, while Rihanna was over a hundred years more than that, and not even the oldest of the kin. Her title of eldest went to the oldest of them in Ebudar, and the rigid schedule they followed to avoid notice had a number of still older women off in other places. It was obviously impossible, Theresa maintained. Elaine did not shout. She very carefully did not shout. We will learn the truth eventually, she told Theresa. She did not doubt the kinswomen's word, but there had to be a reason why the kinswomen looked neither ageless nor anything near the ages they claimed. If she could only puzzle it out. Something told her it was obvious, but nothing leaped up, said what? Eventually, she added firmly when the brown opened her mouth again. That will be enough, Saritha. Saritha nodded uncertainly and fell back. Not ten minutes later, Sibella replaced her. Every time one of the kinswomen came to make her roundabout plea to be relieved of Ispan, one of the sisters came soon after to offer the same plea. All save Marililla, who still blinked whenever Elaine looked at her. Perhaps shouting did have its uses. Certainly no one else tried to be so straightforward in attacking the kin. For instance, Van Deen began with discussing the sea folk and how to counter the effects of the bargain made with them, why it was necessary to counter them as much as possible. She was quite matter-of-fact, with never a word or gesture to lay any blame. Not that she needed any. The subject did that, however delicately handled. The White Tower, she said, maintained its influence in the world not by force of arms or persuasion, or even by plotting or manipulation, though those two she brushed past lightly. Rather, the White Tower controlled or influenced events to whatever extent they did, because everyone saw the Tower as standing apart and above, as more even than kings or queens. That, in turn, depended on every Aes Sedai being seen that way, as mysterious and apart, different from everyone else. A different flesh. Historically, Aes Sedai, who could not manage that, and there were a few, were kept out of public view as much as possible. It took Elaine a little while to realize that the thrust of the conversation had shifted away from the sea folk and to see where it was headed. A different flesh, mysterious and apart, could not have a sack thrust over its head and be tied across a saddle. Not where anyone who was not Aes Sedai could see, anyway. In truth, the sisters would be rougher on Ispan than the knitting circle could possibly make themselves be, just not in public. The argument might have borne more weight had it come first, but as it was, Elaine sent Van Deen packing as quickly as she did anyone else, and saw her replaced by Adelius, right after Sibella was told that if none of the knitting circle could understand what Ispan was mumbling, then none of the sisters was likely to either. Mumbling. Light. The Aes Sedai took their repeated turns, and even knowing what they were up to, sometimes it was hard to see the connection at first. By the time Kariana began by telling her that those boulders really had been toes once, supposedly on a statue of some warrior queen nearly two hundred feet high, Ispan stays where she is, she told Kariana coolly without waiting for more. Now, unless you really want to tell me why the Shiotans thought of putting up a statue like that. The green said ancient records claimed it had worn little more than armor, and not a great deal of that. A queen. No? Then, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk with Avienda alone. Thank you so much. Even being curt did not stop them, of course. She was surprised they did not send Marililla's maid to take a turn. None of this would have happened had Nynaeve been where she was meant to be. At least Elaine was sure that Nynaeve could have quelled the knitting circle and the sisters both, in short order. She was a great one for quelling. The problem was that Nynaeve had glued herself tight to Land's side before they left the first clearing. The warders scouted ahead and to both sides of their path, and sometimes to the rear, only riding back to the column long enough to report what they had seen— or give directions on how to avoid a farm or a shed. Birgitta ranged far, never spending more than moments with Elaine. 
Lan ranged farther, and where Lan went, Nynaeve went. No one's making any trouble, are they? She demanded with a dark stare for the sea folk the first time she followed Lan back. Well, that's all right, then, she said before Elaine had a chance to open her mouth. Spinning her round-bellied mare like a racer, she flicked the reins and galloped after Lan, holding her hat on with one hand, catching up to him just as he vanished around the flank of the hill ahead. Of course, then there really was nothing to complain about. Rihanna had made her visit, and Marililla hers, and everything seemed settled. By the next time Nynaeve appeared, Elaine had suffered through a number of disguised attempts to have Ispan turned over to the sisters. Avienda had spoken to Curran, and the windfinders were on a slow boil. But when Elaine explained, Nynaeve simply looked around, frowning. Of course, right at that moment, everyone had to be where they belonged. The Alpha An Mier wore glares, true, but the knitting circle were all behind them, and as for the other sisters, no group of novices could have appeared more well-behaved and innocent. Elaine wanted to shriek. I'm sure you can handle everything, Elaine, Nynaeve said. You have had all that training to be a queen. This can't be anywhere near so crap the man he's going again. You can handle it. And off she went, galloping that poor mare as though it were a warhorse. That was when Avienda chose to discuss how Rand seemed to like kissing the sides of her neck, and incidentally how much she had liked it. Elaine had liked that when he did it to her, too, but however used to discussing this sort of thing she had become, uncomfortably used to it, she did not want to talk about it right then. She was angry with Rand. It was unfair, but if not for him, she could have told Nynaeve to stop treating Lan like a child who might trip over his own feet— and attend to her own duties. She almost wanted to blame him for the way the knitting circle was behaving, too, and the other sisters, and the windfinders. It's one of the things men are for, taking the blame, she remembered Linny saying once, and laughing while she did. They usually deserve it, even if you don't know exactly how. Not fair. Yet she wished he were there long enough for her to box his ears, just once long enough to kiss him, to have him kiss the sides of her neck softly, long enough to... He will listen to advice, even when he doesn't like hearing it, she said abruptly, her face reddening. Light, for all her talk about shame, in some areas Avienda had none, and it seemed that she herself no longer had any either. But if I tried to push him, he dug in his heels even when it was plain that I was right. Was he that way with you? Avienda glanced at her and appeared to understand. Elaine was not sure whether she liked that or not. At least there was no more talk of Rand and kissing. For a while, anyway. Avienda had some knowledge of men. She had traveled with them as a maiden of the spear, fought beside them. But she had never wanted to be anything but far Darai Smai, and there were gaps. Even with her dolls as a child, she had always played at the spears and raiding. She had never flirted, did not understand it, and she did not understand why she felt the way she did when Rand's eyes fell on her, or a hundred other things Elaine had begun learning the first time she noticed a boy looking at her differently than he did at the other boys. She expected Elaine to teach her all of it, and Elaine tried. She really could talk to Avienda about anything— if only Rand had not been the example used quite so often. If he had been there, she would have boxed his ears, and kissed him, then boxed his ears again. Not a pleasant ride at all. A miserable ride. Nynaeve made several more brief visits before finally coming to announce that the kin's farm lay just ahead, out of sight around a low, rounded hill that appeared ready to fall on its side. Rihanna had been pessimistic in her estimate. The sun had not fallen nearly two hours' worth. "'We'll be there very quickly now,' Nynaeve told Elaine, not seeming to notice the sullen stare Elaine gave in return. "'Lan, fetch Rihanna up here, please. Best if they see a familiar face right off.' He whirled his horse away, and Nynaeve turned in her saddle briefly to fix the sisters with a firm eye. "'I don't want you frightening them now.' You hold your tongues until we have a chance to explain what's what, and hide your faces. 
pull up the hoods of your cloaks. Straightening without waiting for any reply, she gave a satisfied nod. There, all settled and all right. I vow, Elaine, I don't know what you are moaning so about. Everyone's doing exactly as they should, so far as I can see. Elaine ground her teeth. She wished they were in Camelin already. That was where they were heading once this was done. She had duties long overdue in Camelin. All she had to deal with there was convincing the stronger houses that the Lion Throne was hers despite her long absence, that and handling a rival claimant or two. There might not have been any had she been there when her mother vanished, when she died, but the history of Andor said there would be by now. Somehow it seemed ever so much easier than this. Chapter 4 A Quiet Place The Kin's farm lay in a broad hollow surrounded by three low hills, a sprawling affair of more than a dozen large white plastered buildings with flat roofs, gleaming in the sun. Four great barns were built right into the slope of the highest hill, a flat-topped thing with one side that fell away in steep cliffs beyond the barns. A few tall trees that had not lost all of their leaves provided a modicum of shade in the farmyard. To the north and east, olive groves marched away and even up the sides of the hills. A sort of slow bustle enveloped the farm, with easily over a hundred people in evidence despite the afternoon heat, carrying on all the everyday tasks, but none quickly. It might almost have passed for a small village instead of a farm, except that there was not a man or a child to be seen. Elaine did not expect any. This was a waypoint for kinswomen passing through Ebu Dar to elsewhere, so there would not be too many in the city itself at one time. But that was a secret matter, as secret as the kin themselves. Publicly, this farm was known for two hundred miles or more as a retreat for women a place for contemplation and escape from the cares of the world for a time, a few days, a week, sometimes longer. Elaine could almost feel serenity in the air. She might have regretted bringing the world into this quiet place, except that she also brought new hope. The first appearance of the horses coming around the leaning hill produced far less stir than she expected. A number of the women stopped to watch, but no more than that. Their clothing varied widely. Elaine even saw a sheen of silk here and there, but some carried baskets and others buckets, or great white bundles of what had to be washed. One held a pair of bound ducks by the feet in either hand. Noblewoman and craftswoman, farmer and beggar, all were equally welcome here, but everyone did a share of the work during her stay. Avienda touched Elaine's arm, then pointed to the top of one of the hills, a thing like an inverted funnel skewed to one side. Elaine added a hand to the shade of her hat, and after a moment saw movement. Small wonder no one was surprised. Lookouts up there could see anyone coming from a long way. A middling woman walked out to meet them short of the farm buildings. Her dress was in the Ebudari style, with a deep, narrow neckline, but her dark skirts and brightly colored petticoats were short enough that she did not need to hold them up out of the dust. She did not wear a marriage knife. The kin's rules prohibited marriage. The kin had too many secrets to keep. That's Elise, Rihanna murmured, reining in between Nynaeve and Elaine. She runs the farm this turn. She's very intelligent. Almost like an afterthought, she added even more quietly, Elise does not suffer fools gladly. As Elise approached, Rihanna drew herself up in her saddle, squaring her shoulders as though for an ordeal. Middling was exactly how Elaine thought of Elise, not someone to give Rihanna pause, certainly, even had she not been the eldest of the knitting circle. Straight-backed, Elise appeared to be somewhere in her middle years, neither slender nor stout, tall nor short, a little grey, flecking dark brown hair that was tied back with a piece of ribbon but in a very practical manner. Her face was unremarkable, though pleasant enough, a mild face, perhaps a little long in the jaw. When she saw Rihanna, she gave a fleeting look of surprise, then smiled. That smile transformed everything. It did not make her beautiful or even pretty, but Elaine felt warmed by it, comforted. I hardly expected to see you, 
Rihanna, Elise said, barely hesitating over the name. Obviously, she was unsure whether to use Rihanna's rightful title in front of Nynaeve and Elaine and Avienda. She studied them with quick glances as she spoke. There seemed to be a bit of tarabon in her voice. Barrowin brought word of trouble in the city, of course, but I didn't think it was so bad he would have to leave. Who are all these? Her words trailed off and her eyes widened, staring beyond them. Elaine glanced back, nearly loosing a few of the choice phrases she had picked up in various places, most recently from Matt Cawthon. She did not understand all of them, not most of them, really. Nobody ever wanted to explain what they meant exactly, but they did have a way of relieving emotion. The warders had doffed their color-shifting cloaks, and the sisters had drawn up the hoods of their dust cloaks as instructed, even Saritha, who had no need to hide her youthful face but Kariana had not pulled hers forward far enough. It simply framed her ageless features. Not everyone would know what they were seeing, yet anyone who had been in the tower surely would. Kariana jerked the hood forward at Elaine's glare, but the damage was done. Others at the farm beside Elise possessed sharp eyes. I said I, a woman howled, in tones suitable for announcing the end of the world. Perhaps she was, for her world. Shrieks spread like dust blown on the wind, and that quickly the farm became a kicked anthill. Here and there a woman simply fainted dead away, but most ran wildly, screaming, dropping what they carried, bumping into one another, falling down and scrambling up to run on. Flapping ducks and chickens and short-horned black goats darted wildly to avoid being trampled. In the midst of it all, some women stood gaping, plainly those who had come to the retreat with no knowledge of the kin, though a few of them began to move hurriedly, too, caught up in the frenzy. Light! Nynaeve barked, yanking her braid. Some of them are running into the olive groves. Stop them! The last thing we want is a panic. Send the warders. Quick! Quick! Lan raised a questioning eyebrow, but she waved a peremptory hand at him. Quick! Before they all run away! With a nod that seemed to begin as a shake of his head, he sent Mandarb galloping after the other men, curving to avoid the spreading pandemonium among the buildings. Elaine shrugged at Brigitta, then motioned her to follow. She agreed with Lan. It seemed a bit late to try stopping a panic, and warders on horseback attempting to herd frightened women probably was not the best way, but she could not see how to change matters now, and there was no point letting them run off into the countryside. They would all want to hear the news she and Nynaeve brought. Alice gave no sign of running or even fidgeting. Her face paled slightly, but she stared up at Rihanna with a steady gaze, a firm gaze. Why, she breathed. Why, Rihanna? I could not have imagined you doing this. Did they give you bribes? Offer immunity? Will they let you walk free while we pay the price? They probably won't allow it but I vow I'll ask them to let me call you down. Yes, you! The rules apply even to you, eldest. If I can find a way to manage it, I vow you won't walk away from this smiling. A very firm gaze. Steely, in fact. It isn't what you think, Rihanna said hurriedly, dismounting and dropping her reins. She caught both of Elise's hands in hers, despite the other woman's efforts to free them. Oh, I did not want it to be like this. They know, Elise. About the kin. The tower has always known. Everything. Almost everything. But that isn't what is important. Elise's eyebrows tried to climb onto her scalp at that, but Rihanna rushed on, beaming eagerly from under her large straw hat. We can go back, Elise. We can try again. They said we can. The farm buildings seemed to be emptying as well, women rushing out to learn what the commotion was, then joining the flight without a pause for more than hiking skirts. Shouts from the olive groves said the warders were at work, but not how much they were achieving. Perhaps not a great deal. Elaine sensed growing frustration from Brigitta and irritation. Rihanna eyed the turmoil and sighed. We must gather them in, Elise. We can go back. That's all very well for you and some of the others, Elise said doubtfully. If it's true, what about the rest of us? The tower would not have let me stay as long as I did had I been quicker to learn. 
She darted a frown at the now well-hooded sisters, and the stare she returned to Rihanna held no little anger. What would we go back for? To be told again we aren't strong enough and be sent on our way? Or will they just keep us as novices the rest of our lives? Some might accept that, but I won't. What for, Rihanna? What for? Nynaeve climbed down, tugging her mare forward at the end of her reins, and Elaine imitated her, though leading Linus more easily. To be part of the tower, if that's what you wish, Nynaeve said impatiently before even reaching the two kinswomen. Maybe to be Aes Sedai. Myself, I don't know why you have to be a certain strength if you can pass the fool tests. Or don't go back. Run away, for all I care. Once I'm done here, anyway. Planting her feet, she pulled off her hat and planted her fists on her hips. This is wasting time, Rihanna, and we have work to do. Are you sure there's anybody here we can use? Speak up. If you're not sure, then we might as well get on with it. The hurry might be out of the way, but now we have the thing, I'd as soon it was over and done with. When she and Elaine were introduced as Aes Sedai, the Aes Sedai who had given the promises, Elise made a choked sound and began smoothing her woolen skirts as though her hands wanted to latch onto Rihanna's throat. Her mouth opened angrily, then snapped shut without a sound when Marililla joined them. That stern gaze did not fade completely, but it became mixed with a touch of wonder, and more than a touch of weariness. Nynaeve said I, Marililla said calmly, the Atha'anir are impatient to be off their horses. I think some may ask for healing. A brief smile flickered across her lips. That settled that question, though Nynaeve grumbled extravagantly about what she was going to do to the next person who doubted her. Elaine might have said a few choice words herself, but the truth was Nynaeve looked more than a little silly carrying on that way, with Merlilla and Rihanna both waiting attentively for her to finish, and Elise staring at all three. That settled it. Or perhaps it was the windfinders, afoot and pulling their horses behind them. Every shred of grace had vanished during the ride, worn away by hard saddles. Their legs seemed as stiff as their faces, yet no one could mistake them for anything but who they were. If there are twenty sea folk this far from the sea, Elise muttered, I'll believe anything. Nynaeve snorted but said nothing, for which Elaine was grateful. The woman seemed to be having a hard enough time accepting, even with Marilella naming them Aes Sedai. Neither tirade nor tantrum would help. Then heal them, Nynaeve told Marilella. Their eyes went to the hobbling women together, and Nynaeve added, If they ask, politely. Marilella smiled again, but Nynaeve had already abandoned the sea folk and gone back to frowning at the now all but empty farm. A few goats still trotted around the farmyard littered with dropped wash and rakes and brooms, spilled buckets and baskets, not to mention the crumpled forms of kinswomen who had fainted, and a handful of chickens had gone back to scratching and pecking. But the only conscious women still in sight among the farm buildings were plainly not of the kin. Some wore embroidered linen or silk, and some rough country woolens, yet the fact that they had not run spoke that much of them. Rihanna said that at any given time as many as half those at the farm might fall into that group. Most appeared stunned. Despite her grumbling, Nynaeve wasted no time taking charge of Elise. Or perhaps Elise took charge of Nynaeve. It was difficult to tell, since the kinswoman showed little of the deference toward Aes Sedai that the knitting circle did. Perhaps she was still just too numbed by the sudden turn of events. In any case, they moved off together— Nynaeve leading her mare and gesturing with the hat in her other hand, instructing Elise on how to bring in the scattered women and what to do with them once they were collected. Rihanna had been sure that at least one woman strong enough to join the circle was there, Garinia Rosowinde, and possibly two more. In truth, Elaine was hoping they had all gone. Elise alternated between nodding and giving Nynaeve very level looks that Nynaeve seemed not to notice. Now, in the wait while the gathering was done, seemed a good time to do a bit more searching through the panniers, but when Elaine turned toward the pack horses, which were just beginning to be led toward the farm buildings, she noticed the knitting circle, Rihanna and the whole lot of them, 
making their own way into the farm on foot, some hurrying toward women lying on the ground, others toward those standing about gaping. The whole lot of them, and no sign of Ispan. It took only a glance to find her, though. Between Adelius and Van Deen, each holding an arm as they half dragged her along, their dust cloaks streaming behind. The white haired sisters were linked, the glow of Sidar somehow encompassing them both without including Ispan. There was no way to tell which led the small circle and held the shield on the dark friend, but not even one of the forsaken could have broken it. They stopped to speak to a stout woman in plain brown wool who gaped at the leather sack covering Ispan's head but still curtsied and pointed toward one of the white-plastered buildings. Elaine exchanged angry glances with Avienda. Well, hers was angry, anyway. Sometimes Avienda gave away no more than a stone. Handing their horses over to two of the palace stablemen, they hurried after the three. Some of the women who were not of the kin tried to question them about what was happening, a few in rather overbearing fashion, but Elaine gave them short shrift, leaving behind a wake of indignant sniffs and snorts. Oh, what she would not give to have the ageless face already! That tweaked a thread in the back of her thoughts, but it vanished as soon as she tried to examine it. When she pushed open the plain wooden door where the trio had vanished, Adelius and Van Deen had Ispan seated in a ladder-back chair with her head bare, the sack lying atop a narrow trestle table with their linen cloaks. The room possessed only one window, set in the ceiling, but with the sun still high, it let in a good light. Shelves lined the walls, stacked with large copper pots and big white bowls. By the smell of bread baking, the only other door led into a kitchen. Van Deen looked around sharply at the sound of the door, but seeing them she smoothed her face to a total lack of expression. Sumiko said the herbs Nynaeve gave her were wearing off, she said, and it seemed best to question her a little before fuzzing her brain again. We do seem to have time now. It would be good to know what the... the black Aja, her mouth twisted in distaste, was up to in Ebudar, and what they know. I doubt they are aware of this farm, since we were not, Adelius said tapping a finger thoughtfully on her lips as she studied the woman in the chair. But it is better to be sure than to weep later, as our father used to say. She might have been examining an animal she had never seen before, a creature she could not fathom existing. Ispan's lip curled. Sweat rolled down her bruised face, and her dark beaded braids were disheveled, and her clothing all disarrayed. But despite bleary eyes, she was not nearly so woozy as she had been. The black Aja, it is a fable and a filthy one, she sneered, a trifle hoarsely. It must have been very hot inside that leather sack, and she had had no water since leaving the Tarasin Palace. Me, I am surprised that you will give it voice, and to cast the charge on me. What I have done, I have done on the orders of the Armorlin seat. Elida? Elaine spat incredulously. You have the nerve to claim that Elida ordered you to murder sisters and steal from the tower? Elida ordered what you did in Tyr and Tanchico? Or do you mean Swan? Your lies are pathetic. You've forsaken the three oaths somehow, and that names you Black Aja. I do not have to answer the questions from you, Ispan said sullenly, hunching her shoulders. You are rebels against the lawful Amerlin seat. You will be punished, perhaps stilled, especially if you harm me. I serve the true Amerlin seat, and you will be punished severely if you harm me. You will answer any questions my near sister asks. Avienda tested her belt knife on a thumbnail, but her eyes were on Ispan's. Wetlanders feel pain. They do not know how to embrace it, accept it. You will answer as you are asked. She did not glare or snarl. She just spoke, but Ispan shrank back in the chair. I fear that is prescribed, even were she not an initiate of the tower, Adelius said. We are forbidden to shed blood in questioning, or to allow others to do so in our name. She sounded reluctant, 
though whether over the prohibition or over admitting that Ispan was an initiate, Elaine could not say. She herself had not really considered that Ispan might still be considered one. There was a saying that no woman was finished with the tower until it was finished with her, but truthfully, once the white tower touched you, it never was finished. Her brow furrowed as she studied the black sister, so bedraggled and still so sure of herself. Ispan sat up a little straighter and darted glances full of amused contempt at Avienda and Elaine. She had not been so poised earlier when she thought it was Nynaeve and Elaine alone who had her. Regained composure had come with remembering that there were older sisters present, sisters who would hold White Tower law as part of themselves. That law forbade not only shedding blood, but breaking bones and a number of other things that any white cloak questioner would be more than ready to do. Before any session began, healing had to be given, and if the questioning started after sunrise, it had to end before sundown. If after sunset, then before sunrise. The law was even more restrictive when it came to initiates of the tower, the sisters and accepted and novices, banning the use of sidar in questioning, punishment, or penance. Oh, a sister might flick a novice's ear with the power if she was exasperated, or even give her a swat on the bottom, but not very much more. Ispan smiled at her. Smiled? Elaine took a deep breath. Adelius, Van Deen, I want you to leave Avienda and me alone with Ispan. Her stomach tried to tie itself into a knot. There had to be a way to press the woman sufficiently to learn what was needed without breaking tower law. But how? People who were to be questioned by the tower usually began talking before a finger was laid on them. Everyone knew that no one held out against the tower. No one. But they were very seldom initiates. She could hear another voice, not Lini's this time, but her mother's. What you order done, you must be willing to do with your own hand. As a queen, what you order done, you have done. If she did break the law, her mother's voice again, even a queen cannot be above the law, or there is no law. And Linny's, you can do whatever you wish, child, so long as you're willing to pay the price. She dragged her hat off without untying the ribbons. Keeping her voice steady took an effort. When we are... When we are done talking with her, you can take her back to the knitting circle. Afterward, she would submit herself to Marililla. Any five sisters could sit in judgment to set a penance, if they were asked. Ispan's head swung, swollen eyes going from Elaine to Avienda and back, slowly widening until the whites showed all the way around. She was not so sure of herself now. Silent glances passed between Van Deen and Adelius, in the manner of people who had spent so much time together they hardly needed to speak aloud any longer. Then Van Deen took Elaine and Avienda each by an arm. "'If I may speak with you outside a moment,' she murmured. It sounded a suggestion, but she was already urging them to the door. Outside in the farmyard perhaps two dozen or so kinswomen were huddled together like sheep. Not all wore Ebudari clothes, but two had the red belts of wise women, and Elaine recognized Berowin, a stout little woman who normally showed a pride far greater than her strength in the power. Not now. Like the rest, her face was frightened, her eyes darting, despite the entire knitting circle surrounding them and talking urgently. Down the way, Nynaeve and Elise were trying to herd perhaps twice as many women inside one of the larger buildings. Trying did seem to be the word. "'Don't care what estates you hold!' Nynaeve was shouting at a proud-necked woman in pale green silk. "'You get in there and stay in there out of the way, or I'll kick you inside!' Elise simply seized the green-clad woman by the scruff of the neck and ran her through the doorway despite voluble and heated protests. There was a loud squawk like a huge goose being stepped on. Then Elise reappeared, dusting her hands. The others seemed to give no trouble after that. Van Deen released them, studying their eyes. The glow still enveloped her, yet Adelius must have been focusing their combined flows. 
Van Deen could have maintained the shield, once woven, without being able to see it, but had she been the one, it was much likelier that Adelius would have brought them out. Van Deen could have gone several hundred paces before the link began to attenuate. It would not break if she and Adelius went to opposite corners of the earth, though it would have been useless long before that. But she remained close to the door. She seemed to sort words in her head. I've always thought it best if women with experience handle this sort of thing, she said finally. The young can easily be caught up in hot blood. Then they do too much. Or sometimes they realize they can't bring themselves to do enough, because they haven't really seen enough yet. Or worst of all, they find a taste for it. Not that I believe either of you has that flaw. She gave Avienda a weighing glance without pausing. Avienda hastily sheathed her belt knife. Adelius and I have seen enough to know why we must do what must be done, and we left hot blood behind long ago. Perhaps you will leave this to us. Much better that way, all around. Van Deen seemed to take the recommendation as accepted. She nodded and turned back toward the door. No sooner had she disappeared behind it than Elaine felt the use of the power within— a weave that must have blanketed the room inside, a ward against eavesdropping, certainly. They would not want stray ears to catch whatever Ispan said. Then another use hit her, and suddenly the silence from within was more ominous than any shrieks that ward would contain. She crushed her hat back onto her head. The heat she could not feel, but the sun's glare suddenly made her queasy. Maybe you'll help me look over what the pack horses are carrying, she said breathily. She had not ordered it done, whatever it was, but that did not seem to change anything. Avienda nodded with surprising quickness. She seemed to want to be away from that silence, too. The windfinders were waiting not far from where the servants had the pack animals, waiting impatiently and staring about imperiously, arms folded beneath their breasts, copying Renaila. Elise marched up to them, marking Renaila out as the leader after one sweeping glance. Elaine and Avienda she ignored. Come with me, she said in brisk tones that brooked no argument. The Aes Sedai say you will want to be out of the sun until matters are more settled. The words Aes Sedai held as much bitterness as they did the awe Elaine was used to from kinswomen. Maybe more. Renaila stiffened, her dark face growing darker, but Elise ploughed on. You wilders can sit out here and sweat if that's what you want for all of me. If you can sit. It was obvious none of the Athan Mier had received healing for their saddle soreness. They stood like women who wanted to forget they existed below the waist. What you will not do is keep me waiting. Do you know who I am? Renaila demanded in a tight fury but Elise was already walking away and not looking back. Struggling with herself visibly, Renaila dashed sweat from her forehead with the back of her hand, then angrily ordered the other windfinders to leave the shore-cursed horses and follow her. They made a spraddle-legged line wobbling along after Elise, everyone but the two apprentices muttering to herself, Elise included. Instinctively, Elaine began to plan how to smooth matters over, how to get the Atha'an Mier's pains healed without them having to ask, or a sister having to offer too strenuously. Nynaeve had to be appeased, too, and the other sisters. To her surprise, she suddenly realized that for once in her life she had no real desire to smooth anything. Watching the windfinders limp toward one of the farm buildings, she decided that matters were fine just as they were. Avienda wore a large open grin as she watched the Afaan Mier. Elaine snatched the much smaller smile from her own face and turned to the pack horses. They did deserve it, though. Not grinning was very hard. With Avienda's help, the searching went more quickly than before, though Avienda did not recognize what they were after as quickly as she did. Not a great surprise. A few of the sisters Elaine had trained showed a greater skill in this than she did herself, but most came nowhere near. 
Still, two sets of hands found more than one, and there was a great deal to be found. Liveried stablemen and women carried away the rubbish, while a collection of Turangrial grew on the broad stone lid of a square cistern. Four more horses were unloaded quickly, and they accumulated a selection that would have caused a celebration brought into the tower, even with no one studying Turangrial. They took every form imaginable, cups and bowls and vases, no two the same size or design or in the same material. A flat, worm-eaten box, half falling apart, and whatever had lined it long since gone to dust, held pieces of jewelry. A necklace and bracelets set with colored stones, a slim gem-studded belt, several finger rings, and there were spaces for more. Every single one was a Turangrial, and they all matched, meant to be worn together, though Elaine could not imagine why any woman would want to carry so many about her at one time. Avienda found a dagger with gold wire wrapped around the hilt of rough deer horn. The blade was dull, and by all evidence always had been. She kept turning that over and over in her fingers. Her hands actually began to tremble, until Elaine took it away from her and put it with the others on the cistern's lid. Even then, Avienda stood for a time, looking at it and licking her lips as though they had gone dry. There were finger rings, earrings, necklaces, bracelets, and buckles, many of very peculiar pattern indeed. There were statuettes and figures of birds and animals and people, several knives that did have edges, half a dozen large medallions in bronze or steel. Most worked with strange patterns, and not one carrying an image Elaine could really understand. A pair of peculiar hats, seemingly made of metal, too ornate and too thin to be helmets, and any number of items she could not think what to call. A rod as thick as her wrist, bright red and smooth and rounded, firm rather than hard, for all that it seemed to be stone. It did not warm slightly in her hand, it almost felt hot. Not real heat any more than the warmth was real, but still. What about a set of metal basketwork balls, one inside the other? Any movement produced a faint musical chime, a different tone every time, and she had the feeling that no matter how hard she looked into it, there would always be a still smaller ball waiting to be discovered. A thing that looked like a blacksmith's puzzle made of glass? It was heavy enough that she dropped it, and it broke a chip off the edge of the cistern cover. A collection to stir amazement in any eyes, said I. More important, they found two more Angreal, those Elaine set very carefully aside within arm's reach. One was an odd piece of jewelry, a golden bracelet attached by four flat chains to finger rings, every bit of it engraved in an intricate maze-like pattern. That was the stronger of the two, stronger than the turtle still in her pouch. It was made for a smaller hand than hers or Avienda's. Strangely, the bracelet had a tiny lock, complete with a minuscule tubular key dangling from a fine chain that was obviously made to be removed, along with the key. The other was a seated woman in age-darkened ivory, her legs folded in front of her, her exposed knees bare, but with hair so long and luxuriant she could not have been more muffled in the heaviest cloak. It was not even as strong as the turtle, but she found it very appealing. One hand rested on a knee, palm up and fingers arranged so the thumb touched the tips of the middle two fingers, while the other hand was lifted, the first two fingers raised and the others folded. The whole figure carried an air of supreme dignity, yet the delicately worked face showed amusement and delight. Maybe it had been made for a particular woman. It seemed personal somehow. Perhaps they had done that in the age of legends. Some Turangrial were immense, needing men and horses or even the power to move. But most Angrial were small enough to carry about your person. Not all, but most. They were tossing back the canvas covers on another set of wicker panniers when Nynaeve came striding up. The Asaan Mier began filing out of one of the farm buildings, no longer limping. Marililla was talking with Ranila, or rather the windfinder was talking and Marililla listening. Elaine wondered what had happened in there. The slim gray did not look so satisfied any more. The huddle of kinswomen had grown larger, but even as Elaine looked up, 
Three more came hesitantly into the farmyard, and another two stood at the edge of the olive trees, peering about indecisively. She could sense Brigitta somewhere out among the groves, and only a little less irritated than earlier. Nynaeve glanced at the display of Terangrial and gave her braid a tug. Her hat had gone missing somewhere. That can wait, she said, sounding disgusted. It's time. Chapter 5 The Breaking Storm The sun stood little more than halfway down toward the horizon by the time they clambered up the well-worn, snaking path to the top of the steep-sided hill above the barns. That was the spot Renyla had chosen. It did make sense from what Elaine knew of working weather, all learned from a seafolk windfinder, to be sure. Changing anything beyond your immediate vicinity required working over long distances, which meant being able to see a long distance, much easier on the ocean than on land, except from a mountain or hilltop. It also needed a deft hand to avoid causing torrential rains or whirlwinds, or the light alone knew what elsewhere. Whatever you did, the effects spread like ripples from a stone tossed into a pond. She had no desire whatsoever to lead the circle that would use the bowl. The top of the hill was clear of brush and flat, if far from level, a rough stone table, fifty paces long and broad, with plenty of room for everybody who needed to be there and some who did not, strictly speaking. From at least fifty paces above the farm, the spectacular view stretched for miles over a patchwork quilt of farms and pastures, forests and olive groves. Far too many browns and sear yellows were mixed in with a hundred shades of green, crying the need for what they were to do, yet even so the beauty of it struck Elaine. Despite dust in the air like a faint mist, she could see so far. The land really was quite flat here, except for those few hills. Ebu Dar lay just out of sight to the south, even if she embraced the power, yet it seemed she should be able to see it, by straining just a little. Surely with a little effort she could see the river Eldar. A marvelous view. Not everyone was interested. An hour wasted, Nynaeve grumbled, glaring sideways at Rihanna, and at just about everyone else. With Lan not there, it seemed she might take the opportunity to unleash her temper. Almost an hour. Maybe more. Completely wasted. Elise is capable enough, I suppose, but you'd think Rihanna would know who was there. Light. If that fool woman faints on me again. Elaine hoped she held on a little longer. It looked to be quite a storm once she let it break. Rihanna tried to keep a cheerful, eager face, Yet her hands were never still on her skirts, constantly plucking and smoothing. Kirstian simply clutched hers and sweated, appearing ready to empty her stomach any minute. When anyone looked at her, anyone at all, she shivered. The third kinswoman, Garinia, was a Saldean merchant with a strong nose and a wide mouth, a short, slim-hipped woman, stronger than the other two, who looked not that much older than Nynaeve. A greasy dampness glistened on her pale face, and her dark eyes grew wider whenever they fell on an eyes to die. Elaine thought she might soon discover whether someone's eyes actually could pop out of her head. At least Garinia had stopped moaning, which she had done all the way up the hill. There really had been another pair who might have been strong enough, possibly. The kin did not pay much attention to that, but the last had gone on her way three days past— no one else at the farm even came close, which was why Nynaeve was still disgusted. One reason. The other was that Garinia had been one of the very first found passed out in the farmyard. For that matter, she fainted again the first two times she was roused, as soon as her eyes fell on one of the sisters. Of course, Nynaeve being Nynaeve, she was not about to admit that she should have done anything so simple as ask Elise who was still at the farm or even tell Elise what she was looking for before the woman inquired. Nynaeve never expected anyone to have sense to know up from down, except herself. We could be done by now, Nynaeve growled. We could be shut of— She almost quivered with the effort of not scowling at the sea folk as they gathered near the east end of the stone table. Renyla, gesturing emphatically, appeared to be giving instructions. 
Elaine would have given a pretty to hear those. Nynaeve's glares certainly took in Marilla and Cariana and Sarissa, who still clutched the silk-wrapped bowl tightly. Adelius and Van Deen had remained below, sequestered with Ispan. The three sisters stood chatting together, not paying any mind to Nynaeve unless she spoke to them directly, but Marilla's gaze sometimes slipped to the windfinders, then jerked away. Her mask of serenity faltered slightly, and she licked her lips with the tip of her tongue. Had she made some mistake down below while healing them? Marilla had negotiated treaties and mediated disputes between nations. Few in the White Tower were better than she. But Elaine remembered hearing a story once, a joke of sorts, about a Damani merchant, a sea folk cargo master, and an Aes Sedai. Not many people told jokes involving Aes Sedai. Telling one might not be entirely safe. The merchant and the cargo master found an ordinary rock on the shore and proceeded to sell it back and forth between them, somehow making a profit each time. Then an Aes Sedai came along. The Domani convinced the Aes Sedai to buy the simple stone for twice what she herself had last paid, after which the Afa Amnier convinced the Aes Sedai to buy the same rock from him for twice that again. Only a joke, but it showed what people believed. Maybe the older sisters would not have done any better bargaining with the sea folk. Avienda strode straight to the edge of the cliffs as soon as she reached the hilltop and stood staring north, motionless as a statue. After a moment, Elaine realized that she was not admiring the view. Avienda was simply staring. Gathering her skirts a bit awkwardly with the three Angrial in her hand, she joined her friend. The cliff fell in fifty-foot steps to olive groves, steep swaths of ridged gray stone, bare except for a few small, dying bushes. The drop was not really bothersome, but it was hardly the same as looking at the ground from the top of a tree, either. Strangely, looking down made Elaine feel a trifle dizzy. Avienda did not seem to notice that the edge was right at her toes. "'Is something troubling you?' Elaine asked quietly. Avienda kept her gaze on the distance. "'I have failed you,' she said finally. Her voice was flat, empty. "'I cannot form the gateway properly, and all saw me shame you. I thought a servant was one of the shadow wrought, and behaved worse than foolishly. The Afa Anmier ignore me and glare at the Aes Sedai as if I am an Aes Sedai dog yapping at their command.' I pretended I could make the Shadow Runner talk for you, but no far Darai Smai is allowed to question prisoners until she has been wed to the spear for twenty years, or even to watch until she has carried it ten. I am weak and soft, Elaine. I cannot bear to shame you further. If I fail you again, I will die. Elaine's mouth went dry. That sounded too close to a promise. Gripping Avienda's arm firmly, she drew her back from the edge. Aiel could be almost as peculiar as the sea folk thought they were. She did not really think Avienda would jump off. Not really, but she was not about to take any chances. At least the other woman did not try to resist. Everyone else seemed to be engrossed in themselves or in each other. Nynaeve had begun speaking to the Atha Anmier, both hands tight on her braid and her face almost as dark as theirs from the strain of not shouting while they listened with contemptuous arrogance. Marilla and Saritha still guarded the bowl, but Cariana was attempting to talk with the kinswoman without much success. Rihanna answered, if blinking uneasily and licking her lips, but Christian stood trembling and silent while Garinia's eyes were squeezed shut. Elaine kept her voice low anyway. This was none of their business. You haven't failed anyone, least of all me, Avienda. Nothing you've done has ever shamed me, and nothing you do ever could. Avienda blinked at her doubtfully. And you're about as weak and soft as a stone. That had to be the oddest compliment she had ever paid anyone, yet Avienda actually looked gratified. I'll bet the sea folk are scared silly of you, too. Another strange one. It made Avienda smile, if only faintly. 
Elaine drew a breath. As for Ispan, she did not like even thinking about this. I thought I could do what was necessary, too, but just letting my mind dwell on it makes my hands sweat and my stomach royal. I'd throw up if I even tried. So we share that. Avienda made the maiden hand-talk sign for You Startle Me. She had started teaching some of them to Elaine, though she said it was forbidden. Apparently being near sisters who were learning to be more changed that, except that it did not, really. Avienda seemed to think her explanation had been perfectly clear. I did not mean I could not, she said aloud, only that I do not know how. Likely I would have killed her, trying. Suddenly she smiled, much wider and warmer than before, and lightly touched Elaine's cheek. We both have weakness in us, she whispered. But it brings no shame, so long as only we two know. Yes, Elaine said weakly. She just did not know how. Of course it doesn't. This woman contained more surprises than any glee man. Here, she said, pressing the woman wrapped in her hair into Avienda's hand. Use this in the circle. Letting the Angreal go was not easy. She had intended to use it herself, but smiles or no smiles, her friend's spirits, her near sister's spirits, needed raising. Avienda turned the small ivory figure over in her hands. Elaine could almost see her trying to decide how to give it back. Avienda, you know how it feels when you hold as much of Sidar as you can? Think of holding almost twice as much. Really think of it. I want you to use it. Please? Perhaps Aiel did not show a great deal on their faces, but Avienda's green eyes widened. They had discussed Angrial, considering their search, but she probably never had thought what it would be like to use one before this. Twice as much, she murmured, to hold all that. I can barely make myself imagine. This is a very great gift, Elaine. She touched Elaine's cheek again, pressing her fingertips. That was the Aiel equivalent of a kiss and a hug. Whatever Nynaeve had to say to the sea folk, it did not take long. She stalked away from them, twitching at her skirts furiously. Approaching Elaine, she frowned equally at Avienda and at the edge of the cliff. Usually she denied her poor head for heights, but she kept them between herself and the drop. I have to talk to you, she muttered, guiding Elaine a little distance along the hilltop, and farther from the edge. A little way, but far enough from anyone to avoid being overheard. She drew several deep breaths before beginning in a low voice, and she did not look at Elaine. I... I've been behaving like a fool. It's that bloody man's fault. When he's not right in front of me, I can hardly think of anything else, and when he is, I can hardly think at all. You... you have to tell me when I... when I'm acting the fool. I depend on you, Elaine. Her voice stayed low, but her tone became almost a wail. I can't afford to lose my wits in a man. Not now. Elaine was so shocked, she could not speak for a moment. Nynaeve, admitting she had been a fool? She almost looked to see whether the sun had turned green. It isn't Lan's fault, and you know it, Nynaeve, she said at last. She pushed away memories of her own recent thoughts about Rand. This was not the same, and the opportunity was a gift of the light. Tomorrow Nynaeve would likely try to box her ears if she said Nynaeve was being foolish. Take hold of yourself, Nynaeve. Stop behaving like a giddy girl. Definitely not thoughts of Rand. She had not been mooning over him that badly. You're an Aes Sedai, and you are supposed to be leading us. Lead and think. Folding her hands at her waist, Nynaeve actually hung her head. I'll try, she mumbled. I will. Truly. You don't know what it's like, though. I... I'm sorry. Elaine nearly swallowed her tongue. Nynaeve, apologizing on top of the other? Nynaeve, abashed? Maybe she was ill. It did not last, of course. Abruptly frowning at the Angreal, Nynaeve cleared her throat. You gave one to Avienda, did you? she said briskly. 
Well, I suppose she's all right. A pity we have to let the sea folk use one. I'll wager they try to hang on to it. Well, just let them try. Which one is mine? With a sigh, Elaine handed her the bracelet and rings, and she stalked away, fumbling the piece of jewelry onto her left hand and calling loudly for everyone to take their places. Sometimes it was difficult to tell Nynaeve leading from Nynaeve bullying, as long as she did lead, though. The bowl of the wind sat atop its unfolded white wrappings in the center of the hilltop, a shallow, heavy disk of clear crystal two feet across, worked inside with thick, swirling clouds. An ornate piece, yet simple when you thought of what it could do, what they hoped it could do. Nynaeve took up her place nearby, the Angreal finally clicking shut on her wrist. She worked her hand, looking surprised that the chains did not seem to inconvenience her. It fit as if made for her hand. The three kinswomen were already there, Kirstian and Garinia huddling at Rihanna's back and appearing more frightened than ever, if that was possible. The windfinders still stood arrayed behind Renaila, almost twenty paces away. Lifting her divided skirts, Elaine met Avienda at the bowl and eyed the sea folk suspiciously. Did they intend to create a fuss? She had been afraid of exactly that from the first mention of women at the farm who might be strong enough to join the link. The Atha An Mier were sticklers for rank enough to shame the White Tower, and Garinia's presence meant that Renaila Din Callan Bluestar, windfinder to the mistress of the ships to the Atha An Mier, would not be part of the circle. Should not be. Renaila frowned searchingly at the women around the bowl. She seemed to be weighing them, judging their capabilities. Talan Din Gellan, she barked suddenly. Take your station. It was like a whip crack. Even Nynaeve jumped. Talan bowed low, touching her heart, then ran to the bowl. As soon as she moved, Renaila barked again. Matara din Junala, take your station. Matara, plump yet solid, sped on Talan's heels. Neither apprentice was old enough to have earned what the sea folk called a salt name. Once begun, Renaila rattled off names quickly, sending Rainin and two other windfinders, all of whom moved quickly, yet not so fast as the apprentices. By the number of their medallions, Nyma and Risael were higher in rank than Rainin, dignified women with a quiet air of command, but markedly weaker. Then Renaila paused, only for a heartbeat, yet in that rapid listing it stood out. To Brela Din Gelen Southwind, take your station. Kyra Din Gelen Running Wave, assume the command. Elaine felt a moment of relief that Renaila had not named herself, but it lasted about as long as Renaila's pause had. Tabrela and Kyra exchanged one look, Tabrela grim and Kyra smug, before moving to the bowl. Eight earrings and a multitude of overlapping medallions marked each windfinder to a clan wave mistress. Only Renaila stood above them. Only Dorilla among the sea folk on the hilltop was their equal. In brocaded yellow silks, Kyra was slightly the taller, Tabrela in brocaded green somewhat sterner of face, both more than handsome women, and it did not take their names to know them blood sisters. They had the same big, almost black eyes, the same straight nose, the same strong chin. Kyra silently pointed to a spot at her right side. Tabrela did not speak either, nor did she hesitate in standing where her sister pointed, but her face was stone. With her, a circle of thirteen women surrounded the bowl nearly shoulder to shoulder. Kyra's eyes almost sparkled. Tabrela's were leaden. Elaine was reminded of another of Lini's sayings, No knife is sharper than a sister's hate. Kyra glared around the circle of women surrounding the bowl, not yet truly a circle, as though trying to fix each face in her mind, or maybe to fix her scowl in theirs. Remembering herself, Elaine hurriedly passed the last Angreal, the small amber turtle, to Talan, and started to explain how it was used. The explanation was simple, yet anyone who tried without knowing how could fumble for hours. 
she was not given the chance for five words. Silence! Kyra roared. Tattooed fists on her hips and bare feet apart, she belonged on the deck of a ship going into battle. There will be no talking on station without my permission. Talan, report yourself immediately on returning to your ship. Nothing in Kyra's tone suggested that she was speaking to her own daughter. Talan bowed deeply, touching her heart, and murmured something inaudible. Kyra snorted contemptuously and gave Elaine a glare that suggested a wish that she could order her to report herself to someone as well, before going on in a voice that might have been heard at the base of the hill. Today we shall do what has not been done since the breaking of the world, when our ancestors fought wind and wave gone mad. By the bowl of the winds and the mercy of the light they survived. Today we will use the bowl of the winds lost to us for more than two thousand years and now returned. I have studied the ancient lore, studied the records of the days when our foremothers first learned the sea and the weaving of the winds, and the salt entered our blood. What is known of the bowl of the winds, I know, more than anyone else. Her eyes cut toward her sister, a satisfied glance that Tabrela did not acknowledge, which seemed to satisfy Kyra even more. What the eyes to die cannot do? I will do today, if it pleases the light. I expect every woman to stand her station to the last. I will not accept failure. The rest of the Atha Amnier seemed to accept that speech as expected and proper, but the kinswomen gaped at Kyra in astonishment. In Elaine's opinion, grandiose did not begin to describe it. Plainly, Kyra fully expected that the light would be pleased, and she would be most displeased if it was not. Nynaeve rolled her eyes to the heavens and opened her mouth. Kyra forestalled her. Nynaeve, the windfinder announced loudly, you will now demonstrate your skill at linking. Be about it, woman, and quickly. In response, Nynaeve shut her eyes tight. Her lips writhed. She looked about to burst a blood vessel. I assume that means I have permission to speak, she murmured. Fortunately, too low to be heard by Kyra on the far side of the circle. Opening her eyes, she put on a smile that was quite horrible when added to the rest of her expression. She was a sour stomach and several other complaints rolled into one. The first thing is to embrace the true source, Kyra. The light of Sidar suddenly shone bright around Nynaeve. She was using the Angreal on her hand already by what Elaine could feel. I assume you know how to do that, of course. Ignoring the abrupt tightening of Kyra's mouth, Nynaeve went on. Elaine will now assist me in the demonstration, if we have your permission. I prepare myself to embrace the source, Elaine put in quickly, before Kyra could erupt. But I don't actually embrace it. She opened herself, and the windfinders leaned forward, peering at her, though there really was nothing to see yet. Even Kirstian and Garinia forgot their fear enough to show interest. While I'm at this point, the rest is up to Nynaeve. Now I will reach out to her, Nynaeve paused, looking at Talan. Elaine had not had a chance to tell her anything, really. It's much the same as with an Angreal, Nynaeve said, addressing the slender apprentice. Kyra growled, and Talan tried to watch Nynaeve with her head down. You open yourself to the source through an Angreal, just as I will through Elaine, as though you mean to embrace the Angreal and the source at the same time. It isn't very difficult, really. Watch, and you'll see. When it's time to bring you into the circle, just put yourself on the brink. That way, when I embrace through you, I'll embrace through the Angreal as well. Concentration or no concentration, sweat began to bead on Elaine's forehead but then the heat had nothing to do with it. The true source beckoned. It throbbed, and she throbbed with it. It demanded. The longer she hung just a hair's breadth from touching the power, the worse the desire, the need, would grow. Hanging, she began to tremble slightly. Van Deen had told her that the longer you channeled, the worse that anticipation grew. Watch with Avienda, Nynaeve told Talan. She knows how to... She caught sight of Elaine's face and finished hurriedly. Watch. 
It was not exactly the same as using an ungreal, though very close. It was not meant to be done hurriedly, either. Nynaeve did not have a soft touch at best. Elaine felt as though she were being shaken. Nothing happened physically, but inside her head she seemed to be bouncing around, tumbling wildly downhill. Worse, she was jostled toward embracing Sidar with excruciating slowness. It took less than a heartbeat, and seemed to take hours, days. She wanted to howl, but she could not breathe. Abruptly, like a dam bursting, the one power flowed through her, a rush of life and joy, of bliss, and breath left her in a long gasp of pleasure and relief so overwhelming that her legs wobbled. It was all she could do to keep from panting. Tottering, pulling herself up, she gave Nynaeve a stern look, and Nynaeve shrugged apologetically. Twice in one day. The sun had to be turning green. I now control the flow of Sidar from her as well as my own, Nynaeve went on, not quite meeting Elaine's eyes, and will until I let her go. Now don't fear that whoever leads the circle, she shot a frown at Kyra and sniffed, can make you draw too much. This really is a great deal like an Angreal. The Angreal buffers you against the extra power, and in somewhat the same way, in a circle you can't be made to draw too much. In fact, in a circle you can't draw quite as much as you can otherwise. This is dangerous, Renala broke in, shouldering roughly between Kyra and Tabrela. Her scowl took in Nynaeve, Elaine, and the sisters standing off from the circle as well. You say that one woman can simply seize another? Hold her captive? Use her? How long have you eyes that I known this? I warn you, if you try to use it on one of us, it was her turn to be cut off. It doesn't work that way, Renaila. Sarisa touched Garinia, and she and Christian leaped apart to make room. The young brown eyed Nynaeve uncertainly, then folded her hands and took on a lecturing tone, as if addressing a class. With it came composure. Perhaps she did see Renaila as a pupil right then. The Tower studied this for many years, long before the Trolloc Wars. I have read every page that survives in the Tower Library of those studies. It was proven conclusively that one woman cannot form a link with another against her will. It simply cannot be done. Nothing happens. A willing surrender is necessary, just as in embracing to Sidar itself. She sounded absolutely definite, but Renaila still frowned. Too many people knew how Aes Sedai could sidestep the oath against lying. And why did they study it? Renaila demanded. Why was the White Tower so interested in such a thing? Perhaps you Aes Sedai still study. That is ridiculous. Exasperation dripped from Sarisa's voice. If you must know, it was the problem of men who can channel that drew them to it. The breaking of the world was a living memory to some then. I don't suppose even very many sisters remember. It hasn't been part of the required instruction since before the Trolloc Wars. But men can be brought into a circle, too. And as the circle doesn't break even if you go to sleep, well, you can see the advantages. That was an utter failure, unfortunately. More to the point here, I say again that it is impossible to force a woman into a circle. If you doubt, try it yourself. You will see. Renaila nodded, accepting at last. There was very little else to do when an eyes to die made a simple statement of fact. Yet Elaine wondered what was in the pages that had not survived. She had noticed a slight change in Saritha's inflection at one point. She had questions. For later, when there were fewer ears around. When Renaila and Saritha withdrew, Nynaeve twitched her divided skirt straight plainly irritated at the interruption, and opened her mouth again. "'Continue your demonstration, Nynaeve,' Kyra commanded harshly. Her dark face might have been smooth as a frozen pond, but she was not very pleased either. Nynaeve's mouth worked before she could make any sound come out, and when it did she went on in a rush, as though afraid someone else might break in. The next part of the lesson was passing control of the circle. That had to be done voluntarily, too, and even as she reached out toward Nynaeve, 
Elaine held her breath until she felt the subtle shift that meant she now controlled the power flowing into her, and that flowing through Nynaeve, of course. She had not been sure it would work. Nynaeve could form a circle easily, if not with any finesse, but passing guidance also involved a form of surrender. Nynaeve had considerable difficulties relinquishing control or being brought into a circle, just as she had once had difficulty surrendering to Sidar, which was why Elaine kept the guidance for now. It would have to be passed to Kyra, and Nynaeve might not be able to manage letting go twice. Those apologies must have been much easier for her. Elaine linked next with Avienda, so Talan could actually see how it was done with an Angrial, as much as there was to see, and it went perfectly. Avienda was a very quick study, blending in easily. Talan was quick as well, it turned out, adding her still greater Angrial-aided flow without a hitch. One by one Elaine brought them in, and she herself almost shivered at the river of the power that streamed into her. No one yet was drawing nearly as much as she could, but it added up, especially with Angrial involved. Elaine's awareness climbed higher with each addition of Sidar. She could smell the heavy scents in the lacework gold boxes that the windfinders wore around their necks, and separate one from another. She could make out each fold and crease in everyone's clothes as sharply as if she had her nose pressed to the cloth, more sharply. She was aware of the faintest movement of the air against her hair and skin, caresses she never would have noticed without the power. That was not the whole of her awareness, of course. The link had a certain kinship to the warder bond, just as intense and somehow even more intimate. She knew that a tiny blister from climbing the hill made a spot of pain on Nynaeve's right heel. Nynaeve always talked about good stout shoes, but she had a weakness for slippers with a great deal of embroidery. Nynaeve wore a fixed frown directed at Kyra. Her arms were crossed. Her fingers, wearing the angreal, played on the braid pulled over her right shoulder, every line of her of a piece. Yet inside she was a maelstrom of emotions. Fear, worry, anticipation, irritation, wariness, and impatience bounced over each other, and washing through it all, sometimes submerging the rest, ripples of warmth and waves of heat that threatened to burst into flame. Those last Nynaeve suppressed quickly, especially the heat, but they always returned. Elaine almost thought she could recognize them, but it was like something glimpsed from the corner of your eye that was gone when you turned your head. Surprisingly, Avienda felt fear, too, but small and tightly contained, and all but swallowed by determination. Garinia and Kirstian, shaking visibly, were nearly pure terror, so strong it was amazing they could even have begun to embrace the source. What filled Rihanna to overflowing was eagerness, and no matter her skirt smoothing. As for the Atha'an Mier, even Tabrela exuded a wary alertness, and it did not take the quick darting of Matara's eyes and Rainin's to know the focus was Kyra, watching them all, impatient and commanding. Her Elaine left to last, and it was no real surprise that she had to make four tries, four, to bring the woman into the circle. Kyra was no better at yielding than Nynaeve. Elaine desperately hoped the woman had been chosen for ability, not rank. I will now pass the circle to you, she told the windfinder when it finally was done. If you recall what I did with Na— Words froze momentarily in her throat as guidance of the circle was torn from her surrender, a sensation like having a sudden burst of wind rip all of her clothes off or yank the bones out of her. She exhaled fiercely, and if it sounded close to spitting, well, so be it. Good. Kyra said, rubbing her hands together. Good. Her attention focused on the bowl, her head twisting this way and that as she studied it. Well, perhaps not all her attention. Rihanna started to sit down, and without looking up, Kyra snapped, Hold your station, woman. This isn't a fish lolly. Stand till you're told to move. Startled, Rihanna jerked back to her feet, muttering under her breath, but she might as well have ceased to exist as far as Kyra was concerned. The windfinder's eyes remained on the flattened crystal shape. 
Elaine felt resolve in her great enough to move a mountain. And something else, tiny and quickly stamped out. Uncertainty. Uncertainty? If after all of this the woman really did not know what to do... At that moment, Kyra drew deeply. Sidar flooded through Elaine, almost as much as she could hold. An unbroken ring of light blazed into being, joining the women in the circle, brighter wherever one used an angreal, but nowhere faint. She watched closely as Kyra channeled, forming a complex weave of all five powers, a four-pointed star that she laid atop the bowl with what Elaine somehow was sure was exquisite precision. The star touched, and Elaine gasped. Once she had channeled a trickle into the bowl, in Telirunriod, to be sure, and only a reflection of the bowl, though still a dangerous thing to do, and that clear crystal had turned a pale blue, and the carved clouds moved. Now the bowl of the winds was blue, the bright blue of a summer sky, and fleecy white clouds billowed across it. The four-point star became five-pointed, the composition of the weave altered slightly, and the bowl was a green sea with great heaving waves. Five points became six, and it was another sky, a different blue, darker, winter perhaps, with purple clouds heavy with rain or snow. Seven points, and a gray-green sea raged in storm. Eight points and sky, nine and sea, and suddenly Elaine felt the bowl itself drawing Sidar, a wild torrent far greater than all the circle together could manage. The changes continued unabated inside the bowl, sea to sky, waves to clouds, but a writhing braided column of Sidar shot up from that flattish crystal disk, fire and air, water and earth and spirit, a column of intricate lace as wide as the bowl, climbing up and up into the sky until its top rose out of sight. Kyra continued her weaving, sweat streaming down her face, she paused seemingly only to blink salty drops away from her eyes as she examined the images in the bowl, then laid a new weave. The pattern of the braiding in the thick column altered with every weave, subtly echoing what Kyra wove. It was a very good thing she had not wanted to focus the flows for this circle, Elaine realized. What the woman was doing required years more study than she had, many years more. Suddenly she realized something else. That ever-changing lacework of Sidar bent itself around something else, something unseen that made the column solid. She swallowed hard. The bowl was drawing Sidine as well as Sidar. Her hope that no one else had puzzled that out vanished with one glance at the other women. Half stared at the twisting column with a revulsion that should have been reserved for the dark one. Fear grew stronger among the emotions shared in her head. Some were approaching the level of Garinia and Christian, and it was a wonder those two had not fainted. Nynaeve was a hair from sicking up, for all her suddenly too smooth face. Avienda appeared just as calm outwardly, but inside that tiny fear quivered and pulsed, trying to grow. From Kyra came only determination, as steely hard as her expression. Nothing was going to stand in Kyra's way, certainly not the mere presence of shadow-tainted Sidine mixed into her weaving. Nothing was going to stop her. She worked the flows, and abruptly spider webs of Sidar blossomed from the unseen top of the column like uneven spokes of a wheel, almost a solid fan to the south, sparser fans reaching north and northwest, single lazy spokes stretching in other directions. They changed as they grew, never the same from one moment to the next, spreading across the sky farther and farther, until the ends of the pattern also passed out of sight. Not just Sidar there, either, Elaine was certain. In places that spider web caught and curved around something she could not see. Still Kyra wove, and the column danced to her bidding, Sidar and Sidine together, and the spider web altered and flowed like a lopsided kaleidoscope spinning across the heavens, vanishing into the distance, on and on and on. Without warning, Kyra straightened, knuckling her back, and released the source completely. 
Column and spiderweb evaporated, and she collapsed as much as sat down, breathing hard. The bowl turned clear again, but small patches of cider flashed and crackled around its edges. It is done, the light willing, she said tiredly. Elaine hardly heard. That was not the way to end a circle. When Kyra let go in that way, the power disappeared from every woman simultaneously. Elaine's eyes popped. For one instant it was as though she stood atop the highest tower in the world, and suddenly the tower was not there any more. Just an instant, yet hardly pleasant. She felt tired, if not anywhere near what she would have, had she actually done anything beyond serve as a conduit, but what she felt most was loss. Letting go of Sidar was bad enough. Having it simply vanish out of you went beyond thinking about. Others had suffered far worse than she. As the glow joining the circle winked out, Nynaeve sat down right where she stood as though her legs had melted, sat stroking the bracelet and rings, staring at it and panting. Sweat rolled down her face. I feel like a kitchen sieve that just had the whole mill poured through it, she murmured. Carrying that much of the power had its cost, even if you did nothing, even with an angriol. Talan wavered, a reed in the wind, casting surreptitious glances at her mother, plainly afraid to sit. Avienda stood straight, her fixed expression saying that willpower had as much to do with that as anything else. She gave a slight smile, though, and made a gesture in maiden hand talk. Worth the price. And then another, more, right behind. More than worth the price. Everyone looked weary, if not so much as those who had used Angrial. The bowl of the winds went quiet at last, just a wide bowl of clear crystal, but decorated now with towering waves. Sidar still seemed to be there, though not being wielded by anyone, not visible, but in dimly felt flashes like those that had played around the bowl at the end. Nynaeve raised her head to glower at the cloudless sky, then lowered her gaze to Kyra. All that for what? Did we do anything or not? A breath of air stirred across the hilltop, warm as the air in a kitchen. The windfinder struggled to her feet. Do you think weaving the winds is like throwing the helm over on a darter? She demanded contemptuously. I just moved the rudder on a skimmer with a beam as broad as the world. He will take time to turn. Time to know he is supposed to turn. That he must turn. But when he does, not the father of storms himself will be able to stand in his way. I have done it, Aes Sedai, and the bowl of the winds is ours. Renyla moved into the circle, kneeling beside the bowl. Carefully she began folding the white silk around it. "'I will take this to the mistress of the ships,' she said to Nynaeve. "'We have fulfilled our part of the bargain. Now you, Aes Sedai, must fulfill the rest of yours.' Marililla made a sound in her throat, but when Elaine glanced at her, the grey appeared a study in composure. "'Maybe you've done your part.' Nynaeve said, rising unsteadily. Maybe. We'll see when this... this skimmer of yours turns, if it turns. Renyla stared hard at her across the bowl, but Nynaeve ignored her. Strange, she muttered, rubbing her temple. The bracelet and rings caught in her hair, and she grimaced. I can almost feel an echo of Sidar. It must be this thing. No, Elaine said slowly. I can feel it, too. Not just the dimly perceived crackling in the air, and not an echo exactly, more the shadow of an echo, so faint that it was as if she were feeling someone use Sidar at a... She turned. On the horizon to the south, lightning flashed, dozens of bolts, vivid silver blue against the afternoon sky, very near to Ebudar. A rainstorm? Saritha said eagerly. The weather must be writing itself already. But there were no clouds in the sky, even where the lightning forked and fell. Saritha was not strong enough to sense Sidar being wielded at that distance. Elaine shivered. She was not strong enough, unless someone was using as much as they had on this hilltop. 
fifty or even a hundred eyes that die all channeling at once. Or not one of the forsaken, she murmured. Someone behind her moaned. One couldn't do that, Nynaeve agreed quietly. Maybe they didn't feel us the way we do them. Maybe. But they'll have seen, unless they're all blind. The light burn our luck. Quiet or not, she was agitated. She often called Elaine down for using language like that. Take everyone who will go to Andor with you, Elaine. I'll... I'll meet you there. Matt's in the city. I have to go back for him. Burn the boy. He came for me, and I have to. Elaine wrapped her arms around herself and drew a deep breath. Queen Tylan, she left to the mercies of the light. Tylan would survive if it was possible. But Matt Cawthon, her very strange, very instructive subject, her most unlikely rescuer, he had come for her, too, and offered more. And Tom Marilyn, dear Tom, who she sometimes still wished would turn out to be her real father, and the light burn what that would make of her mother, and the boy Alver, and Chell Vannin, and— she had to think like a queen. The rose crown is heavier than a mountain, her mother had told her, and duty will make you weep, but you must bear and do what must be done. No, she said, then more firmly, no. Look at you, Nynaeve. You can hardly stand. Even if we all went, what could we do? How many of the forsaken are there? We'd die, or worse, for no gain. The Forsaken have no reason to look for Matt or the others. It's us they will be after. Nynaeve gaped at her, stubborn Nynaeve with sweat running down her face and her legs unsteady. Wonderful, gallant, foolish Nynaeve. You're saying leave him, Elaine? Avienda, talk to her. Tell her about that honor you're always going on about. Avienda hesitated, then shook her head. She was almost as sweaty as Nynaeve, and from the way she moved, just as tired. There are times to fight without hope, Nynaeve. But Elaine is right. The Shadow Sold will not be looking for Matt Cawthon. They will be after us and the bowl. He may have left the city already. If we go, we risk giving them what can undo what we have done. Wherever we send the bowl, they will be able to make us tell them who we sent it with and where. Nynaeve's face crumpled in pain. Elaine reached to put her arms around her. Shadow spawn! Someone screamed, and suddenly women were embracing Sidar all over the hilltop. Balls of fire shot up from Marililla's hands, from Kariana's and Sarisa's, as fast as they could throw. A huge winged shape, enveloped in flame, tumbled out of the sky, trailing oily black smoke, falling just beyond the cliff. There's another one! Kirstian shouted, pointing. A second winged creature dove away from the hill, body as big as a horse, ribbed wings spanning thirty paces or more, long necks stretched out before and longer tails streaming behind. Two figures crouched low on its back. A storm of fire rained after it, quickest of all from Avienda and the sea folk, who made no throwing gesture as part of their weaving. A hail of fire so thick it seemed that fire must be forming itself out of the air, and the thing dodged behind the hill on the other side of the farm and appeared to vanish. Did we kill it? Saritha asked. Her eyes shone bright, and she breathed hard in agitation. Did we even hit it? One of the Atha Anmier growled disgustedly. Shadow spawn, Marililla murmured in amazement. Here? At least that proves it's the Forsaken in Ebudar. Not shadow spawn, Elaine said hollowly. Nynaeve's face was a picture of anguish. She knew, too. They call it a rakan. It's the Shonchan. We must go, Nynaeve, and take every woman at the farm with us. Whether we killed that thing or not, more will come. Anyone we leave behind will be wearing a Damani leash by tomorrow morning. Nynaeve nodded, slowly, painfully. Elaine thought she murmured, Oh, Matt. Renyla strode up with the bowl in her arms, once more swathed in its white covering. Some of our ships have encountered these Shan-Chan. If they are in Ebudar, then the ships beat to sea. My ship fights for his life, and I am not on his deck. We go now. And she formed the weave for a gateway right there. 
It tangled uselessly, of course, flared bright for an instant, then collapsed into nothing. But Elaine squeaked in spite of herself, right there in the middle of them. You aren't going anywhere from here unless you mean to stay long enough to learn this hilltop, she snapped. She hoped none of the women who had been in the circle tried the weave. Holding Sidar was the fastest way to learn a place. She could have made it work here, and very likely so could they. You aren't going to a moving ship from anywhere. I don't think it's even possible. Marililla nodded, though that meant little. I said I believed a great many things to be true, and some of them actually were. As well if the sea folk believed it proven in any case. Nynaeve, haggard and staring, was in no condition to do any leading at the moment, so Elaine went on. She hoped she managed to do her mother's memory proud. But most of all, you aren't going anywhere except with us because our bargain isn't complete. The bowl of the winds is not yours until the weather is right. Not precisely true, unless you twisted the words of the bargain a little, and Renyla opened her mouth, but Elaine ploughed on. And because you made a bargain with Matram Cawthon, my subject. You go voluntarily where I want you to, or you go tied to a pack saddle. Those were the choices you accepted. So get down this hill now, Renylid and Callan Blue Star, before the Shan Chan sweep down on us with an army and a few hundred women who can channel and would like nothing better than to see us collared alongside them. Now, run! To her astonishment, they ran. Chapter 6 Threads Elaine ran too, of course, holding her skirts up, and quickly took the lead on the well-worn dirt path. Only Avienda stayed close, though she seemed to have no idea how to run in a dress, divided or not. Tired as she was, she certainly would have passed Elaine otherwise. Everyone else strung out behind them along the narrow, winding track. None of the Asa Anmier would push by Renaila, and despite her silk trousers, she could not move very fast, carrying the bowl hugged to her chest. Nynaeve had no such compunctions, elbowing past and running hard— shouting for people to get out of her way when she stumbled into them, whether they were windfinders, kinswomen, or eyes that die. Bounding down the hillside, tripping and catching herself, Elaine wanted to laugh despite the urgency, despite the danger. Lini and her mother had been deaf on running and climbing trees from the time she was twelve, but it was not just the sheer pleasure of running again that made delight bubble up in her middle. She had behaved as a queen was supposed to behave— and it had worked exactly as it was supposed to. She had taken charge to lead people out of danger, and they followed. Her whole life had been training for this. It was satisfaction that made her laugh, and the hot glow of pride seemed about to burst through her skin like the radiance of Sidar. Rounding the last curve, she pounded down the final straight beside one of the tall white plastered barns, and her toe caught an almost buried stone. She pitched forward heavily, windmilling her arms, and suddenly she was somersaulting head over heels through the air. No time even to yell. With a thump that jarred her teeth and took all the wind out of her, she landed hard at the foot of the path, sitting right in front of Brigitta. For an instant she could not even think, and when she could, little satisfaction remained. So much for queenly dignity. Brushing her hair out of her face, she tried to catch her breath as she waited for Brigitta's cutting comment. This was a chance for the other woman to play the older and wiser sister with a vengeance, and she seldom let an opportunity pass. To Elaine's surprise, Brigitta heaved her to her feet even before Avienda could reach her, and without so much as the faint grin on Avienda's face. All Elaine could feel from her warder was a sense of focus. She thought an arrow knocked on a drawn bowstring might feel that way. Do we run or fight? Brigida asked. I recognize those Shan Shan flyers from Falma. And truth for true, I suggest running. My bow is the ordinary sort today. Avienda gave her a slight frown, and Elaine sighed. Brigida had to learn to guard her tongue if she really intended to hide who she was. Of course we run, Nynaeve panted, laboring down the final stretch of path. Fight or run, fool question. Do you think we're utter light? What are they doing? Her voice started climbing and kept right on. Elise? Elise, where are you? Elise? Elise? 
With a start, Elaine realized the farm was boiling as badly as it had when Kariana's face was recognized, maybe worse. A hundred and forty-seven kinswomen inhabited the place at present, Elise had reported, including fifty-four red-belted wise women sent out days ago, and a number of others who had been passing through the city. Now it looked as though every last one was running somewhere, and a good many of the other women, too. Most of the Tarasin palace servants in their green and white livery dashed this way and that, carrying burdens. Ducks and chickens darted through the tumult, flapping and squawking, adding to the apparent confusion. Elaine even saw a warder, Van Deen's grizzled jam, trot by with his wiry arms wrapped around a big jute sack. Elise appeared as though from the air, poised and collected despite the perspiration on her face. Every strand of her hair was in place, and her dress looked as if she were merely out for a stroll. "'There's no need to screech,' she said calmly, planting hands on hips. "'Birgitta told me what those big birds are, and I thought we might be leaving sooner rather than later, especially with all of you galloping down the hill like the Dark One himself was after you. I told everybody to collect one clean dress apiece, three changes of shift and stockings, soap, mending baskets, and all the coin they have. That, and no more.' The last ten to finish will do the washing up till we get where we're going. That will speed their feet. I told those servants to gather all the food they could, too, just in case. And your warders. Sensible fellows, most of them. Surprisingly sensible for men. Does being a warder do something to them? Nynaeve stood there with her jaw hanging, ready to issue orders, and none left to give. Emotions played across her face too fast to catch. Very good, she mumbled finally and sourly. Suddenly she brightened. The women who aren't kin, yes, they have to be— Calm yourself, Elise broke in, making a soothing gesture. They are already gone, for the most part. Mainly those with husbands or families they're worried about. I couldn't have held those back had I wanted. But a good thirty think those birds really are shadow spawn and want to stay as close to eyes to die as they can get. A sharp sniff said what she thought of that. Now you just gather yourself. Drink some cool water, not too fast. Put a little on your face. I have to keep an eye on things. Casting her eye over the bustle, everybody running in bounds, Elise shook her head. Some would slack off if Trollocs were coming over the hill, and most of the noble women never really do get used to our rules. For sure I'll need to remind two or three before we go. With that, she waded serenely back into the turmoil of the farmyard and left Nynaeve gaping. Well, Elaine said, brushing her skirt, you did say she was a very capable woman. I never said that, Nynaeve snapped. I never said very. Humph, where did my hat get to? Thinks she knows everything. I'll wager she doesn't know that. She flounced off in a different direction than Elise. Elaine stared after her. Her hat? She would have liked to know where her own hat had gone to. It was a beautiful thing. But really? Maybe being in a circle working that much of the power using an angreal doing it had unsettled Nynaeve's wits temporarily. She still felt a trifle odd herself, as though she could pluck little bits of sidar out of the air around her. In any case, she had other matters to worry about right then, like being ready to get away before the Shanshan descended. From what she had seen in Falma, they really might bring a hundred Domani, or more, and based on the little Egwene would let herself say of her captivity, most of those women really would be eager to help collar others. She said that what had turned her stomach most had been the sight of Domani from Shanchan laughing with their soldom, fawning and playing with them, well-trained hounds with their affectionate handlers. Egwene said some of the women collared in Falma had been that way, too. It made Elaine's blood run cold. She would die before letting them put that leash on her, and she would as soon let the Forsaken have what she had found as the Shanchan. She went running to the cistern, Avienda at her side, breathing almost as hard as she was herself. It seemed Elise really had thought of everything, though. The Turangrial were already stowed away on the pack horses. The unsearched panniers remained full of jumbled odds and ends, and the light knew what, but those she and Avienda had emptied now bulged with coarse sacks of flour and salt, beans and lentils. 
A handful of stable folk minded the pack animals instead of running about with their arms full, doing Elise's bidding, no doubt. Even Birgitta went trotting off at the woman's call with no more than a rueful grin. Elaine lifted canvas covers to examine the Turangrial as well as she could without unloading them again. Everything appeared to be there, a bit tumbled together in two panniers, not enough to fill them, but nothing broken. Not that anything short of the one power itself could break most Turangrial, yet even so. Avienda took a seat cross-legged on the ground, blotting sweat from her face with a large, plain linen handkerchief that seemed very much at odds with her pretty silk riding dress. Even she was beginning to show weariness. What are you muttering about, Elaine? You sound like Nynaeve. This Elise has only saved us the trouble of packing those things ourselves. Elaine colored faintly. She had not meant to speak aloud. I just don't want anyone handling them who doesn't know what they're doing, Avienda. Some Turangrial could trigger even for people unable to channel if they did the wrong thing. But the truth was she did not want anyone handling them. They were hers. The Hall was not going to hand these over to some other sister just because she was older and more experienced, or hide them away because studying Turangrial was too dangerous. With this many examples to study... Maybe she could finally figure out how to make Turangrial that worked every time. There had been far too many failures and half-successes. They need someone who knows what she's doing, she said, lashing the stiff canvas back in place. Order began to appear out of pandemonium more rapidly than Elaine expected, though not as fast as she could have wished. Of course, she admitted reluctantly, nothing slower than instantaneous could have matched her wishes. Unable to keep her eyes off the sky, she sent Kariana running back to the top of the hill to watch toward Ebudar. The stocky green grumbled a bit under her breath before curtsying, and even frowned at the kinswomen dashing about as if on the point of suggesting one of them instead. But Elaine wanted someone who would not faint at the sight of shadow spawn approaching, and Kariana stood lowest among the sisters. Adelius and Van Deen brought out Ispan between them, firmly shielded, and the leather sack back over her head. She walked quite easily, and nothing visible said that anything at all had been done to her, except... Ispan kept her hands folded at her waist, never so much as trying to raise the sack for a peek, and when she was boosted into a saddle she held out her wrists to be corded to the pommel without being told. If she was that amenable, perhaps they had learned something from her. Elaine just did not want to contemplate how the learning might have been achieved. There were bumps, of course, of sorts, even with what might be rushing toward them, what surely was rushing toward them. Nynaeve getting her blue-plumed hat back was not really a bump, though it almost turned into one. Elise had found it, and handed it back, telling Nynaeve she needed to shield her face from the sun if she wanted to keep that smooth, pretty skin. An open-mouthed Nynaeve watched the graying woman hurry off to deal with one of the numerous small problems, then ostentatiously shoved the hat under a strap of her saddlebags. From the beginning Nynaeve set about flattening the real bumps, but Elise was nearly always there first, and where Elise met a bump, the bump flattened itself. Several noblewomen demanded help packing their belongings, only to be informed in no uncertain terms that she had meant what she said, and if they did not hop to it, they could live in what they stood in. They hopped. Some, and not only nobles, changed their minds about going when they learned the destination was Andor, and were literally chased away, afoot, and told to keep running as long as they could. Every horse was needed, but they had to be well away before the Shan Shan appeared. At the very least, they could be expected to put anyone near the farm to the question. As should have been expected, Nynaeve got into a shouting match with Renaila over the bowl, and the turtle Talan had used, which Renaila apparently had tucked behind her sash. Hardly had they reached the stage of waving arms, however, than Elise was right there, and in short order the bowl was back in Cerisa's care and the turtle in Marililla's, following which Elaine was treated to the sight of Elise shaking her finger under the astonished nose of the wind-finder to the mistress of the ships to the Afaan Mier, delivering a tongue-lashing on the subject of theft— that led Renaila spluttering indignantly. Nynaeve did a little spluttering, too, stalking away empty-handed, yet Elaine thought she had never seen anyone look so forlorn. 
All in all, it did not take very long, though. The remaining women who had been at the farm gathered under the watchful eye of the knitting circle, and of Elise, who carefully noted the last ten to arrive, all but two in fine embroidered silks, not much different from Elaine's. Definitely not kinswomen. Elaine felt sure they really would do the washing up anyway. Elise would not let a little thing like noble birth stand in her way. The windfinders lined up with their horses, surprisingly silent except for Renaila, who muttered imprecations whenever she saw Elise. Cariana was summoned back from the hilltop. The warders brought the sisters their mounts. Almost everyone kept an eye on the sky, and Sidar made halos around all of the older eyes Sadai and most of the windfinders, around a few of the kin as well. Leading her mare to the head of the line at the cistern, Nynaeve fingered the Angreal still on her hand as if she were going to be the one to make the gateway, ridiculous as the very idea might be. For one thing, though she had washed her face and donned her hat, strangely, all things considered, she still tottered whenever her self-control slipped. Lan stayed practically at her shoulder, stone-faced as always, but if ever there was a man ready to catch a woman when she fell, it was he. Even with the bracelet and rings, Nynaeve might not be able to manage enough to weave a gateway. More important, she had been dashing about the farm ever since they first arrived. Elaine had spent a considerable time holding Sidar right where they now stood. She knew that spot. Nynaeve scowled sulkily when Elaine embraced the source, but at least she had sense enough to say nothing. Right from the first, Elaine wished that she had asked Avienda for the woman cloaked in her own hair. She was weary, too, and all the sidar she could draw was barely enough to form the weave so it would work. The flows wavered in her grasp almost as if trying to twist free, then snapped into place so suddenly that she jumped. Channeling when you were tired was not at all like other times, but this was the worst ever. At least the familiar vertical slash of silver appeared as it should, and widened into an opening right alongside the cistern, an opening no bigger than the one Avienda had made, and at that Elaine was grateful it was large enough to fit a horse through. At the last she had not been certain it would be. Gasps rose from the kinswomen, seeing a view of an upland meadow suddenly standing between them and the familiar grey bulk of the cistern. "'You should have let me try,' Nynaeve said softly. Softly, but with a sharp point even so. You nearly fubbed it altogether. Avienda gave Nynaeve a flat look that almost made Elaine grab her arm. The longer they remained near sisters, the more she seemed to think she had to defend Elaine's honor. If they did become first sisters, Elaine could see having to keep her away from Nynaeve and Brigitte completely. It's done, Nynaeve, she said quickly. That's all that counts. Nynaeve directed a flat look at her and muttered something about the day being prickly, as if Elaine were the one showing her snappish side. Birgitta was the first through, grinning impudently at Lan, leading her horse with her bow already in her other hand. Elaine could sense eagerness in her, a touch of satisfaction, perhaps, that this time she had the lead instead of Lan. There was always a bit of rivalry between warders, and a small measure of wariness, very small. Elaine knew that meadow well. Gareth Bryn had taught her to ride not far from there. About five miles over those first sparsely treed hills lay the manor house of one of her mother's estates. One of her estates. She had to get used to that. The seven families who tended the house and its grounds would be the only people for half a day's journey in any direction. Elaine had chosen that destination because they could reach Camelin in two weeks from there, and because the estate was so isolated she might be entering Camelin before anyone knew she was in Andor. That could be a very necessary precaution. At various times in Andor's history, rivals for the Rose Crown had been kept as guests until they relinquished their claims. Her mother had kept two until she took the throne. With luck, she could have a solid base established by the time Egwene and the others arrived. Lan took Mandar bright behind Brigitte's brown gelding, and Nynaeve lurched as if to rush after the black warhorse then pulled herself up short with a level stare that dared Elaine to say a word. Fiddling furiously with her reins, she made a visible effort to look anywhere except through the gateway after Lan. Her lips moved. After a moment, Elaine realized that she was counting. 
Nynaeve, she said quietly, we really don't have time for... Move along, Elise called from the rear, the sound of her hands clapping a sharp, punctuating crack. No pushing or shoving now, but I'll have no laggards either. Move along. Nynaeve's head swung wildly, pained indecision painting her face. For some reason she touched her wide hat, a few of its blue plumes broken and drooping before pulling her hand away. Oh, that goat-kissing old, she growled, the rest lost as she dragged her mare through the gateway. Elaine sniffed and Nynaeve had the nerve to speak to anybody about their language. She wished she could have heard the rest, though. She already knew the first bit. Elise continued her urging, but there really did not seem to be much need after the first. Even the windfinders hurried, glancing worriedly over their shoulders at the sky. Even Renaila, who mumbled something about Elise that Elaine noted in the back of her head, though calling someone... A fish-loving scavenger did seem rather mild. She would have expected the sea folk to eat fish all the time. Elise herself brought up the very rear, except for the remaining warders, as if to herd even the pack horses along. She paused long enough to hand Elaine her green-plumed hat. You'll want to keep the sun off that sweet face of yours, she said with a smile. Such a pretty girl. No need to turn to leather before your time. Avienda, sitting on the ground nearby, fell over backward and kicked her heels, laughing. I think I'll ask her to find you a hat, with lots of plumes and big bows, Elaine said in dulcet tones before quickly following the kinswoman. That certainly cut off Avienda's laughter. The gently rolling meadow was broad and nearly a mile long, surrounded by hills taller than those she had left behind, and by trees she knew oak and pine and blackwood, sour gum and leather leaf and fir, thick forest with good tall timber to south and west and east, though there might not be any cutting this year. Most of the more scattered trees to the north toward the manor were better suited for firewood. Small gray boulders dotted the thick brown grass here and there, and not even a withered stalk marked the death of a wildflower. That was not so different from the south. For once, Nynaeve was not peering at the surrounding countryside trying to find Lan. He and Brigitte would not be gone long anyway, not here. Instead, she strode briskly among the horses, ordering people to mount in a loud, commanding voice, chivying the servants with the pack animals, curtly telling some of the kinswomen who had no horses that any child could walk five miles, shouting at a slender Altara noblewoman with a scar on her cheek, and carrying a bundle nearly as big as herself, that if she had been fool enough to gather all of her dresses, then she could carry them. Elise had gathered the Atha'an Mier around her and was instructing them on how to mount a horse. For a wonder, they actually appeared to be paying attention. Nynaeve glanced her way and seemed pleased to see Elise standing in one spot, until Elise smiled encouragingly and motioned her to go on with what she was doing. For an instant, Nynaeve stood stock still, staring at the woman. Then she came striding through the grass to Elaine. Reaching up to her hat with both hands, she hesitated, glowering up at it through her lashes before giving it a twitch straight. I'll just let her take care of everything this time, she said in a suspiciously reasonable tone. We'll just see how well she does with those sea folk. Yes, we will. Too reasonable a tone by half. Abruptly, she frowned at the still open gateway. Why are you holding it? Let go. Avienda was frowning, too. Elaine drew a deep breath. She had thought about this, and there was no other way, but Nynaeve would try to argue her out of it, and there was no time for arguing. Through the gateway, the farmyard stood empty, even the chickens finally frightened away by the hubbub, yet how long before it filled up again? She studied her weave, melded together so snugly that only a few threads remained distinct. She could see every flow, of course, but except for those few they appeared inseparably combined. "'Take everyone to the manor house, Nynaeve,' she said. The sun did not have very much farther to fall. Perhaps two hours of light remained. "'Master Hornwell will be surprised at so many visitors arriving at dark, but tell him your guests of the girl who cried over the redbird with the broken wing.' He'll remember that. 
I will be along as soon as I can. Elaine, Avienda began, in a surprisingly anxious voice, and at the same time, Nynaeve said sharply, Just what do you think you're— There was only one way to stop it. Elaine plucked one of the discernible threads free of the weave. It wavered and flailed like a living tentacle. It fuzzed and spluttered, tiny fluffs of sidar breaking off and fading away. She had not noticed that when Avienda unmade her weave, but she had only seen the tail of that, really. Go on, she told Nynaeve. I'll wait for the rest until you are all out of sight. Nynaeve stared out, her jaw hanging. It has to be done, Elaine sighed. The Shan Chan will be at the farm in hours for sure. Even if they wait until tomorrow, what if one of the Domani has the talent to read residues? Nynaeve, I won't give traveling to the Shan Chan. I won't. Nynaeve growled something under her breath about the Shan Chan that must have been particularly pithy, judging by her tone. Well, I won't let you burn yourself out, she said aloud. Now put that back, before the whole thing explodes the way Van Deen said. You could kill all of us. It cannot be put back, Avienda said, laying a hand on Nynaeve's arm. She has begun, and now she must finish. You must do as she says, Nynaeve. Nynaeve's brows drew down. Must was a word she did not like hearing one bit. That applied to her. She was not a fool, though, so after a bit of glaring, at Elaine, at the gateway, at Avienda, at the world in general, she flung her arms around Elaine in a hug that made her ribs creak. "'You be careful, you hear me?' she whispered. "'If you get yourself killed, I swear I'll skin you alive!' In spite of everything, Elaine burst out laughing. Nynaeve snorted, pushing her out to arm's length by her shoulders. "'You know what I mean,' she grumbled. "'And don't think I don't mean it, because I do. "'I do,' she added in a softer voice. "'You take care.' "'It took Nynaeve a moment to gather herself, "'blinking and pulling her blue riding gloves tight. "'There seemed to be a hint of moisture in her eyes, "'though that could not have been. "'Nynaeve made other people cry. "'She did not cry herself. "'Well, then,' she said loudly, "'at least if you don't have everyone ready yet.' Turning, she cut off with a strangled croak. Those who were supposed to be mounted were, even the Afa An Mier. The warders were all gathered around the other sisters. Lan and Brigitta had returned, and Brigitta watched Elaine worriedly. The servants had the pack animals in a line, and the kinswomen were waiting patiently, most afoot except for the knitting circle. A number of horses that could have been used for riding were loaded with sacks of food and bundles of belongings. Women who had brought more than Elise allowed, none of them kin, carried their bundles on their own backs. The slender noble with the scar was bent at an awkward angle beneath hers, and glaring at anyone but Elise. Every woman who could channel was staring at the gateway, and every woman who had been there to hear Van Deen tell of the dangers watched that one whipping filament as she would have a red adder. It was Elise herself who brought Nynaeve her horse and straightened the blue-plumed hat as Nynaeve put a foot in the stirrup. Nynaeve turned the plump mare north with Lan riding Mandarb at her side and a look of utter mortification on her face. Why she did not just set Elise down, Elaine did not understand. To hear Nynaeve tell it, she had been putting women older than herself in their place since she was little more than a girl, and she was eyes to die now, after all. That should carry mountains of weight with any kinswoman. As the column began to wend its way toward the hills, Elaine looked at Avienda and Brigitta. Avienda simply stood there with her arms folded beneath her breasts. She had the woman wrapped in her own hair, Angrial, clutched in one hand. Brigitta took Lioness's reins from Elaine, adding them to those of her own horse and Avienda's, then walked over to a small boulder twenty paces away and sat down. "'You two must—' Elaine began— then coughed when Avienda's eyebrows shot up in surprise. Sending Avienda out of danger was impossible without shaming her, perhaps impossible altogether. I want you to go with the others, she told Brigitta, and take Lioness. Avienda and I can take turns riding her gelding. I'd like a walk before bedtime. If you ever treat a man half as well as you do that horse, Brigitta said dryly, 
he'll be yours for life. I think I'll just sit a while. I've ridden long enough today. I'm not at your beck and call all the time. We can play that game in front of the sisters and the other warders to spare your blushes, but you and I know better. Despite the mocking words, what Elaine felt from her was affection. No, stronger than affection. Her own eyes stung suddenly. Her death would hurt Brigitte to the bone. The warder bond made that certain. But it was friendship that made her stay now. I am thankful to have two friends such as you, she said simply. Brigitte grinned at her as if she had said something silly. Avienda, however, blushed furiously and stared at Brigitte, wide-eyed and flustered, as though the warder's presence were to blame for her fiery cheeks. Hurriedly she shifted her gaze to the people still short of the first hill, perhaps half a mile distant. Best to wait until they are out of sight, she said, but you cannot wait too long. Once you have started the unweaving, the flows begin to grow slick after a time. Letting one slip free before it is out of the weave is the same as letting go of the weave. It will fall into whatever it wishes, then. But you must not hurry, either. Each thread must be pulled free as far as it will go. The more that come loose, the easier others will be to see, but you must always pick the thread that is easiest to see. Smiling warmly, she pressed her fingers firmly against Elaine's cheek. You will do well, if you are careful. It did not sound that difficult. She just had to be careful. It seemed to take a long time for the last woman to vanish over the hill, the slender noble bent under the bulk of her dresses. The sun barely appeared to settle any at all, but it seemed like hours. What did Avienda mean precisely by slick? She could not explain beyond variations on the word. They became difficult to hold, that was all. Elaine found out as soon as she began again. Slick was what you would get if you coated a live eel with grease. She gritted her teeth just holding on to that first thread, and that was on top of trying to pull it free. All that stopped her from gasping in relief when the thread of air began whipping about, finally loose, was that there were more to go. If they became much more slick, she was not sure she could manage it. Avienda watched closely, but did not say another word, though she always had an encouraging smile when Elaine needed one. Elaine could not see Birgitta. She did not dare look away from her work. Yet she could feel her, a small knot of rock-solid confidence in her own head, enough confidence to fill her. Sweat slid down her face, down her back and belly, until she began to feel slick herself. A bath tonight would be most welcome. Oh, she could not think of that. All attention on the weaves. They were getting harder to handle, quivering in her grip as soon as she touched one, but they still came free, and every time one thread began to lash about, another seemed to leap out of the mass, to suddenly be clearly perceptible where there had only been solid sidar before. To her eye the gateway resembled some monstrous, distorted hundred heads on the bottom of a pond, surrounded by flailing tendrils, every one thickly haired with threads of the power that grew and writhed and vanished, only to be replaced by new. The opening visible to anyone flexed along its edges, changing shape and even size continuously. Her legs began to tremble, strain stung her eyes as much as sweat did. She did not know how much longer she could go on. Gritting her teeth, she fought. One thread at a time. One thread at a time. A thousand miles away, less than a hundred paces away through the shuddering gateway, dozens of soldiers swept around the white farm buildings, short men carrying crossbows in brown breastplates and painted helmets that looked like the heads of huge insects. Behind them came a woman with red panels bearing silver lightning on her skirts, a bracelet on her wrist linked by a silvery leash to the collar around the neck of a woman in grey, and then another Suldam and her Damani, then another pair. One of the Suldam pointed at the gateway, and the glow of Sidar abruptly enveloped her Damani. Get down! Elaine screamed, falling backward out of sight of the farmyard, and silver-blue lightning shot through the gateway with a roar that filled her ears, forking savagely in every direction. Her hair lifted, every strand trying to stand on its own, and thunderous fountains of earth erupted wherever one of the forks struck. 
dirt and pebbles rained down on her. Hearing returned suddenly, and a man's voice from the other side of the opening, a slurred, drawling accent that made her skin crawl as much as the words, "'Must take them alive, you fools!' Abruptly one of the soldiers was leaping into the meadow right in front of her. Brigitte's arrow punched through the clenched fist embossed on his leather breastplate. A second Shan Chan soldier stumbled over the first as he fell, and Avienda's belt knife stabbed into his throat before he could recover. Arrows flew from Brigitte's bow like hail. With one boot on the horse's reins, she grinned grimly as she shot. The trembling horses tossed their heads and danced as if they would jerk free and run, but Brigitte simply stood and shot as fast as she could draw. Shouts from beyond the gateways said Brigitte Silverbow still struck home with every shaft she loosed. Answer came, quick as bad thought, black streaks, crossbow bolts. So quick, all happening so fast. Avienda fell, blood running over the fingers clutching her right arm, but she let go of her wound immediately, crawling clear, scrabbling on the ground for the Angreal, her face set. Brigitte cried out. Dropping her bow, she grabbed her thigh where a quarrel stuck out. Elaine felt the stab of agony as sharply as if it were her own. Desperately, she seized another thread from where she lay half on her back, and realized to her horror after one tug, that it was all she could do to hold on. Had the thread moved? Had it slipped free any at all? If it had, she did not dare let go. The thread trembled greasily in her grasp. Alive, I said, that Shan Chan voice roared. Anyone who kills a woman gets no share of the taking gold. The flurry of crossbow bolts ceased. You wish to take me? Avienda shouted. Then come and dance with me. Sidar's glow abruptly surrounded her, dim even with the Angreal, and balls of fire sprang into being in front of the gateway and sprayed through again and again. Not very large balls, but the blasts as they burst back in Altara sounded in a steady stream. Avienda panted with effort, though. Her face glistened with sweat. Brigitte had recovered her bow. She looked every inch the hero of legend, Blood streaming down her leg, barely able to stand, but an arrow half-drawn, searching for a target. Elaine tried to control her breathing. She could not embrace one shred more of the power, nothing to help. The two of you must get away, she said. She could not believe how she sounded, calm as ice. She knew she should have been wailing. Her heart was trying to pound through her ribs. I don't know how much longer I can hold this. That held true for the entire weave as much as for that single thread. Was it sliding? Was it? Go as fast as you can. The other side of the hills should be safe, but every span you can cover gains something. Go! Brigitte growled in the old tongue, but nothing that Elaine knew. It sounded like phrases she would like to learn, if there was ever a chance. Brigitte went on in words Elaine could understand. You let that bloody thing go before I tell you, and you won't have to worry about waiting for Nynaeve to skin you. I'll do it myself. And then let her have a turn. Just be quiet and hang on. Avienda, get around here, behind that thing. Can you keep that up from behind it? Get around here and on one of these bloody horses. As long as I can see where to weave, Avienda replied, staggering to her feet. She wobbled sideways and barely caught herself, short of falling. Blood flowed down her sleeve from a wicked gash. I think I can. She vanished behind the gateway and the fireballs continued. You could see through a gateway from the other side, though it appeared to be a heat haze hanging in the air. You could not walk through from that side, though. The attempt would be extremely painful. And when Avienda reappeared, she was stumbling well wide. Brigitte helped her mount her gelding, but backwards of all things. When Brigitte motioned fiercely to her, Elaine did not bother with shaking her head. For one thing, she feared what might happen if she did. I'm not certain I can hold on if I try to get up. In truth, she was not certain she could get up. Tired was no longer in it. Her muscles were water. Ride as fast as you can. I'll hold on as long as I'm able. Please go. Muttering curses in the old tongue, they had to be. Nothing else ever had the sound. Brigitte shoved the horse's reins into Avienda's hands. 
Nearly falling twice, she hobbled to Elaine and bent to take her by the shoulders. You can hang on, she said, her voice filled with the same conviction Elaine felt from her. I never met a queen of Andor before you, but I've known queens like you. A backbone of steel and a lion's heart. You can do it. Slowly she pulled Elaine up, not waiting for an answer, her face tight, every stab in her leg echoing in Elaine's head. Elaine quivered with the effort of holding the weave, holding that one thread. She was surprised to find herself erect. And alive. Brigitta's leg throbbed madly in her head. She tried not to lean on Brigitta, but her own trembling limbs would not support her completely. As they lurched toward the horses, each half leaning on the other, she kept looking back over her shoulder. She could hold a weave without looking at it. She could normally— but she needed to reassure herself that she really did still have a grip on that one thread, that it was not slipping. The gateway now appeared like no weave she had ever seen, twisting wildly, wreathed with fuzzed tentacles. With a groan, Brigitta heaved her into her saddle more than helped her, backward just like Avienda. You have to see, she explained, limping to her gelding, holding the reins of all three horses, she pulled herself up painfully. Without a sound, but Elaine felt the agony. You do what needs doing and leave where we're going to me. The horses leaped away, perhaps as much from eagerness to be gone as from Brigitte's heel in her own mount's flank. Elaine hung on to the high cantle of her saddle as grimly as she did to the weave, to Sidar itself. The galloping horse flung her about, and it was all she could do to remain in the saddle. Avienda used her saddle's cantle as a prop to keep herself upright. Her mouth hung open, sucking air, and her eyes seemed fixed. The glow surrounded her, though, and that stream of fireballs continued. Not as fast as before, true, and some shot wide of the gateway, streaking trails of flame through the grass or exploding on the ground beyond, but they still formed and flew. Elaine took strength, made herself take strength. If Avienda could keep on when she looked ready to fall on her face, she could too. At a gallop the gateway began to dwindle, brown grass stretching out between them and the opening, and then the ground was slanting upward. They were climbing the hill. Brigida was again the arrow in the bow, all focus, fighting down the agony in her legs, urging her horses for more speed. All they had to do was reach the crest, reach the other side. With a gasp, Avienda sagged onto her elbows, bouncing on her saddle like a loose sack. The light of Sidar flickered around her and was gone. I cannot, she panted. I cannot. That was all she could get out. Sean Chan's soldiers began leaping into the meadow almost as soon as the hail of fire ceased. It's all right, Elaine managed. Her throat was sand. All the moisture that had been in her now coated her skin and soaked her clothes. Using an angreal is tiring. You did well, and they can't catch us now. As if to mock her, a suldam appeared in the meadow below. Even at half a mile there was no mistaking the two women. The sun, low in the west, still flashed glints off the idam linking them. Another pair joined them, then a third, and a fourth, a fifth. The crest, Birgitta shouted joyfully. We made it! It's good wine and a well-set-up man tonight! In the meadow a suldam pointed, and time seemed to slow for Elaine. The glow of the one power sprang up around the woman's damani. Elaine could see the weave forming. She knew what it was, and there was no way to stop it. Faster! she shouted. The shield struck her. She should have been too strong for it. She should have been. But exhausted as she was, barely clinging to Sidar as she was, it sliced between her and the source. Down in the meadow, the weave that had been a gateway fell in on itself. Haggard, looking as though she could not possibly move, Avienda hurled herself from her saddle at Elaine, carrying them both off. Elaine had just time to see the far slope of the hill below her as she fell. The air turned white, blanking her sight. There was sound, she knew there was sound, a great roar, but it lay beyond hearing. Something struck her, as if she had fallen from a rooftop onto hard pavement, from a tower top. Her eyes opened, staring at the sky. 
The sky looked strange somehow, blurry. For a moment she could not move, and when she did she gasped. She hurt everywhere. Oh, light, she hurt. Slowly she raised a hand to her face. Her fingers came away red. Blood. The others. She had to help the others. She could feel Brigitte, feel pain as bad as what gripped her, but at least Brigitte was alive, and determined, and angry, apparently. She could not be injured too badly. Avienda! With a sob, Elaine rolled over, then pushed up to hands and knees, her head spinning, agony stabbing her side. Vaguely she recalled that moving with even one broken rib could be dangerous, but the thought was as hazy as the hillside. Thinking seemed difficult. Blinking appeared to help her sight, though, some. She was almost to the bottom of the hill. High above, a haze of smoke rose from the meadow beyond, unimportant now, not important at all. Thirty paces up the slope, Avienda was on her hands and knees, too, almost falling over when she raised a hand to wipe away blood that poured down her face, but searching anxiously. Her gaze fell on Elaine, and she froze, staring. Elaine wondered how bad she looked. Surely no worse than Avienda herself. Half of the other woman's skirt was gone, her bodice torn nearly off, and everywhere skin showed there seemed to be blood. Elaine crawled to her. With her head it seemed much easier than trying to stand and walk. As she came close... Avienda gave a relieved gasp. "'You are all right,' she said, touching bloody fingers to Elaine's cheek. "'I was so afraid, so afraid.' Elaine blinked in surprise. What she could see of herself appeared in every bit as bad shape as Avienda. Her own skirts remained intact, but half of her bodice was ripped away entirely, and she seemed to be bleeding from two dozen gashes. Then it struck her. She had not been burned out. She shivered at the thought. We are both all right, she said softly. Well off to one side, Brigitte wiped her belt knife on the mane of Avienda's gelding and straightened from the still horse. Her right arm dangled, her coat was gone along with one boot and the rest of her garments torn. As much blood stained her skin and clothes as either of theirs. The crossbow bolt standing out from her thigh seemed to be the worst of her injuries, but the rest certainly added up to as much again. His back was broken, she said, gesturing to the horse at her feet. Mine's well, I think, but the last I saw of him he was running fit to win the wreath of Megairel. I always thought he had a turn of speed. Lioness, she shrugged and winced. Elaine, Lioness was dead when I found her. I'm sorry. We are alive, Elaine said firmly. And that is what counts. She would weep for Lioness later. The smoke above the hilltop was not thick, but it rose over a wide area. I want to see exactly what it was that I did. It took clinging to one another for all three of them to stand, and laboring up the hillside was an effort of panting and groans, even from Avienda. They sounded as though they had been thrashed within an inch of their lives, which Elaine supposed they had been, and looked as though they had wallowed in a butcher's shambles. Avienda still carried the Angreal tight in her fist, but even if she or Elaine had possessed more than their small talent with healing, neither could have managed to embrace the source, much less channel. At the top of the hill they stood leaning on each other and stared at devastation. Fire ringed the meadow, but the heart of it was blackened, smoldering and swept clear even of boulders. Half the trees on the surrounding slopes were broken or leaning away from the meadow. Hawks began to appear, riding the hot air rising from the fire. Hawks often hunted so, looking for small animals chased into the open by the flames. Of the Shanshan there was no sign. Elaine wished there were bodies, so she could be certain they were all dead especially all of the Suldam. Gazing down at the burned, smoking ground, though, she was suddenly glad there was no evidence. It had been a terrible way to die. The light have mercy on their souls, she thought, on all of their souls. Well, she said aloud, I did not do as well as you, Avienda, but I suppose it worked out for the best, considering. I will try to do better next time. Avienda glanced at her sideways. 
there was a gash on her cheek, and another across her forehead, as well as a long one laying open her scalp. You did much better than I for a first try. I was given a simple knot tied in a flow of wind the first time. It took me fifty tries to unweave even that without having a clap of thunder in my face or a blow that made my ears ring. I suppose I should have started with something simpler, Elaine said. I have a habit of leaping in over my head. Over her head? She had leaped before looking to see whether there was water. She stifled a chuckle, but not before it sent a stab through her side. So instead of chuckling, she moaned through her teeth. She thought some of them might be loose. At least we found a new weapon. Perhaps I should not be happy about that, but with the Shanchan back again I am. You do not understand, Elaine. Avienda gestured toward the center of the meadow where the gateway had been. That could have been no more than a flash of light, or even less. You cannot tell until it happens. Is a flash of light worth the risk of burning out yourself and every woman closer to you than a hundred paces or more? Elaine stared at her. She had stayed, knowing that? To risk your life was one thing, but to risk losing the ability to channel. I want us to adopt each other as first sisters, Avienda, as soon as we can find wise ones. What they were to do about Rand she could not imagine. The very idea that they would both marry him, and men, too, was worse than ridiculous. But of this she was sure. I don't need to know any more about you. I want to be your sister. Gently she kissed Avienda's blood-stained cheek. She had only thought Avienda blushed fiercely before. Even Aiel lovers did not kiss where anyone could see. Fiery sunsets paled beside Avienda's face. I want you for my sister, too, she mumbled, swallowing hard, and eyeing Brigitta, who was pretending to ignore them. She leaned over and quickly pressed her lips to Elaine's cheek. Elaine loved her as much for that gesture as for the rest. Brigitta had been gazing behind them over her shoulder, and perhaps she had not been pretending after all because she suddenly said, Someone's coming, Lan and Nynaeve, unless I miss my guess. Awkwardly they turned hobbling and stumbling and groaning. It seemed quite ludicrous. Heroes in stories never got hurt so they could barely stand. In the distance to the north, two riders appeared briefly through the trees, briefly but long enough to make out a tall man on a tall horse galloping hard and a woman on a shorter animal running just as hard at his side. Gingerly, the three of them sat down to wait. That was another thing heroes in stories never did, Elaine thought with a sigh. She hoped she could be a queen to make her mother proud, but it was clear that she would never make a hero. Chulane moved the reins slightly, and Sagani banked smoothly, turning on a ribbed wing. He was a well-trained rockin, swift and agile, her favorite, though she had to share flying him. There were always more Morat rockin than rockin, a fact of life. Down in the farm below, balls of fire were leaping out of the air, apparently, scattering in every direction. She tried to pay no attention. Her job was to watch for trouble approaching from the area around the farm. At least the smoke had stopped rising from where Tawan and Maku had died in the olive grove. A thousand paces above the ground, she had a very long view. All the other rockin' were off scouting the countryside. Any woman who ran would be marked for checking— to see whether she was one of those who had caused all the excitement, though truth for sure, anyone in these lands who saw a rockin' in the air likely would run. All Chulane had to do was watch for approaching trouble here. She wished she did not feel an itch between her shoulder blades. It always meant trouble was on the way. The wind of Sagani's flight was not bad at this speed, but she drew the drawstring of her waxed linen hood tighter under her chin— tested the leather safety straps that held her in the saddle, adjusted her crystal goggles, snugged her gauntlets. Over a hundred fists of heaven were on the ground already, and more importantly, six Suldam with Damani and another dozen carrying shoulder bags full of spare idam. The second flight would be lifting from the hills to the south with reinforcements. Better if more had come in the first strike, but there were few enough to rockin' with the high lean— 
and strong rumor had it that many of those had been given the task of ferrying the High Lady Surolf and her entire entourage down from Amadisia. Bad to think ill of the blood, yet she wished more Torakan had been sent to Ebudar. No Morat Rakan could think well of the huge, ungainly Torakan, fit only to carry burdens, but they could have put more fists of heaven on the ground faster, more Suldam. Rumor says there are hundreds of Marat Domani down there, Elias said loudly against her back. In the sky you had to speak loudly over the rush of wind. Do you know what I'm going to do with my share of the taking gold? Buy an inn. This Ebudar looks a likely place, what I saw of it. Maybe I'll even find a husband. Have children. What do you think of that? Shulane grinned behind her windscarf. Every flyer talked of buying an inn, or a tavern, sometimes a farm. Yet who could leave the sky? She patted the base of Sagani's long, leathery neck. Every woman flyer, three and four were women, talked of a husband and children, but children meant an end to flying, too. More women left the fists of heaven in a month than left the sky in half a year. I think you should keep your eyes open, she said. But there was no harm in a little talk. She could have seen a child move in the olive groves below, much more anything that might threaten fists of heaven. The most lightly armored of soldiers, they were about as hard as the death watch guard. Some said harder. I'll use my share to buy a Domani and hire a Suldam. If there were half as many Marat Domani down there as rumor claimed, her share would buy two Domani, three. A Domani trained to make skylights. When I leave the sky, I'll be as rich as one of the blood. They had something called fireworks here. She'd seen some fellows vainly trying to interest the blood in Tanchico. But who would watch such a pitiful thing compared to the skylights? Those fellows had been bundled out and dumped in the road outside the city. The farm! Elias shouted, and suddenly something hit Sagani hard, harder than the worst storm gust Chulain had ever felt, tumbling him wing over wing. Down the rock and plunged, screaming his raucous cry, spinning so fast that Chulain was pulled tight against her safety straps. She left her hands on her thighs tensed on the reins, but still. Sagani had to pull out of this himself. Any twitch on the reins would only hinder him. Rolling like a gambling wheel, they fell. Morat Rakan were taught not to watch the ground if a Rakan fell, whatever the reason, but she could not help estimating her height every time a whip-like tumble brought the ground into sight. Eight hundred paces. Six hundred. Four. Two. The light illumine her soul and the infinite mercy of the Creator protect her from... With a snap of his broad wings that jerked her sideways and rattled her teeth, Sagani leveled out, the tips of his pinions brushing treetops as they swept down. With a calmness born of hard training, she checked the motion of his wings for strain. Nothing, but she would have a Dur Murat Rakan examine him thoroughly anyway. A tiny thing that might slip by her eyes would not escape a master. It seems we've escaped the Lady of the Shadows one more time, Elia. Turning to look over her shoulder, she let her words tail off. A length of broken safety strap trailed back from the empty seat behind her. Every flyer knew that the lady waited at the bottom of the long fall, but knowing never made seeing easier. Offering a quick prayer for the dead, she firmly pushed herself back to duty and urged Sagani to climb, a slow, spiraling climb in case of some hidden strain, but as quick as she thought safe. Maybe a little quicker than safe. Smoke rising from beyond the knobby hill ahead made her frown, but what she saw as she cleared the crest dried her mouth. Her hands stilled on the reins, and Sagani continued to climb on powerful sweeps of his wings. The farm was gone. Foundations scoured clean of the white buildings that had stood on them, the big structures built into a hillside smashed heaps of rubble. Gone. Everything was blackened and burned. Fire raged through the undergrowth on the slopes and made fans a hundred paces long into the olive groves and the forest, stretching from the spaces between the hills. Beyond lay broken trees for another hundred or more, all leaning away from the farm. She'd never seen anything like it. Nothing could be alive down there. Nothing could have lived through that. 
whatever it had been. Quickly she came to herself and turned Sagani south. In the distance she could make out Torakan, each one crowded with a dozen fists of heaven over this short distance. Fists of heaven and Suldam coming too late. She began composing her report in her head. There was certainly no one else to make one. Everyone said this was a land full of Marat Damani waiting to be collared, but with this new weapon, these women who called themselves Aes Sedai were a true danger. Something had to be done about them, something decisive. Perhaps if the High Lady Suroth was on her way to Ebudar, she would see the need, too. Chapter 7 A Goat Pen the gale down in sky was cloudless, the forested hills hammered by a fierce morning sun. Even short of midday the land sweltered. Pines and leatherleaf were yellowing in the drought, and others parents suspected also were evergreens. Not a whisper of air stirred. Sweat dripped down his face, ran into his short beard. His curly hair was matting on his head. He thought he heard thunder somewhere to the west, but he had almost stopped believing it would ever rain again. You hammered the iron that lay on your anvil, instead of daydreaming about working silver. From the vantage of his sparsely treed ridge, he studied the walled town of Bethal through a brass-bound looking-glass. Even his eyes could use help over this distance. It was a good-sized town of slate-roofed buildings with half a dozen tall stone structures that might have been minor nobles' palaces or the homes of well-to-do merchants. He could not make out the scarlet banner hanging limply atop the tallest tower of the largest palace, the only flag in sight, but he knew who it belonged to. Aleandra Maritha Kegarin, queen of Gildan, far from her capital in Jahana. The town gates stood open, with a good twenty guards at each, yet no one came out, and the roads he could see were empty, except for a lone rider galloping hard toward Bethal from the north. The soldiers were on edge, shifting pikes or bows at sight of the horseman as though he waved a blood-dripping sword. More soldiers on watch crowded the wall towers or marched the walls between. Plenty of knocked arrows up there, too, and raised crossbows. Plenty of fear. A storm had swept over this part of Gialdan. It still did. The prophet's bands created chaos, bandits took advantage, and white cloaks, raiding across the border from Amadisia, might easily strike this far. A few scattered columns of smoke farther south probably marked burning farms. White cloak work or the prophets. Bandits seldom bothered with burning, and the other two left little for them in any case. Adding to the jumble, rumor in every village he had passed the last few days said that Amador had fallen to the prophet or Terabonners, or I Sedai, depending on who told the tale. Some claimed Pedron Nile himself was dead in the fighting to defend the city. All in all, reason enough for a queen to be concerned for her own safety. Or the soldiers could be down there because of him. Despite his best efforts, his passage south had hardly gone unnoticed. He scratched his beard, considering. A pity the wolves in the surrounding hills could not tell him anything, but they seldom paid heed to men's doings except to stay clear of them and since Dumai's wells he had not felt right in asking any more of them, then he absolutely had to. It might be best, after all, if he rode in alone with just a few of the Two Rivers men. He often thought Fail could read his mind, usually when he least wanted her to, and she proved it now, healing her night-black mare Swallow close to his dun. Her narrow-skirted riding dress was nearly as dark as the mare, yet she seemed to be taking the heat better than he. She smelled faintly of herbal soap and clean perspiration, of herself, of determination. Her tilted eyes were very determined, and with her bold nose she was very much her namesake falcon. "'I would not like to see holes in that fine blue coat, husband,' she said softly, for his ears alone. "'And those fellows look as if they might just shoot at a group of strange men before asking who they are. "'Besides,' How will you reach Aleandra without announcing your name to the world? This must be done quietly, remember? She did not say that she should be the one to go, that the gate guards would take a woman alone for a refugee from the troubles, that she could reach the queen using her mother's name without exciting too much comment, but she did not need to. He had had all that and more from her every night since entering Gieldan. 
He was here in part because of Aliandra's cautious letter to Rand, offering support, allegiance. Her desire for secrecy had been paramount in any case. Perrin doubted that even Aram, sitting his leggy gray a few paces behind them, could have heard a word Fayil said. Yet before she finished speaking, Verlaine brought her white mare up on his other side, sweat glistening on her cheeks. She also smelled determined, through a cloud of rose perfume. To him it seemed a cloud. For a wonder, her green riding dress showed no more flesh than it had to. Verlaine's two companions stayed back, though Anura, her Aes Sedai advisor, studied him with an unreadable expression from beneath her cap of thin, shoulder-long beaded braids. Not him and the two women at his sides, him in particular. No sweat there. He wished he were close enough to smell the beak-nosed gray sister. Unlike the other Aes Sedai, she had made no promises to anyone, for whatever those promises were worth. Lord Gallien, commander of Berlane's winged guards, was seemingly busy examining Bethel through a looking-glass raised to his one eye, and fiddling with his reins in a way Perrin had come to know meant that he was deep in calculations, probably how to take Bethel by force. Gallien always saw the worst possibility first. I still think I should be the one to approach Aleandra, Berlane said. This, too, Perrin had heard every day. It is why I came, after all. That was one of the reasons. Anura will be granted an audience at once and take me in with none the wiser save Aleandra. A second wonder. There had not been a hint of flirtation in her voice. She seemed to be paying as much attention to smoothing her red leather gloves as to him. Which one? The trouble was, he did not want to choose either. Sionid, the second Aes Sedai who had come to the ridgeline, stood beside her bay gelding a little way off near a tall, drought-withered blackwood, looking not at Bethal, but the sky. The two pale-eyed wise ones with her made a sharp contrast, faces sun-dark to her pale complexion, fair-haired to her dark, tall to her short, not to mention their dark skirts and white blouses contrasting to her fine blue wool. Necklaces and bracelets of gold and silver and ivory draped Adara and Navarin, while Theonid wore only her great serpent ring— they were young to her ageless. The wise ones matched the green sister for self-possession, though. And they were studying the sky, too. Do you see something? Perrin asked, putting off the decision. We see the sky, Perrin Ebara, Edara said calmly, her jewelry making a soft clatter as she adjusted the dark shawl loop at her elbows. The heat seemed to touch the Aiel as little as it did the Aes Sedai. If we saw more, we would tell you. He hoped they would. He thought they would. At least, if it was something they believed Grady and Neald might see, too. The two Ashaman would not keep it secret. He wished they were there instead of back in the camp. More than half a week ago now, a lace of the one power streaking high across the sky had created quite a stir among the Aes Sedai and Wise Ones. And with Grady and Neald which fact had made a bigger stir still, as close to panic as any Aes Sedai was likely to come. Ashaman, Aes Sedai, and wise ones all claimed they could still feel the power faintly in the air, long after that bar of lace vanished, but nobody knew what it meant. Neild said it made him think of wind, though he could not tell why. No one would voice more of an opinion than that, yet if both the male and female halves of the power were visible, it had to be the forsaken at work and on a huge scale. Wondering what they were up to, had kept Perrin awake late most nights since. In spite of himself, he glanced to the sky, and saw nothing, of course, except a pair of pigeons. Abruptly a hawk plummeted into his sight, and one of the pigeons was gone in a spray of feathers. The other winged on frantically toward Bethal. "'Have you reached a decision, Perrin Ebara?' Navarin asked, a touch sharply. The green-eyed wise one appeared even younger than Adara, perhaps no older than he was, and she did not quite have the blue-eyed woman's serenity. Her shawl slid down her arms as she planted hands on hips, and he half expected her to shake a finger at him, or a fist. She reminded him of Nynaeve, though they surely looked nothing alike. Navarin would have made Nynaeve look plump. "'What use our advice if you will not listen?' she demanded. 
What use? Fael and Berylane sat straight in their saddles, both as proud as they could be, both smelling expectant and uncertain at the same time, and irritated at being uncertain, neither like that one speck. Seonad was too far to send her scent, but compressed lips gave her mood well enough. Idara's command not to speak unless spoken to infuriated her. Still, she certainly wanted him to take the wise one's counsel. She stared at him intently, as though the pressure of her eyes could push him the way they wanted him to go. In truth, he wanted to choose her, yet he hesitated. How far did her oath of fealty to Rand truly hold? Further than he would have believed by the evidence seen so far, but still, how far could he trust an eye said I? The arrival of Seonid's two warders spared him for another few minutes. They rode up together, though they had gone out separately, keeping their horses well back into the trees along the ridge line, so they would not be seen from the town. Furin was a tyrant, nearly as dark as good soil, with grey streaking his curly black hair, while Terrell, a Mirandian, was twenty years younger, with dark reddish hair, curled mustaches, and eyes bluer than Adara's, yet they were stamped from the same mold, tall and lean and hard. They dismounted smoothly, cloaks shifting colors and vanishing in a queasy-making way, and made their reports to Seonid, deliberately ignoring the wise ones. And Perrin. It's worse than back north, Buren said disgustedly. A few drops of sweat beaded on his forehead, but neither man appeared much affected by the heat. The local nobles are shut up in their manors or the town, and the queen's soldiers keep inside the town walls. They've abandoned the countryside to the prophet's men. And the bandits. Though those seem scarce around here. The prophet's people are all over. I think Alejandro will be happy to see you. Rabble, Terrell snorted, slapping his reins on his palm. I never saw more than fifteen or twenty in one place, armed with pitchforks and boar spears mainly. Ragged as beggars they were. Fit for scaring farmers, to be sure. But you'd think the Lord to be rooting them out and hanging them in bunches. The Queen will kiss your hand to see a sister. Sayon had opened her mouth, then glanced up at Adara, who nodded. If anything, gaining permission to speak tightened the Green's mouth more. Her tone was mild as butter, though. There is no more reason to put off your decision, Lord Ebara. She emphasized that title a bit, knowing exactly how much right he had to it. Your wife can claim a great house, and Verlaine is a ruler. Yet Saldean houses count little here, and Mayenne is the smallest of nations. And I said I for an emissary will put the weight of the White Tower behind you in Alejandra's eyes. Perhaps recalling that Anura would do for that as well as she, she hurried on. Besides, I have been in Gildan before and my name is well known. Alejandro will not only receive me immediately, she will listen to what I say. Navarin and I will go with her, Idara said, and Navarin added, We will make sure she says nothing she should not. Seon had ground her teeth audibly to Perrin's ears, and busied herself smoothing her divided skirts, eyes carefully down. Anura made a sound, very nearly a grunt, and turned her head from the sight. She herself stayed away from the wise ones, and did not like seeing the other sisters with them. Perrin wanted to groan. Sending the green would lift him off a spike, yet the wise ones trusted I said I less than he did, and kept Seonid and Missouri on short leashes. There had been tales about Aiel in the villages recently, too. None of those folk had ever seen an Aiel, but rumors about the Aiel following the dragon reborn drifted in the air. Half of Gildan was sure there were Aiel just a day or two away, and each story was stranger and more horrible than the last. Aleandra might be too frightened to let him near her once she saw a pair of Aiel women telling an Aes Sedai when to hop. And Sionid was hopping, however much she ground her teeth. Well, he was not about to risk Fael without more assurance of her greeting than a vaguely worded letter received months ago. That spike dug deeper, right between his shoulder blades, yet he had no choice at all. A small party will get through those gates easier than a large, he said finally, stuffing the looking glass into his saddlebags. It would set fewer tongues wagging as well. That means just you and Anura, Berylane, and maybe Lord Gallien. 
Likely they'll take him for Anura's warder. Berylaine chortled in delight, leaning to clasp his arm with both hands. She did not leave it at that, of course. Her fingers squeezed caressingly, and she flashed a heated smile of promise, then straightened before he could move, her face suddenly innocent as a babe's. Expressionless, Fayil focused on pulling her gray riding gloves snug. By her scent, she had not noticed Berylaine's smile. She hid her disappointment well. I'm sorry, Fayil, he said, but... Outrage flared in the smell of her like thorns. I am certain you have matters to discuss with the first before she goes, husband, she said calmly. Her tilted eyes were pure serenity, her scent sand burrs. Best you see to her now. Pulling Swallow around, Fahil walked the mare over to a plainly fuming Sayonid, and the tight-faced wise ones, but she did not dismount or speak to them. Instead, she frowned down at Bethal, a falcon staring from her eyrie. Heron realized he was feeling at his nose and pulled his hand down. There was no blood, of course. His nose only felt as if there should be. Berylaine needed no last-minute instructions. The first of Mayenne and her gray advisor were all impatience to be off, all certainty they knew what to say and do. Yet Perrin stressed caution anyway, and emphasized that Berylaine, and only Berylaine, was to speak with Aleandra. Anura gave him one of those cool Aes Sedai looks and nodded which might have been agreement, or might not. He doubted he could get more out of her with a pry bar. Berlane's lips curled in amusement, though she agreed with everything he said. Or said she did. He expected she would say anything to get what she wanted, and those smiles in all the wrong places bothered him. Galien had put his looking-glass away, but he was still playing with his reins, no doubt calculating how to carve a way out of Bethal for the two women. Perrin wanted to growl. He watched them ride down to the road with worry. The message Berylaine carried was simple. Rand understood Aleandra's caution, but if she wanted his protection, she must be willing to announce support for him openly. That protection would come, soldiers in Ashaman to make it plain to everyone, and even Rand himself, if need be, once she agreed to make the announcement. Berylaine had no reason to change the message a hair, despite her smiles. He thought they might be another way of flirting. But Anura? I said I did what they did, and the light alone knew why half the time. He wished he knew some way to reach Aleandra without using a sister or rousing talk. Or risking Fa'il. The three riders reached the gates with Anura in the lead, and guards quickly raised pikes, lowered bows and crossbows, no doubt as soon as she named herself I said I. Not many people had the nerve to challenge that particular claim. There was barely a pause before she was leading the way into the town. In fact, the soldiers seemed eager to hurry them through, out of sight of anyone watching from the hills. Some peered at the distant heights, and Perrin did not need to smell them to sense their unease over who might be hidden up there, who might improbably have recognized a sister. Turning north toward their camp, Perrin led the way along the ridge until they were out of sight from Bethal's towers, then slanted down to the hard-packed road. Scattered farms lined the road, thatch-roofed houses and long, narrow barns, withered pastures and stubbled fields and high-walled stone goat pens. But there was little livestock to be seen and fewer people. Those few watched the riders warily, geese-watching foxes, stopping chores where they stood until the horses passed on. Aram kept as close an eye on them in return, sometimes fingering the sword hilt rising above his shoulder, perhaps wishing to find more than farm folk. Despite his green-striped coat, little Tinker remained in him. Idara and Navarin walked beside Stepper, seemingly out for a stroll, yet keeping pace easily despite their bulky skirts. Sion had healed them on her gelding, Furin and Terrell at her own back. The pale-cheeked green pretended that she simply wanted to ride a careful two paces behind the wise ones, but the men scowled openly. Warders often had a greater care for their Aes Sedai's dignity than the sister did herself, and Aes Sedai had enough for queens. Fayil kept Swallow on the far side of the Ayul women, riding in silence, apparently studying the drought-scarred landscape. Slim and graceful, she made Perrin feel a little clumsy at the best of times. She was Quicksilver, and he loved it in her usually, but... 
A slight breath of air had begun to stir, enough to keep her scent mingled with the rest. He knew he should be thinking about Aleandra and what her answer would be, or better still, the prophet, and how to find him once Aleandra replied. However she did, but he could not find room in his head. He had expected Fayil to be angry when he chose Berylane, for all that Rand supposedly had sent her for the purpose. Fayil knew he did not want to send her into danger, into any risk of danger, a fact she disliked more than she did Berylane. Yet her scent had been soft as a summer morning— until he tried to apologize. Well, apologies usually stoked her anger, if she already was angry, except when they melted her temper, anyway. But she had not been angry. Without Berylane, everything ran as smooth as silk satin between them, most of the time. But explanations that he did nothing to encourage the woman, far from it, earned only a curt, of course you don't, in tones that called him a fool for bringing it up. But she still grew angry, with him, every time Berylane smiled at him or found an excuse to touch him, no matter how brusquely he put her off, and the light knew he did that. Short of tying her up, he did not know what more he could do to discourage her. Ginger attempts to find out from Fail what he was doing wrong received a light. Why do you think you've done anything? Or a not-so-light, what do you think you've done? Or a flat, I do not want to talk about it. He was doing something wrong but he could not puzzle out what. He had to, though. Nothing was more important than Fail. Nothing. Lord Perrin? Aram's excited voice cut into his brown study. Don't call me that, he muttered, following the direction of the man's pointing finger to yet another abandoned farm some distance ahead, where fire had taken the roof from house and barn. Only rough stone walls stood. An abandoned farm, but not deserted. Angry shouts rose up there. A dozen or more rough-clad fellows carrying spears and pitchforks were trying to force their way over the chest-high stone wall of a goat pen, while a handful of men within tried to keep them out. Several horses ran loose inside, frightened at the noise and dodging about, and there were three women mounted. They were not simply waiting to see how it would all turn out, though. One of the women appeared to be hurling rocks, and even as he looked, another dashed close to the wall, to lash out with a long cudgel, while the third reared her horse and a tall fellow toppled back off the wall to get clear of flashing hooves. But there were too many attackers, too much wall to defend. I advise you to ride wide, Seon had said. Adara and Navarin turned grim stares on her, but she plowed on, hurry overwhelming her matter-of-fact tone. Those are surely the prophet's men, and killing his people is a bad way to begin. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands may die if you fail with him. Is it worth risking that to save a handful? Perrin did not intend to kill anyone if he could help it, but he did not intend to look the other way, either. He wasted no time in explanations, though. Can you frighten them? he asked Adara. Just frighten? He remembered all too well what the wise ones had done at Demise Wells. And the Ashaman. Maybe as well Grady and Neald were not there. Perhaps, Edara replied, studying the crowd around the pen. She half shook her head, shrugged a fraction. Perhaps. That would have to be good enough. Aram, Furin, Terrell, he snapped, with me. He dug in his heels, and as Stepper leaped forward, he was relieved to see the warders following closely. Four men charging made a better show than two. He kept his hands on the reins, away from his axe. He was not so pleased when Fail galloped Swallow up alongside him. He opened his mouth, and she arched an eyebrow at him. Her black hair was beautiful, streaming in the wind of their rush. She was beautiful. An arched eyebrow? No more. He changed what he had been about to say. Guard my back, he told her. Smiling, she produced a dagger from somewhere. With all the blades she carried hidden away, sometimes he wondered how he missed being stabbed just trying to hug her. As soon as she looked ahead again, he gestured frantically to Aram, trying to keep the motion where she could not see. Aram nodded, but he was leaning forward, sword bared, ready to skewer the first of the prophet's folk he reached. Perrin hoped the man understood he was to guard Fahil's back, and the rest of her, if they actually came to grips with those fellows. None of the ruffians had noticed them yet. Perrin shouted, but they seemed not to hear over their own yelling. A man in a coat too big for him managed to scramble atop the wall, and two others appeared about to get over. If the wise ones were going to do anything, it was past. 
a thunderclap nearly over their heads almost deafened Perrin, a mountainous crack that made Stepper stumble before regaining his pace. The attackers certainly noticed that, staggering and looking around wildly, some clapping hands over their ears. The man on the wall overbalanced and fell off outside. He leaped up immediately, though, angrily gesturing to the enclosure, and some of his companions leaped back at it. Others saw Perrin then, and pointed, their mouths working, but still no one ran. A few hefted weapons. Suddenly a horizontal wheel of fire appeared above the goat pen, as wide as a man was tall, flinging off sputtering tufts of flame as it spun with a moan that rose and fell, mournful groan to keening wail and back. The rough-clad men broke in every direction like scattering quail. For a moment longer, the man in the too-big coat waved his arms and shouted at them, then with a last glance at the fiery wheel, he too darted away. Theron almost laughed. He would not have to kill anyone, and he would not have to worry about Fael getting a pitchfork through her ribs. Apparently the people in the pen were as frightened as those outside, one of them at least. The woman who had reared her horse at the attackers slipped open the gate and kicked her mount to an awkward gallop, up the road, away from Perrin and the others. Wait, Perrin shouted. We won't harm you. Whether she heard or not, she kept whipping her reins. A bundle tied behind her saddle bounced wildly. Those men might be running as hard as they could now, but if she went off by herself, even two or three could do her injury. Lying flat on Stepper's neck, Perrin dug in his heels, and the dun shot forward like an arrow. He was a big man, yet Stepper had earned his name for more than prancing feet. Besides, by its lumbering run, the woman's mount was hardly fit for a saddle. With every stride, Stepper closed the gap, nearer, nearer, until Perrin was able to reach out and seize the other horse's bridle. Up close, her hammer-nosed bay was little better than crowbait, lathered and worn out more than the short run could account for. Slowly, he drew both horses to a halt. Forgive me if I frightened you, mistress, he said. Truly, I mean you no harm. For the second time that day, an apology did not get the response he expected. Angry blue eyes glared at him from a face surrounded by long red-gold curls, a face as regal as any queen's for all that it was plastered with sweat and dust. Her dress was plain wool, travel-stained, and as dusty as her cheeks, but her face was furious as well as queenly. I do not need, she began in chilled tones, trying to jerk her horse free, then cut off as another of the women, white-haired and bony, galloped up on a slab-sided brown mare in worse condition than the bay. They had been riding hard for some time, these folk. The older woman was just as worn and dust-covered as the younger. She alternated between beaming at Perrin and scowling at the woman whose bridle he still held. Thank you, my lord. Her voice... Thin but strong gave a hitch, as she noticed his eyes, but golden-yellow eyes on a man slowed her only an instant. Not a woman phased by much. She still carried the stout stick she had been using for a weapon. A most timely rescue. Magden, whatever were you thinking, you could have gotten yourself killed. And the rest of us, too. She's a headstrong girl, my lord, always leaping before she looks. Remember, child... A fool abandons friends and gives up silver for shiny brass. We do thank you, my lord, and Megden will too, when she comes to her senses. Megden, a good ten years older than Perrin, could only be called a girl in comparison to the older woman, but despite weary grimaces that matched her scent, frustration tinged with anger, she accepted the tirade, only pulling once more in a half-hearted attempt to free her horse, then giving up. Letting her hands rest on her cantle, she frowned at Perrin accusingly, then blinked. The yellow eyes again. Yet despite that strangeness, she still did not smell afraid. The old woman did, but Perrin did not think it was of him. Another of Megden's companions, an unshaven man mounted on yet another bedraggled horse, this a knob-kneed gray, approached while the old woman was talking, but kept back. He was tall, as tall as Perrin, if not nearly so wide, in a travel-worn dark coat with a sword belted over. Like the women, he had a bundle tied on behind his saddle. That tiny breeze swirled to bring Perrin his scent. He was not afraid. He was wary. And if the way he looked at Megden was any guide, it was she he was wary of. 
Maybe this was not so simple as rescuing travelers from a gang of ruffians after all. Perhaps you should all come to my camp, Perrin said, finally releasing the bridle. You'll be safe from... brigands, there. He half expected Megden to make a break for the nearest tree line, but she turned her horse with his, back toward the goat pen. She smelled... resigned. Even so, she said... I thank you for the offer, but I, we, must continue our journey. We will go on, Linny, she added firmly, and the older woman frowned at her so sternly that he wondered whether they were mother and daughter despite her use of the woman's name. They certainly looked nothing alike. Linny was narrow-faced and parchment-skinned, all sinew, while Megden might be beautiful under that dust, if a man liked fair hair. Farron glanced over his shoulder at the man trailing after, a hard-looking fellow in need of a razor. Perhaps he liked fair hair. Perhaps he liked it too much. Men had made trouble for themselves as well as others for that reason before this. Ahead, Fahil was sitting swallow and peering over the wall of the pen at the people inside. Perhaps one of them had been hurt. Sayonid and the wise ones were nowhere in sight. Aram had understood, apparently. He was close to Fahil, though looking impatiently toward Perrin. The danger was clearly past, though. Before Perrin was halfway to the goat pen, Terrell appeared with a narrow-eyed, stubble-cheeked man stumbling along beside his roan, the collar of his coat gripped in the warder's fist. I thought we should catch one of them, Terrell said with a hard grin. Always best to hear both sides. Whatever you thought you saw, my old Da always said. Perrin was surprised. He had thought Terrell could not think beyond the end of his sword. Even hiked up as it was, the stubble-cheeked fellow's frayed coat was plainly too big for him. Perrin doubted anyone else had been able to see well enough at the distance, but he recognized that thrusting nose, too. This man had been the last to run, and he was not cowed now, either. His sneer took them all in. "'You're all in deep muck for this,' he rasped. "'We was doing the prophet's bidding, we was.' The prophet says if a man bothers a woman as doesn't want him, he dies. This lot was chasing after her. He jerked his chin at Magden. And she was running hard. The prophet will have your ears for this. He spat for emphasis. That is ridiculous, Magden announced in a clear voice. These people are my friends. This man completely misunderstood what he saw. Perrin nodded, and if she thought he was agreeing with her, all well and good. But putting what this fellow said alongside what Linny had, not simple at all. Fahil and the others joined them, followed by the rest of Megden's traveling companions, three more men, and another woman, all leading worn-down horses with few miles left in them. Not that they had been prime horse flesh in some years, if ever. A finer collection of buck knees, bow backs, spavins, and swaybacks Perrin could not recall. As always, his gaze went first to Fahil. His nostrils strained for her scent, but Seonid snagged his eyes. Slumped in her saddle, flushing scarlet, she wore a sullen glower, and her face looked odd, her cheeks puffed out and her mouth not quite closed. There was something a bit of red and blue. Perrin blinked. Unless he was seeing things, she had a wadded-up scarf stuffed into her mouth. Apparently, when wise ones told an apprentice to be quiet... Even an Aes Sedai apprentice, they meant it. He was not the only one with sharp eyes. Megden's mouth fell open when she saw Seonid, and she gave him a long, considering look as if he were responsible for the scarf. So she knew an Aes Sedai on sight, did she? Uncommon for the countrywoman she appeared. She did not sound one, though. Buren, riding behind Seonid, wore a thunderhead for a face, but it was Terrell who made everything even less simple by tossing something to the ground. I found this behind him, he said, where he might have dropped it, running. At first, Perrin did not know what he was looking at, a long loop of rawhide thickly strung with what appeared to be tags of shriveled leather. Then he did know, and his teeth bared in a snarl. The prophet would have our ears, you said. The stubble-cheeked man stopped gaping at Seonid and licked his lips. That—that that was Harry's work, he protested. Harry's a mean one. 
He likes to keep count, take trophies, and he, uh, uh... Shrugging in his captive coat, he sank in on himself like a cornered dog. You can't tie that to me. The prophet will hang you if you touch me. He's hanged nobles before, fine lords and ladies. I walk in the light of the blessed Lord Dragon. Perrin walked separate to the man, careful to keep the dun's hooves clear of the thing on the ground. He wanted nothing less than to have the fellow's scent in his nose, but he bent down, putting his face closer. Sour sweat warred with fear, panic, a tinge of anger. A pity he could not sniff out guilt. Might have dropped was not had dropped. Close-set eyes widened and the man pressed back against Terrell's gelding. Yellow eyes had their uses. If I could tie that to you, you'd hang from the nearest tree, he growled. The fellow blinked, began to brighten as he understood what that meant, but Perrin gave him no time to regain his bluster. I am Perrin Ebarra, and your precious Lord Dragon sent me here. You spread the word. He sent me, and if I find a man with trophies, he hangs. And if I find a man burning a farm, he hangs. If one of you looks at me cross-eyed, he hangs. And you can tell Masima I said so, too. Disgusted, Perrin straightened. Let him go, Terrell. If he isn't out of my sight in two shakes... Terrell's hand opened, and the fellow dashed off at a dead run for the nearest trees, never so much as glancing back. Part of Perrin's disgust was for himself. Threatening. If one of them looked at him cross-eyed... But if the nameless man had not cut off ears himself, he had watched it and done nothing. Fail was smiling, pride shining through the sweat on her face. Her look washed away some of Perrin's revulsion. He would walk barefoot through fire for that look. Not everyone approved, of course. Seonid's eyes were squeezed shut, and her gloved fists quivered on her reins, as though she desperately wanted to yank that scarf from her mouth and tell him what she thought. He could guess, anyway. Edara and Navarin had gathered their shawls around them and were eyeing him darkly. Oh, yes, he could guess. I thought it was to be all secrecy, Terrell said casually, watching the stubble-cheeked man run. I thought Masima wasn't to know you were here till you spoke in his pink ear. That had been the plan. Rand had suggested it as a precaution, Seonid and Missouri had insisted on it every chance they got. After all, prophet of the Lord Dragon or no, Masima might not want to come face to face with someone Rand sent, considering the things he was said to have allowed. Those ears were not the worst, if the tenth part of rumor was to be believed. Adara and the other wise ones saw Masima as a possible enemy, to be ambushed before he could set his own trap. I'm supposed to stop that. Perrin said, gesturing angrily to the rawhide string on the ground. He had heard the rumors and done nothing. Now he had seen. I might as well start now. And if Masima decided he was an enemy, how many thousands followed the prophet, out of belief or fear? It did not matter. It stops, Terrell. It stops! The Mirandian nodded slowly, eyeing Perrin as though seeing him for the first time. My lord Perrin, Megden said. He had forgotten all about her and her friends. The others had gathered with her a little way off, most still afoot. There were three men aside from the fellow who had followed Megden, and two of those were hiding behind their horses. Linny appeared the wariest of all, eyes focused on him worriedly. She had her horse close to Megden's and seemed ready to seize the bridle herself. Not to stop the younger woman bolting, but to bolt herself and take Megden with her. Megden herself appeared completely at ease, but she also studied Perrin. Little wonder, after all that talk of the prophet and the dragon reborn, on top of his eyes. Not to mention an eye said I gagged. He expected her to say that they wanted to go now, immediately. But what she said instead was... We will accept your kind offer. A day or two resting in your camp might be just the thing. As you say, Mistress Magden, he said slowly. 
Masking his surprise was difficult, especially since he had just recognized the two men trying to keep their horses between them and him. To Viren work to bring them here? A strange twist in any case. It might be just the thing at that. Chapter 8 A Simple Country Woman The camp lay about a league farther on, well back from the road among low wooded hills, just beyond a stream that was ten paces width of stones and only five of water, never deeper than a man's knees. Tiny green and silver fish darted away from the horse's hooves. Casual passers-by were unlikely to come on them here. The nearest inhabited farm was over a mile away, and Perrin had checked personally to make sure those folk took their animals to water elsewhere. He truly had been trying to avoid notice as much as possible, traveling by back roads and the smallest country paths when they could not keep to the forests. A futile effort, really. The horses could be pastured wherever there was grass, but they required at least some grain, and even a small army had to buy food, and a lot of it. Every man needed four pounds a day, in flour and beans and meat. Rumors must have been floating all over Giladon, though with luck no one suspected who they were. Perrin grimaced. Perhaps they had not, until he went and opened his mouth. Still, he would have done nothing differently. It was three camps, really, close to one another and none far from the stream. They traveled together, all following him, obeying him, supposedly. But there were too many personalities involved, and no one was entirely sure the others aimed at the same goal. Some nine hundred or so winged guards had their cook-fires crowded between rows of picketed horses in a broad meadow of trampled brown grass. He tried to close his nose to the mingled smells of horses, sweat, dung, and boiling goat meat, an unpleasant combination on a hot day. A dozen mounted sentries rode a slow circuit in pairs, their long, red-streamered lances, all at precisely the same angle. But the rest of the Mayaners had shed breastplates and helmets. Coatless and often shirtless in the sun, they lay sprawled in their blankets or diced as they waited on the food. Some looked up as Perrin passed, a number straightened from what they were doing to study the additions to his party, but none came running, so the patrols were still out. Small patrols, without lances, who could see without being seen. Well, that was the hope. It had been. A handful of Gaishine moved at various chores among the wise ones, low gray-brown tents on the sparsely wooded crest of the hill above the Mayanners. At this distance, the white-robed figures appeared harmless, eyes cast and meek. Up close, they would look the same, but most were Shido. The wise ones claimed Gaishine were Gaishine. Perrin did not trust any Shido out of his sight. Off to one side on the slope, beneath a bedraggled sour gum, perhaps a dozen maidens in cotton sore knelt in a circle around Sulin, the toughest of them, despite her white hair. She had sent out scouts, too, women who could move as fast afoot as the Mayanners on their horses, and were much more likely to escape unwanted attention. None of the wise ones up there were in the open, but a slender woman stirring a large stew kettle straightened, knuckling her back as she watched Perrin and the others pass. A woman in a green silk riding dress. He could see the glare on Masuri's face. Aes Sedai did not stir kettles nor perform twenty other tasks the wise ones had her and Sionid doing. Masuri laid it at Rand's feet, but he was not here, and Perrin was. Given half a chance, she would peel his hide for him. Edara and Navaran turned up that way, even in those bulky skirts barely disturbing the layers of dead leaves that carpeted the ground. Seonid followed, her cheeks still bulging around that scarf. She twisted in her saddle, peering back at Perrin. If he could have believed an Aes Sedai looking anxious, that was what he would have called her. Riding behind her, Furin and Terrell wore scowls. Masuri saw them coming and hastily bent back to the black kettle, stirring with renewed vigor, trying to make out that she had never stopped. So long as Masuri stayed in the wise one's charge, Perrin thought he did not have to worry about his hide. The wise ones seemed to keep a very short leash. Navaran looked back over her shoulder at him, another of those dark stares he had been getting from her and Dara, since sending his warning, 
his threat by the stubble-cheeked fellow. Perrin exhaled in exasperation. He did not have to worry about his pelt unless the wise ones decided they wanted it. Too many personalities, too many goals. Magden rode at Fail's side, seemingly paying no attention to what they passed, but he would not have wagered a split copper on it. Her eyes had widened a hair at sight of the Mayenne sentries. She knew what red breastplates and helmets like rimmed pots meant, as surely as she had recognized an Aes Sedai face. Most people would not have known either, especially not folk dressed as she was. She was a mystery, this Magden. For some reason, she seemed vaguely familiar. Linny and Tallenvor, that was what he had heard Magden call the fellow who had ridden after her, young Tallenvor, though there could not have been more than four or five years between them, if that, stayed as close behind Magden as possible, with Aram in the way, trying to heal Perrin. So did a little stick of a fellow with a pursed mouth called Bolwer, who seemed to pay less heed to their surroundings than Magden pretended. Even so, Perrin thought Bolwer saw more than she did. He could not say why precisely, but the few times he had caught the bony little man's scent, he had been minded of a wolf testing the air. Strangely, there was no fear in Bulwer, only quickly suppressed ridges of irritation shot through with the quivery smell of impatience. The remainder of Megden's companions trailed along well back. The third woman, Brianna, was whispering fiercely to a hulking fellow who kept his eyes down and sometimes nodded silently, sometimes shook his head. A shoulder striker and street tough, if ever there was one, but the short woman had an edge of toughness about her, too. The last man sheltered behind those two, a stout man with a battered straw hat pulled low to hide his face. On him, the sword the men all wore looked as strange as it did on Balwer. The third part of the camp, spread out among the trees just around the curve of the hill from the Mayenners, covered as much ground as the winged guards, though it held far fewer people. Here the horses were picketed well away from the cook fires, so the unblemished smell of dinner filled the air. Roasting goat, this time, and hard turnips the farmers probably had intended to feed to their pigs, even with times as hard as they were. Close on to three hundred Two Rivers men, who had followed Perrin away from home, were tending meat on spits, mending clothes, checking over arrows and bows, all scattered in haphazard clumps of five or six friends around a fire. Nearly every one of them waved and shouted greetings, though there was too much of Lord Perrin and Perrin Golden Eyes to suit him. Bail had a right to the titles they gave her. Grady and Nialt, unsweating in their night-black coats, did not cheer. Standing beside the cook-fire they had built a little away from everyone else, they merely looked at him. Expectant looks, he thought. Expecting what? That was the question he always asked himself about them. The Asherman made him uneasy, more than Aes Sedai or wise ones. Women channeling the power was natural, if not exactly anything a man could be comfortable around. Plain-faced Grady appeared a farmer despite his coat and sword, and kneeled a popinjay with curled mustaches. Yet Perrin could not forget what they were, what they had done at Dumai's Wells. But then he had been there, too. The light help him he had. Pulling his hand from the axe at his belt, he dismounted. Servants, men and women from Lord Dobrin's estates in Carian, came running from the lines where the horses were picketed to take their mounts. None stood taller than Perrin's shoulder, country-clad folk forever bowing and curtsying obsequiously. Fail said he just upset them when he tried to make them stop, or at least not bob around him so often. In truth, that was how they smelled when he did, and they always went back to bobbing in an hour or two. Others, nearly as many as the Two Rivers men, were working with the horses or around the long rows of high-wheeled carts that hauled all their supplies. A few were darting in and out of a large red-and-white tent. As usual, that tent made Perrin grunt gloomily. Berylaine had a larger one back in the Mayenna part of the camp, plus one for her two maids and another for the pair of thief-catchers she had insisted on bringing. Anura had a tent of her own, and Galien as well, but only he and Fail possessed one here. For himself, he would have slept under the sky like the other men from home. They had nothing over them at night but a blanket. There was certainly no fear of rain. 
the Karienan servants bedded down beneath the carts. He could not ask Fail to do that, though, not when Berlane had a tent. If only he could have left Berlane and Karian. But then he would have had to send Fail into Bethal. A pair of banners on tall, fresh-cut poles in the middle of a clear space near the tent soured his mood further. The breeze had picked up a trifle, though it was still too warm. He thought he heard that thunder again, faint in the west. The flags unfolded in slow waves, collapsed to their own weight, rippled open again. His crimson-bordered red wolf head and the red eagle of long-dead Minetherin, out in the open again despite his orders. Perhaps he had stopped trying to hide after a fashion, but what was now Gialdan had been part of Minetherin. Aleandro would not be soothed by hearing of that banner. He managed a pleasant face and a smile for the stocky little woman who curtsied deeply and took Stepper away, but it was a near thing. Lords were supposed to be obeyed, and if he was supposed to be a lord, well, he seemed to be making a poor job of it. Fists on her hips, Megden stood studying those rippling flags as her horse was taken off with the rest. Surprisingly, Brianna had both their bundles held awkwardly. She wore a petulant scowl directed at the other woman. I have heard about banners like those, Megden said suddenly, and angrily. There was no anger in her voice, and her face was smooth as ice, but her fury filled Perrin's nose. They were raised by men in Andor, in the two rivers, who rebelled against their lawful ruler. Ibarra is a two rivers name, I think. We don't know much about lawful rulers in the two rivers, Mistress Megden, he growled. He was going to skin whoever had put them up this time. If stories about rebellion had spread this far, he faced too many complications already without adding more. I suppose Morgaze was a good queen, but we had to fend for ourselves, and we did. Abruptly he knew who she minded him of, Elaine. Not that it meant anything. He had seen men a thousand miles from the two rivers who could have belonged to families he knew back home. Still, she had to have some reason for anger. Her accent could be Andoran. Things aren't as bad in Andor as you might have heard, he told her. Camelin was quiet last I was there, and Rand, the dragon reborn, means to put Morghese's daughter Elaine on the lion throne. Far from being mollified, Magdin rounded on him, blue eyes blazing. He intends to put her on the throne? No man puts a queen on the lion throne. Elaine will claim the throne of Andor by her right. Scratching his head, Perrin wished Fail would stop watching the woman so calmly and say something. But all she did was tuck her riding gloves behind her belt. Before he could think of what to say, Linny darted in, seizing Megden's arm and giving her a shake fit to rattle her teeth. You apologize, the old woman barked. This man saved your life, Megden, and you forget yourself. A simple country woman, speaking so to a lord. Remember who you are, and don't let your tongue land you in hotter water. If this young lord was at odds with Morghese, well, everyone knows she's dead, and it's none of your affair in any event. Now apologize before he grows angry. Megden stared at Lenny, her mouth working, even more startled than Perrin. Again she surprised him, though. Instead of erupting at the white-haired woman, she slowly drew herself up, shoulders squared, and looked him in the eye. Lenny is entirely right. I have no right to speak to you so, Lord Ebara. I apologize. Humbly. And I ask your pardon. Humble? Her jaw was stubborn, her tone proud enough for an Aes Sedai, and her sense said she was ready to chew a hole in something. You have it, Perrin said hastily, which did not seem to placate her one bit. She smiled, and maybe she intended gratitude, but he could hear her teeth grinding. Were women all crazy? They are hot and dirty, husband, Fayil said, putting a hand in at last. And the last few hours have been trying for them, I know. Aram can show the men where to clean themselves. I will take the women with me. I'll have damp cloths brought to wash your hands and faces, she told Megden and Lenny. Gathering up Brianna with a gesture, 
she began herding them toward the tent. At a nod from Perrin, Aram motioned the men to follow him. As soon as you finish your wash, Master Gill, I'd like to talk with you, Perrin said. He might as well have made that spinning wheel of fire. Megden whipped around to gape at him, and the other two women froze in their tracks. Tolanvor was suddenly gripping his sword hilt again, and Balwar rose on his toes, peering over his bundle, head tilting this way, then that. Not a wolf, perhaps. Some sort of bird, watching for cats. The stout man, Basil Gill, dropped his belongings and leaped a foot in the air. Why, Perrin, he stammered, snatching off the straw hat. Sweat made tracks in the dust on his cheeks. He bent to pick up his bundle, changed his mind, and straightened again hastily. I mean, Lord Perrin, I, um, uh, I thought it was you, but with him calling you Lord, I wasn't sure you'd want to know an old innkeeper. Scrubbing a handkerchief across his nearly bald head, he laughed nervously. Well, of course I'll talk to you. Washington can wait a little longer. Hello, Perrin the hulking man said. With his heavy-lidded eyes, Lam Gwyn Dorn appeared lazy despite his muscles and the scars on his face and hands. We heard about young Rand being the dragon reborn, Master Gill and me. Should have figured you'd have come up in the world, too. Baron Ebar is a good man, Mistress Megden. I think you could trust him with anything you've a mind to. He was not lazy, and he was not stupid, either. Aram jerked his head impatiently, and Lamguin and the other two followed, but Talonvor and Balwar dragged their feet, casting wondering glances back at Perrin and Master Gill. Concerned glances. And at the women. Foyle had them moving again as well, though with plenty of darted looks at Perrin and Master Gill, at the men trailing Aram. Suddenly they were not so pleased at being separated. Master Gill mopped his forehead and smiled uneasily. Right, why did he smell afraid, Perrin wondered. Of him? Of a man tied to the dragon reborn, calling himself lord and leading an army, however small, threatening the prophet? Might as well throw gagging Aes Sedai into it, too. He would take the blame for that, one way or another. No, Perrin thought wryly. Nothing in that to frighten anybody. The whole lot of them were probably afraid he might murder them all. Trying to put Master Gill at ease, he led the man to a large oak a hundred paces from the red and white tent. Most of the great tree's leaves were gone, and half those left were brown, but massive limbs spreading low provided a little shade, and some of the gnarled roots stood high enough to serve as benches. Perrin had used one for just that, twiddling his thumbs while camp was being set. Whenever he tried to do anything useful, there were always ten hands snatching it away from him. Basil Gill was not eased. However much Perrin asked after the Queen's blessing, his inn in Camelin, or recalled his own visit there. But then perhaps Gill was remembering that that visit was not the thing to calm a man, with eye said I and talk of the Dark One, and a flight in the night. He paced anxiously, and hugged his bundle to his chest, shifted it from one arm to the other, and answered in a bare handful of words, licking his lips between. Master Gill, Perrin told him finally, stop calling me Lord Perrin. I'm not. It's complicated, but I'm not a lord. You know that. Of course, the round man replied, at last seating himself on one of the oak roots. He appeared reluctant to set his bundled things down, drawing his hands from them slowly. As you say, Lord Perrin, uh, Rand, <clears throat> the Lord Dragon, he really means the Lady Elaine to have the throne? Not that I doubt your word, of course, he added hurriedly. Pulling off his hat, he began mopping his forehead again. Even for such a round man, he seemed to be sweating twice as much as the heat called for. I'm sure the Lord Dragon will do just as you say. His laugh was shaky. You wanted to talk to me, and not about my old inn, I'm sure. Perrin exhaled wearily. He had thought nothing could be worse than old friends and neighbors bowing and scraping, but at least they forgot sometimes and spoke their minds, and none of them was afraid of him. "'You're a long way from home,' he said in a gentle voice. No need to go too fast, not with a man ready to jump out of his skin. "'I wondered what brought you here. Not troubles of any kind, I hope.' 
You tell him right, Basil Gill, then he said sharply, marching up to the oak. No embroidery, mind. She had not been gone very long, yet somehow she found time to wash her face and hands and work her hair into a neat white bun on the back of her head, and to beat most of the dust from her plain woolen dress. Bobbing a perfunctory curtsy in Perrin's direction, she turned to shake a gnarled finger at Gill. Three things annoy to distraction. A tooth that aches, a shoe that pinches, and a man that chatters. So you hold to the point and don't go telling the young lord more than he wants to hear. For a moment she held the gaping innkeeper with an admonitory stare, then abruptly gave Perrin another quick curtsy. He does love the sound of his own voice. Most men do. But he'll tell it to you properly now, my lord. Master Gill glowered at her and muttered under his breath when she waved shut for him to speak. Bony old, was what Perrin heard. What happened, the simple and straight of it, the round man glared at Linny again, but she did not appear to notice, was that I had some business down in Lucard, a chance to import wine, but you're not interested in that. I took Lamguin along, of course, and Brianna, because she won't let him out of her sight an hour she doesn't have to. Along the way we met Mistress Dorlane, Mistress Magdin, as we call her, and Linny and Talenvor, and Bolwar, of course, on the road, near to Lugard. Magdin and I were in service in Murandy, Linny put in impatiently, until the troubles... Talonvor was an armsman to the house, and Balwar the secretary. Bandits burned the manor, and Our Lady couldn't afford to keep us, so we decided to travel together for protection. I was telling it, Linny, Master Gill grumbled, scratching behind his ear. The wine merchant had left Lugard for the country for some reason, and he shook his head. It's all too much to go into, Perrin. Lord Perrin, I mean. Forgive me. You know there's trouble everywhere nowadays, one kind or another. Seems like every time we ran from one kind we found another, and always getting further from Camelin. Till here we are, tired and grateful for a rest. And that's the short of it. Baron nodded slowly. That could be simple truth, though he had learned that people had a hundred reasons for lying, or just shading the truth. Grimacing, he raked fingers through his hair. Light. He was becoming suspicious as a Kyrianin, and the deeper Rand tangled him, the worse it got. Why on earth would Basil Gill, of all people, lie to him? A lady's maid, accustomed to privilege and fallen on hard times? That explained Magdon. Some things were simple. Lenny's hands were folded at her waist, but she watched with a keen eye, no little like a falcon herself, and Master Gill began fidgeting as soon as he stopped talking. He seemed to take Perrin's grimace as a demand for more. He laughed, more on edge than amused. I haven't seen so much of the world since the Aeel War, and I was considerably skinnier then. Why, we've been as far as Amador. Of course, we left after those Shonchan took the city, but truth, they aren't any worse than the White Cloaks that I could... He cut off as Perrin leaned forward abruptly and seized his lapel. Shonchan, Master Gill, are you sure of that? Or is it one of those rumors like the Aiel or I said I? I saw them, Gill replied, exchanging uncertain looks with Linny. And that's what they call themselves. I'm surprised you don't know. Word's been running ahead of us all the way from Amador. The Shonchan want people to know what they're about. Strange people with strange creatures. His voice picked up intensity. Like shadow spawn, big leathery things that fly and carry men, and these things like lizards, only they're big as horses, and they have three eyes. I saw them, I did. I believe you, Perrin said, releasing the man's coat. I've seen them too. At Falma, where a thousand white cloaks died in minutes, and it had taken dead heroes of legend, called by the Horn of Valir, to throw the Shan Chan back. Rand had said they would return, but how could they have so soon? Light. If they held Amador, they had to have Tarabon as well, or most of it. 
Only a fool killed a deer when he knew there was a wounded bear behind his back. How much had they taken? I can't send you to Camelon right away, Master Gill, but if you stay with me a while longer, I'll see you there safely. If staying with him any length of time was safe. The Prophet, White Cloaks, and now maybe Shan Chan added in. I think you're a good man, Linny said suddenly. I'm afraid... We didn't tell you the whole truth, and maybe we should. Linny, what are you saying? Master Gill exclaimed, bounding to his feet. I think the heat's getting to her, he told Perrin, and all the travel. She has strange fancies sometimes. You know how old folks can get. Hush now, Linny. Linny slapped away the hand he was trying to put over her mouth. You mind yourself, Basil Gill. I'll old you... Magden was running from Talinvor, in a manner of speaking, and he was chasing her. We all were. Four days now, and near killing us and the horses both. Well, it's no wonder she doesn't know her own mind half the time. You men snarl up a woman's wits so she can hardly think, then you pretend you've done nothing at all. A lot of you ought to have your ears boxed on general principle. The girl's afraid of her own heart. Those two should be married, and the quicker the better. Master Gill gaped at her, and Perrin was not sure his own mouth might not be hanging open. "'I'm not certain I understand what it is you want of me,' he said slowly, and the white-haired woman leaped in before he was well finished. "'Don't pretend to be dense. I won't believe it in you for a moment. I can see you have more wits than most men. That's the worst habit you men have, making believe you don't see what's plain under your noses.' "'What had happened to all those curtsies?' Folding thin arms across her chest, she eyed him sternly. Well, if you must pretend, I'll set it out for you. This Lord Dragon of yours does whatever he wants, the way I hear. Your prophet picks out people and marries them on the spot. Very well. You snatch up Megden and Talonvor and marry them. He'll thank you, and so will she. When her mind settles. Stunned, Perrin glanced at Master Gill, who shrugged and made a sickly grin. If you will forgive me, Perrin told the frowning woman, I have some matters I must see to. He hurried away, only looking back once, Linny shaking a finger at Master Gill, berating him despite his protests. The breeze was wrong for Perrin to hear what they were saying. In truth, he did not want to. They were all crazy. Verlaine might have her two maids and her thief catchers, but Fayil had her own attendants of a sort. Close on twenty young tyrants in Karienen were sitting cross-legged near the tent, the women in coats and breeches with swords belted on, just like the men. None wore their hair longer than the shoulder, and men and women both had it tied back with a ribbon, imitating the Aiel tail. Perrin wondered where the rest were. They seldom strayed far from the sound of Aiel's voice. Not causing trouble, he hoped. She had taken them under her wing to keep them out of trouble, she said, and the light knew they would have gotten into it left back in Carrion with a great lot of young fools just like them. In Perrin's opinion, the whole lashing of them needed a swift kick in the bottom to knock some sense into them. Dueling, playing at Gietto, pretending to be some sort of Aiel. Idiocy. Lucille rose to her feet as Perrin came closer. A pale little woman with red ribbons pinned to her lapels, small gold hoops in her ears, and a challenging stare that sometimes made the two rivers men think she might like a kiss, despite her sword. Right then the challenge was stony hard. A moment behind her, Arla stood too, tall and dark, with her hair cut short as a maiden's, and her clothes plainer than most of the men's. Unlike Lucille, Arla made it clear she would as soon kiss a dog as any man. The pair made as if to move in front of the tent to block Perrin's way, but a square-chinned fellow in a puppy-sleeved coat barked an order and they sat again. Reluctantly. For that matter, Perlian thumbed that block of a chin as though he might be reconsidering. He'd worn a beard the first time Perrin saw him. Several of the Tyran men had had them, but Aiel did not wear beards. Perrin muttered about foolishness under his breath. They were Fael's to the bone, and the fact that he was her husband meant little. 
Aram might be jealous of his attentions, yet Aram at least shared his affections with Fayil. He could feel the young idiot's eyes on him as he strode inside. Fayil would skin him if she ever learned that he hoped they would keep her from trouble. The tent was tall and spacious, with a flowered carpet for a floor and sparse furnishings that folded for storage on a cart, most of them. The heavy stand mirror certainly could not. Except for brass-bound chests draped with embroidered cloths and doubling as extra tables, straight lines of bright gilt decorated everything down to the washstand and its mirror. A dozen mirrored lamps made the interior nearly as bright as outside, if considerably cooler and there were even a pair of silk hangings dangling from the roof poles, too ornate for parents' taste. Too rigid, with the birds and flowers marching in lines and angles. Dobrain had set them up to travel like Carrion and nobles, though Perrin had managed to lose the worst of it. The huge bed, for one, a ridiculous thing to travel with. It had taken up almost a whole cart to itself. Fayil and Megden were sitting alone together, worked silver cups in hand. They had the air of women feeling one another out, all smiles on the outside, yet with a hint of sharpness to the eyes, a hint of listening for something behind the words, and not a clue as to whether they would hug in the next instant or draw knives. Well, he thought most women would not actually go so far as knives, but Fayil could. Megden appeared much less travel-worn than she had, washed and combed, the dust brushed from her dress. A small mosaic-topped table between them held more cups, and a tall, sweating silver pitcher that gave off the minty scent of herb tea. Both men looked around at his entrance, and for an instant they had almost exactly the same expression, coolly wondering who was barging in and not at all pleased with the interruption. At least Fahil softened hers immediately with a smile. "'Master Gill told me your story, Mistress Dorlane,' he said." You've faced hard days, but you can be sure you're safe here till you decide to leave. The woman murmured thanks over the rim of her cup, but she smelled wary and her eyes tried to read him like a book. Megden also told me their story, Perrin, Fayil said, and I have an offer to make her. Megden, you and your friends have had trying months behind, and you tell me of no prospects ahead. Enter my service, all of you. You will still have to journey, but the circumstances will be much better. I pay well, and I am not a harsh mistress. Perrin voiced his approval immediately. If Fayil wanted to indulge your fancy for taking in strays, at least he wanted to help this lot, too. Maybe they would be safer with him than wandering around alone at that. Choking on her tea, Magdan nearly dropped her cup. She blinked at Fayil, dabbing at the damp on her chin with a lace-edged linen handkerchief, and her chair creaked faintly as she turned, strangely, to study Perrin. I... thank you, she said at last, slowly. I think... Another moment's perusal of Perrin, and her voice picked up. Yes, I thank you, and I accept your kind offer gratefully. I must tell my companions... Rising, she hesitated in setting her cup on the tray, then straightened only to spread her skirts in a curtsy suitable for any palace. I will try to give good service, my lady, she said levelly. May I withdraw? At Fayil's assent, she curtsied again and backed away two steps before turning to go. Perrin scratched his beard. Somebody else who would be bobbing at him every time she turned around. No sooner had the tent flap dropped behind Megden than Fayil put her own cup down and laughed, drumming her heels in the carpet. Oh, I like her, Perrin. She has spirit. I'll wager she would have singed your beard over those banners if I hadn't saved you. Oh, yes, spirit. Perrin grunted. Just what he needed, another woman to singe his beard. I promised Master Gill to look after them, Fayil, but... Can you guess what that Linny asked? She wanted me to marry Magden to that fellow Talonvor. Just stand them up and marry them, whatever they said. She claimed they want it. He filled a silver cup with tea and dropped into the chair Magden had vacated, ignoring its alarming groans under his sudden weight. In any case, that nonsense is the least of my worries. 
Master Gill says it was the Shan Chan took Armador. And I believe him. Light, the Shan Chan. Bail tapped her fingertips together, staring across them at nothing. That might be just the thing, she mused. Most servants do better married than not. Perhaps I should arrange it. And for Brianna, too. The way she went running out of here to check on that big fellow as soon as her face was clean, I suspect they should be already. There was a gleam in her eye. I won't have that kind of behavior in my servants, Baron. It just leads to tears and recriminations and sulking. And Brianna will be worse than he is. Perrin stared at her. Did you hear me? he said slowly. The Sean Chen have captured Amador. The Sean Chen, Payil. She gave a start. She really had been thinking about marrying off those women. Then smiled at him, amused. Amador is a long way yet. And if we do meet with these Sean Chan, I'm sure you will deal with them. After all, you taught me to perch on your wrist, didn't you? That was what she claimed, though he had never seen any sign of it. They might be a touch more difficult than you were, he said dryly, and she smiled again. She smelled extremely pleased for some reason. I'm thinking about sending Grady and Neil to warn Rand no matter what he said. She shook her head fiercely, smiles evaporating, but he pushed on. If I knew how to find him, I would. There has to be some way to get word to him without anyone learning of it. Rand had insisted on that, more than he had on secrecy about Masima. Perrin had been exiled from Rand's presence, and no one was to know anything remained between them except enmity. He knows, Perrin. I'm sure of it. Megden saw pigeon coats everywhere in Amador, and apparently the Sean Chan didn't look at them twice. By this time, any merchant who has business with Amador has heard, and so has the White Tower. Believe me, Rand must have two. You have to trust that he knows best. In this he does. She was not always so certain of that. Maybe, Perrin muttered irritably. He tried not to worry about Rand's sanity, but Rand made Perrin at his most suspicious look like a child skipping in a meadow. How much did Rand trust even him? Rand kept things back, had plans he never let on. Exhaling, Perrin settled back in the chair, gulped a swallow of tea. The truth of it was, mad or sane, Rand was right. If the Forsaken caught a suspicion of what he was up to, or the White Tower did, they would find some way to overturn the anvil on his feet. At least I can give the tower's eyes and ears less to talk about. This time I'm burning that bloody banner. And the wolf head, too. He might have to play at being a lord, but he could do it without a bloody flag. Fayil's full lips pursed judiciously, and she shook her head slightly. Slipping from her chair, she knelt beside him, took his wrist in her hands. Perrin met her level gaze warily. When she looked at him so intently, so seriously, she was about to tell him something important. That, or pull the wool over his eyes and spin him around till he did not know front from back. Her scent told him nothing. He tried to stop smelling her. It was all too easy to lose himself in that. And then she would pull the wool over his eyes. One thing he had learned since marrying, a man needed all of his wits dealing with a woman— too often even that was not enough. Women did what they wanted as surely as I said I. You might want to reconsider, husband, she murmured. A tiny smile quirked her mouth as if she once again knew what he was thinking. I doubt anyone who's seen us since we entered Giladan knew what the Red Eagle is. Around a town the size of Bethel, some will, though. And the longer we have to hunt for Masima the greater the chance. He did not bother with saying that was all the more reason to get rid of the banner. Fayil was no fool, and she thought much faster than he. Then why keep it, he asked slowly, when all it'll do is draw eyes to the idiot everybody will think is trying to pull Manethrin out of the grave. Men had tried that in the past, and women too. The name of Manethrin carried powerful memories, and it was convenient for anyone 
who wanted to start a rebellion. Because it will draw eyes. She leaned toward him intently. To a man trying to raise up Manetherin again. Lesser folk will smile to your face, hope you ride on soon, and try to forget you as soon as you do. As for the greater, they've too much in front of their faces right now to look twice unless you pinch their noses. Compared to the Sean Chan or the Prophet or the White Cloaks, a man trying to raise Manethrin is small turnips. And I think it's safe to say the Tower won't look twice either, not now. Her smile widened, and the light in her eyes said she was about to make her most telling point. But most important, no one will think that man is doing anything else. Abruptly her smile vanished. She stuck a finger against his nose, hard. And don't call yourself an idiot, Perrin the Bashir Eibara. Not even sideways like that. You aren't, and I do not like it. Her scent was tiny spikes, not true anger, but definitely displeased. Quicksilver a kingfisher flashing by faster than thought, certainly faster than his thoughts. It would never have occurred to him to hide so flagrantly. But he could see the sense. It was like concealing the fact that you were a murderer by claiming to be a thief. Yet it might work. Chuckling, he kissed her fingertip. The banner stays, he said. He supposed that meant the wolfhead did too. Blood and bloody ashes. Aleandra has to know the truth, though. If she thinks Rand means to set me up as king of Anethrin and take her lands... Fayil rose so suddenly, turning away, that he was afraid he had made a mistake bringing up the queen. Aleandra could lead to Berlane all too easily, and Fayil smelled... prickly, wary. But what she said over her shoulder was... Aleandra won't be a bit of trouble for Perrin Goldeneyes. That bird's as good as netted husband. So it's time to put our minds on how to find Masima. Kneeling gracefully beside a small chest against the tent wall, the only chest without draperies, she lifted the lid and began removing rolled maps. Perrin hoped she was right about Aleandra, because he did not know what to do if she was wrong. If only he were half what she thought him. Aleandra was a netted bird, the Sean Chan would fall over like dolls for Perrin Golden Eyes, and he would snatch up the prophet and take him to Rand if Masima had ten thousand men around him. Not for the first time he realized that however much her anger hurt and confused him, it was her disappointment he feared. If he ever saw that in her eyes, it would rip the heart out of his chest. He knelt beside her and helped her spread out the largest map covering the south of Gildan, and the north of Amadisia, and studied it as though Masima's name would leap off the parchment at him. He had more reason than Rand to want to succeed. Whatever else, he could not fail Fayil. Fayil lay in the darkness, listening until she was sure that Perrin's breath had the deep rhythm of sleep, then slipped out from the blankets they shared. Rueful amusement touched her as she pulled her linen nightdress up over her head. Did he really think she would not find out that he had hidden the bed deep in a copse one morning while the carts were being loaded? Not that she minded. Not a great deal, at least. She was sure she had slept on the ground as often as he. She had pretended surprise, of course, and made light of it. Anything else, and he would have apologized, perhaps even gone back to fetch the bed. Managing a husband was an art— so her mother said. Had Dira ni Galeen ever found it so difficult? Scuffing her bare feet into slippers, she shrugged into a silk robe, then hesitated, looking down at Perrin. He would be able to see her clearly if he woke, but to her he was just a shadowed mound. She wished her mother were there now to advise her. She loved Perrin with every fiber of her being, and he confused every fiber. Actually understanding men was impossible, of course, but he was so unlike anyone she had grown up with. He never swaggered, and instead of laughing at himself, he was modest. She had not believed a man could be modest. He insisted that only chance had made him a leader, claimed he did not know how to lead, when men who met him were ready to follow after an hour. He dismissed his own thinking as slow, 
when those slow, considering thoughts saw so deeply that she had to dance a merry jig to keep any secrets at all. He was a wonderful man, her curly-haired wolf, so strong and so gentle. Sighing, she tiptoed from the tent. His ears had caused her difficulties before. The camp lay quiet beneath a gibbous moon that gave as much light in a cloudless sky as it normally would have full, a brightness that washed out the stars. Some sort of nightbird cried shrilly, then fell silent at an owl's deep hoot. There was a small breeze, and for a wonder it actually seemed a little cool, probably her imagination. The nights were cool only in comparison to the days. Most of the men were asleep, dark humps among the shadows beneath the trees. A few remained awake, talking around the handful of fires still burning. She made no effort to hide, but none noticed her. Some appeared half asleep where they sat, heads nodding. If she had not known how well the men on sentry duty would be keeping watch, she might have thought the camp could be surprised by a herd of wild cattle. Of course the maidens would be on guard in the night, too, but it did not matter if they saw her either. The high-wheeled carts made long, shadowed rows, the servants already snug and snoring beneath, most of the servants. One fire still crackled there. Megden and her friends sat around it. Talanvor was talking, gesturing fiercely, but only the other men seemed to be paying him any mind, though he appeared to be addressing himself to Megden. That they had had better garb in their bundles than those near rags was not surprising, but their former mistress must have had a very free hand to give out silk to her people, and Megden wore finely cut silk indeed, in a muted blue. None of the others was dressed so well, so perhaps Megden had been their lady's favorite. A twig snapped under Fayil's foot, and heads whipped around, Talonvor starting to his feet, half drawing his sword before he saw her gathering her robe in the moonlight. They were more alert than the two river's men behind her. For an instant the lot of them just stared at her, then Megden rose gracefully and made a deep curtsy, and the others hastily followed her example with varying degrees of skill. Only Megden and Balwer appeared at all at ease. A nervous smile split Gil's round face. "'Go on with what you were doing,' Fail told them kindly. "'But don't stay up too late. Tomorrow will be full.' She walked on, but when she glanced back they were still standing, still peering after her. Their travels must have made them wary as rabbits, always watching for a fox. She wondered how well they would fit in. Over the next few weeks she would be busy training them to her ways— learning theirs. One was as important as the other for a well-run household. The time would have to be found. They did not stay long in her thoughts, though. Soon she was beyond the carts, not quite out to where Two Rivers men would be keeping sharp watch from up in the trees. Nothing larger than a mouse would get by them unseen. Even some of the maidens had been spotted upon occasion, but they were watching for anyone attempting to sneak in. Not for those who had a right to be there. In a small moonlit clearing, her people were waiting. Some of the men bowed, and Perilean nearly went to one knee before stopping himself. Several women instinctively made curtsies that looked quite peculiar in men's garb, then dropped their eyes or shifted in embarrassment at realizing what they had done. The manners of the court had been bred into them, though they tried very hard to adopt Aiel customs. What they believed were Aiel customs, at least— Sometimes they horrified the maidens with what they believed. Perrin called them fools, and they were in some ways, but they had sworn fealty to her, these Kyrianen and Tyrans, water oath they named it, copying the Aeel, trying to, and that made them hers. Among themselves they had taken to calling their society cha Fail, the falcon's talon, though they had seen the necessity of keeping that quiet. They were not fools in all ways. In fact, around the edges, anyway, they were not too unlike the young men and women she had grown up with. Those she had sent off early that morning had just returned, for the women among them were still changing out of the dresses they had worn of necessity. Even one woman dressed as a man would have roused notice in Bethal, not to mention five. The clearing was a great flurry of skirts and shifts, coats and shirts and breeches. The women made believe they did not mind being unclothed in front of others, including men, since the Aiel apparently did not, 
but haste and labored breathing gave them the lie. The men were all shifting feet and turning heads, torn between looking away decently and watching as they thought the Aiel did, while pretending they were not looking at half-dressed women. Fayil held her robe close over her nightdress. She could not have dressed further without waking Perrin for sure, but she made no pretense at comfort. She was no Damani to receive her retainers in her bath. "'Forgive us for being late, my lady Fayil,' Salanda panted, tugging her coat on. The accents of Kyrian were sharp in the short woman's voice. Even for a Kyrianan, she was not tall. She managed a credible swagger, though, a suitable boldness in the tilt of her head and the set of her shoulders. We would have returned sooner, but the gate guards made a bother letting us out. A bother? Fayil said sharply. If only she could have seen with her own eyes on top of theirs. If only Perrin had let her go instead of that trollop. No, she would not think about Berylaine. It was not Perrin's fault. She repeated that to herself twenty times a day, like a prayer. But why was the man so blind? What kind of bother? She drew a chagrined breath. Troubles with your husband should never affect your tone with your vassals. Nothing of note, my lady, Salanda buckled her sword belt and settled it on her hips. They let some fellows ahead of us drive their wagons through without a second look, but they were worried about letting women go out into the night. Some of the other women laughed. The five men who had gone into Bethal stirred irritably, no doubt because they had not been thought enough protection. The rest of Chaf Fayil made a thick semicircle behind those ten, watching Fayil closely, listening closely. Moonlight shadowed their faces. Tell me what you saw, Fayil commanded in a calmer tone. Much better. Salanda made her report concisely, and for all Fayil's wishes that she had gone herself, she had to admit they had seen almost as much as she could have wished. The streets of Bethal were nearly empty even at the busiest hours of the day. People stayed to their own homes as much as possible. A little commerce trickled in and out, but few merchants ventured into this part of Gildan, and barely enough food came in from the countryside to keep everyone fed. Most of the townspeople seemed stunned, afraid of what lay outside the walls, sinking deeper and deeper into apathy and despair. Everyone kept their mouths closed for fear of the prophet's spies, and their eyes as well for fear of being taken for spies. The prophet had a deep effect. For instance, however many bandits roamed the hills— Cut purses and footpads had vanished from Bethel. It was said the prophet's penalty for a thief was to cut off the man's hands, though that did not seem to apply to his own people. The queen tours the city every day, showing herself to keep spirits up, Salanda said. But I do not think it helps much. She is making a progress here in the south to remind people they have a queen. Maybe she has had more success elsewhere. The watch has been added to the wall guards and all but a handful of her soldiers, too. Perhaps it makes the townsfolk feel safer. Until she moves on. Unlike everyone else, Aleandra herself apparently feels no fear the prophet will come storming over the walls. She walks alone in the gardens of Lord Telabin's palace, morning and evening, and keeps only a few soldiers, who spend most of their time in the kitchens. Everybody in the city seems as concerned with food with how long there will be enough, as they are with the prophet. In truth, my lady, for all the guards on the walls, I think if Masima appeared at the gates alone, they might give him the town. They would, Meralda put in contemptuously, buckling her own sword round her waist, and beg for mercy. Dark and stocky, Meralda was as tall as Fail, but the tyrant woman ducked her head at a frown from Salanda, and murmured an apology. There were no doubts who led Shaf Fail after Fail herself. She had been pleased there was no need to change the precedence they had established. Salanda was the brightest of them, except perhaps for Perleon, and only Arala and Kamila were quicker. And Salanda had something extra, a steadiness, as if she had already faced the worst fear in her life and nothing could ever be that bad again. Of course, she wanted a scar like those some of the maidens had. Fail possessed several small scars, badges of honor, most of them, but actually seeking one was idiocy. At least the woman was not too very eager in the map. We made a map, as you required, my lady, the diminutive woman finished with a last warning glance at Meralda. 
We marked out Lord Telebin's palace on the back as much as we could, but I fear that is not much more than the gardens and stables. Fahil did not try to make out the lines on the paper she unfolded in the moonlight. A pity she had not been able to go herself. She could have mapped the interior, too. No, done was done, as Perrin liked to say, and it was enough. You are certain no one searches wagons leaving the city? Even in the pale light she could see confusion on many of the faces in front of her. None knew why she had sent some of them into Bethel. Salanda did not look confused. Yes, my lady, she said calmly, quite bright, and more than quick enough. The wind gusted for a moment, rustling leaves on the trees, rustling dead leaves on the ground, and Fahil wished she had Perrin's ears, his nose and eyes, too. It did not matter if anyone saw her here with her retainers, but eavesdroppers would be something else. You've done very well, Salanda. All of you have. Perrin knew the dangers here, as real as any farther south. He knew, but like most men, he thought with his heart as often as his head. A wife had to be practical to keep her husband out of trouble. That had been her mother's very first piece of advice on married life. At first light, you will return to Bethel, and if you receive word from me, this is what you will do. Even Salanda's eyes widened in shock as she went on, but no one murmured the slightest protest. Fail would have been surprised if anyone had. Her instructions were to the point. There would be some danger, but under the circumstances not nearly what might have been. Are there any questions? she said finally. Does everyone understand? With one voice, Chaf Fail answered, We live to serve Our Lady Fail. And that meant they would serve her beloved wolf, whether he wanted them to or not. Megdin shifted in her blankets on the hard ground, sleep eluding her. That was her name now, a new name for a new life. Megdin for her mother, and Dorlane for a family on an estate that had been hers. A new life for an old life gone, but ties of the heart could not be cut. And now, now... A faint crackle of dead leaves brought her head up, and she watched a dim shape pass through the trees. The Lady Fail returning to her tent from wherever she had gone. A pleasant young woman, kind-hearted and well-spoken. Whatever her husband's stock, she almost certainly was nobly born, but young, inexperienced. That might be a help. Megden let her head fall back on the cloak she had wadded up for a pillow. Light! What was she doing here, taking service as a lady's maid? No. She would hold on to her confidence in herself, at least— she could still find that. She could, if she dug deeply. Her breath caught at the sound of footsteps close by. Talonvor knelt gracefully at her side. He was shirtless, moonlight gleaming on the smooth muscles of his chest and shoulders, his face in shadows. A slight breeze ruffled his hair. What madness is this? he asked softly. Entering service? What are you up to? And don't tell me that nonsense about making a new life. I don't believe it. No one does. She tried to turn away, but he laid a hand on her shoulder. He exerted no pressure, yet it stopped her as surely as a halter. Light, please let her not tremble. The light did not listen, but at least she managed to keep her voice steady. If you haven't noticed, I must make my way in the world now. Better as a lady's maid than a tavern maid. You may feel free to go on alone if service here doesn't suit. You didn't abdicate your wits or your pride when you gave up the throne, he muttered. Burn Linny for revealing that. If you mean to pretend that you did, I suggest you avoid letting Linny get you alone. The man chuckled at her. He chuckled, oh, so richly. She wants a word with Megden, and I suspect she won't be as gentle with Megden as she was with Morgay's. Angrily she sat up, brushing his hand away. Are you blind? And deaf as well? The dragon reborn has plans for Elaine. Light, I wouldn't like it if he simply knew her name. It must be more than chance that brought me to one of his henchmen, Talonvor. It has to be. Burn me, I knew it must be that. I hoped I was wrong, but... He sounded as angry as she. He had no right to be angry. Elaine is safe in the White Tower. 
The Amalyn seat won't let her anywhere near a man who can channel, even if he is the Dragon Reborn, especially if he is. And Megden Dorlane can do nothing about the Amalyn seat, the Dragon Reborn, or the Lion Throne. All she can do is get her neck snapped or her throat cut or— Megden Dorlane can watch, she broke in, at least partly to stop that awful litany. She can listen. She can— Irritably, she trailed off. What could she do? Suddenly she realized she was sitting there in a thin shift and hurriedly folded her blankets around her. The night actually seemed a little cool, or maybe the goosebumps on her skin were from Tullinvor's unseen eyes on her. The thought roused a flush in her cheeks she hoped he could not see. Luckily it put a heat in her voice, too. She was not a girl to go blushing because a man looked at her. I will do what I can, whatever that is. The chance will come to learn something or do something that will help Elaine, and I will take it. A dangerous decision, he told her calmly. She wished she could make out his face in the darkness, only to read his expression, of course. You heard him threaten to hang anyone who looked at him the wrong way. I can believe it in a man with those eyes, like a beast. I was surprised he let that fellow go. I thought he'd rip his throat out. If he discovers who you are, who you used to be, Balwer might betray you. He never really explained why he helped us escape, Amador. Maybe he thought Queen Morgays would give him a new position. Now he knows there's no chance of that, and he might want to curry favor with his new master and mistress. Are you afraid of Lord Perrin Goldeneyes? she demanded contemptuously. Light! The man frightened her. Those eyes belonged on a wolf. Balwer knows enough to hold his tongue. Anything he says will reflect on him. He came with me, after all. If you're afraid, then ride on. You always fling that in my face, he sighed, settling back on his heels. She could not see his eyes, but she could feel them. Ride on if you wish, you say. Once there was a soldier loved a queen from afar. Knowing it was hopeless knowing he could never dare speak. Now the queen is gone, and only a woman remains, and I hope, I burn with hope. If you want me to leave, Magden, say it, one word. Go. A simple word. She opened her mouth. A simple word, she thought. Light, it's only one word. Why can't I say it? Light, please! For the second time that night, the light failed to hear. She sat there huddled in her blankets like a fool, her mouth open, her face growing hotter and hotter. If he had chuckled again, she would have put her belt knife in him, if he had laughed or given any sign of triumph. Instead, he leaned forward and gently kissed her eyes. She made a sound deep in her throat. She could not seem to move. Wide-eyed, she watched him stand. He loomed in the moonlight. She was a queen. She had been a queen, used to command, used to hard decisions in hard times, but right then the pounding of her heart drummed thought from her head. Had you said go, he told her, I'd have buried hope, but I could never leave you. Not until he was back in his own blanket did she make herself lie down and draw hers around her. She breathed as if she had been running. The night was cool. She was shivering, not trembling. Talonvor was young, too young. Worse, he was right. Burn him for that. A lady's maid could do nothing to affect events, and if the dragon reborn's wolf-eyed killer learned that he had more gaze of Andor in his hands, she could be used against Elaine instead of helping her. He had no right to be right when she wanted him to be wrong. The illogic of that thought infuriated her. There was a chance she might do some good. There had to be. In the back of her head, a small voice laughed. You can't forget that you're more gay's tracand, it told her scornfully. And even after she's abdicated her throne, Queen Morgays can't stop trying her hand in the affairs of the mighty, no matter how much ruin she's made of it so far. And she can't tell a man to go away, either, because she can't stop thinking how strong his hands are and how his lips curve when he smiles. And, furious, she pulled the blanket over her head, trying to shut out the voice. She was not staying because she could not walk away from power. As for Talonvor, she would set him firmly in his place. 
This time she would. But what was his place with a woman who was no longer a queen? She tried to put him out of her mind and tried to ignore that mocking voice that would not be quiet. Yet when sleep finally came, she could still feel the pressure of his lips on her eyelids. Chapter Nine, Tangles. Perrin woke before first light as usual, and as usual, Fayil was already up and about. She could make a mouse seem noisy when she wanted to, and he suspected that if he woke an hour after lying down, she would still manage to be up first. The door flaps were tied back, the side panels raised a little at the bottom, and a stir of air rose through the vent hole in the peak, enough to create an illusion of coolness. Perrin actually shivered while searching for his shirt and breeches. Well, it was supposed to be winter, even if the weather did not know it. He dressed in the dark and scrubbed his teeth with salt, needing no lamps. And when he left the tent, stamping his feet into his boots, Fayil had her new servants gathered around her in the deep grayness of early morning, some holding lighted lanterns. A lord's daughter needed servants. He should have arranged for it before this. There were two rivers folk in Camelin that Fayil had trained herself, but with the need for secrecy, there had been no way to fetch them along. Master Gill would want to go home as soon as possible, and Lamguin and Brianna with him. But maybe Megden and Linny would stay. Aram straightened from where he had been sitting cross-legged beside the tent and waited silently on Perrin. If Perrin had not stopped him, Aram would have slept across the entrance. This morning his coat was striped red and white, though the white was a trifle dingy, and even here that wolf-head pummeled sword hilt rose over his shoulder. Perrin had left his axe in the tent and grateful to be rid of it. Dalinvor still wore his sword, belted over his coat, but not Master Gill or the other two. Fayil must have been watching, because no sooner did Perrin come out than she gestured toward the tent, clearly issuing orders. Megden and Brianna came bustling past him and Aram with lanterns, their jaws set, smelling of determination for some reason. Neither curtsied, a pleasant surprise. Linny did, a quick bend of the knee before she darted after the other two, muttering about knowing their place. Perrin suspected Linny was one of those women who saw her place as being in charge. Come to think of it, most women did. That was the way of the world, it seemed, not just the two rivers. Talonvor and Lamguin followed close behind the women, and Lamguin was as serious about bowing as Talonvor, who was almost grim. Perrin sighed and bowed back, and they both gave a start, gaping at him. A curt shout from Linny jerked them into the tent. With only a quickly flashed smile for him, Fahil strode off toward the carts, talking alternately to Basil Gill on one side of her and Seben Balwer on the other. The men each held a lantern out to light her way. Of course, a double handful of those idiots kept pace where they could hear if she raised her voice, strutting and stroking sword hilts and staring about in the dimness as though they expected an attack or hoped for one. Aaron tugged at his short beard. She always found plenty of work to fill her hours, and nobody took it out of her hands. Nobody would dare. Not so much as the first fingers of dawn showed on the horizon yet, but the Karienen were beginning to stir around the carts, and moving more quickly the closer Fayil came. By the time she reached them, they appeared to be trotting, their lanterns bobbing and swinging in the dimness. The two rivers men, used to farmers' days, were already making breakfast, some laughing and roughhousing around their cook fires, some grumping, but most getting the work done. A few tried to stay in their blankets and were unceremoniously tumbled out. Grady and Neild were up, too, as always off by themselves, shadows in black coats among the trees. Perrin could not recall seeing them without those coats, always buttoned to the neck, always clean and unwrinkled come sunrise, whatever they had looked like the night before. Stepping through the forms in unison, the pair were practicing the sword as they did every morning. That was better than their evening practice, when they would sit cross-legged, hands on knees, staring at some distant nothing. They never did anything that anyone could see, yet not a man in the camp but knew what they were about and kept as far off as possible. Not even the maidens would step into their line of sight then. Something was missing, Perrin realized with a start. Fahil always had one of the men meet him first thing with a bowl of the thick porridge they breakfasted on, but it seemed she had been too busy this morning. Brightening, he hurried toward the cook fires, hoping at least to be able to dip his own porridge for once. A small hope. Flan Barsteer, a lanky fellow with a dent in his chin, met him halfway and shoved a carved bowl into his hands. Flan was from up toward Watch Hill, and Perrin did not know him well. 
But they had been hunting together a time or two, and once Perrin had helped him dig one of his father's cows out of a bog hole in the waterwood. The Lady Fayil told me to bring this to you, Perrin, Blan said anxiously. You won't tell her I forgot, will you? You won't tell. I found some honey, and I put in a good dollop. Perrin tried not to sigh. At least Flan had remembered his name. Well, maybe he could not get away with doing the simplest chores for himself, but he was still responsible for the men eating beneath the trees. Without him, they would be with their families, getting ready for the day's chores around the farm, milking cows and cutting firewood instead of wondering whether they might have to kill or be killed before sunset. Gulping down the honeyed porridge quickly, he told Aram to take his ease over breakfast. But the man looked so miserable that he relented, so Aram followed as he made his way around the camp. The journey was not one Perrin enjoyed. Men put down their bowls when he approached, or even stood until he passed. He gritted his teeth whenever somebody he had grown up with, or worse, a man who had sent him on errands as a boy, called him Lord Perrin. Not everyone did, but too many. Far too many. After a time, he gave up telling them to stop out of sheer weariness. All too often the reply was, Oh, whatever you say, Lord Perrin. It was enough to make a man howl. Despite that, he made himself pause to speak a word or two to every man, mainly though he kept his eyes open and his nose. They all knew well enough to keep their bows in good repair and tend the fletching and points on their arrows, but some would wear the soles out of their boots or the bottom out of their breeches without noticing, or let blisters fester because they could not be bothered to do anything about them just yet. Several had the habit of picking up brandy when they could, and two or three of those had no head for it at all. There had been a small village the day before reaching Bethal that held no fewer than three inns. It was very strange. Having Mistress Luhan or his mother tell him he needed new boots or his breeches mended had always been embarrassing, and he was sure he would have been irritated at the same from anybody else. But from grizzled old John Din Baran on down, the two rivers men just said, Why, right you are, Lord Perrin. I'll see to it straight away or some such. He caught a number of them grinning at one another when he moved on. And they smelled pleased. When he rooted a clay jar of pear brandy out of Jory Conger's saddlebags, a skinny fellow who ate twice as much as anyone else, and always looked as if he had not had a bite in a week, Jory was a good shot with a bow, but given a chance he would drink until he could not stand, and he had light fingers besides. Jory gave him a wide-eyed look and spread his hands as if he did not know where the jar had come from. But as Perrin walked on, emptying the brandy onto the ground, Jory laughed. You can't put anything over on Lord Perrin. He sounded proud. Sometimes Perrin thought he was the only sane person left. Another thing he noticed. One and all, they were very interested in what he did not say. Man after man cast an eye toward the two banners that occasionally flapped atop their poles in a brief gust. Red Wolfhead and Red Eagle. They eyed the banners and watched him, waiting for the order he had given every time the things had come out since reaching Gildan. And often enough before that. Except that he had said nothing yesterday, and he said nothing today, and he saw speculation blooming on men's faces. He left behind clusters of men peering at the banners and at him, murmuring excitedly among themselves. He did not try to listen. What would they say if he was wrong, if the White Cloaks or King Auron decided they could look away from the Prophet and the Shan Chan long enough to snuff out a supposed rebellion? They were his responsibility, and he had already gotten too many of them killed. The sun was more than peaking above the horizon, spreading a sharp morning light by the time he finished, and over at the tent Talonvor and Lamguin were lugging out chests under Linny's direction, while Megden and Brianna appeared to be sorting the contents out, on a broad patch of dead grass, blankets and linens mainly, and long bright swaths of silk satin that had been intended to drape the bed he had misplaced. Fayil must have been inside, because that gaggle of idiots were cooling their heels not far off. No carrying and hauling for them, useful as rats in the barn. Theron thought about taking a look at Stayer and Stepper, but when he glanced through the trees at the horse lines, he was seen. No fewer than three of the farriers stepped out anxiously, watching him. They were blocky men in leather aprons, like as eggs in a basket, though Falton had only a fringe of white around his head, Eamon was graying, and Jerisid had not yet come into his middle years. 
Aaron growled at the sight of them. They would hover if he laid a hand on either horse, and goggle if he lifted a hoof. The one time he had tried to change a worn shoe, on stair, all six farriers had darted about, grabbing up tools before he could touch them, nearly knocking the bay over in their rush to do the work themselves. They're afraid you don't trust them, Aram said suddenly. Perrin looked at him in surprise, and Aram shifted his shoulders in his coat. I've talked to them some. They think if a lord tends his own horses, it must be because he doesn't trust them. You might send them off with no way to get home. His tone said they were fools to think that, but he gave Perrin a sideways glance and shrugged again uncomfortably. I think they're embarrassed, too. If you don't behave the way they think a lord should, it reflects on them as they see it. Light, Perrin muttered. Fahil had said the same, about them being embarrassed anyway, but he had believed it just a lord's daughter talking. Fahil had grown up surrounded by servants, yet how could a lady know the thoughts of a man who had to work for his bread? He frowned toward the horse lines. Five of the farriers stood together watching him now. Embarrassed that he wanted to look after his own horses, and upset that he did not want them pulling wool and scratching gravel all over the place. Do you think I ought to act like a fool in silk small clothes? he asked. Aram blinked and began studying his boots. Light, Perrin growled. Spotting Basil Gill hurrying from the direction of the carts, Perrin moved to meet him. He did not think he had done very well at making Gill feel at ease yesterday. The stout man was talking to himself and once more mopping his head with a kerchief, sweating away in a rumpled dark gray coat. The day's heat was beginning to take hold already. He did not see Perrin until Perrin was nearly on him, and then he gave a jump, stuffing the kerchief into a coat pocket and making a bow. He looked curried and brushed fit for a feast day. Ah, my lord Perrin, your lady told me to take a cart into Bethal. She says I'm to find you some two rivers to back if I can. But I don't know if that's possible. Two Rivers Leaf has always been dear, and trade isn't what it was. She's sending you for tabac, Perrin said, frowning. He supposed secrecy had gone down the well, but still. I bought three casks, two villages back, enough for everybody. Gil shook his head firmly. Not Two Rivers Leaf, and your lady says you like that above any other. The Gil Donnan leaf will do for your men. I'm to be your Shambayan, she called it, and keep you and her supplied with what you need. Not much different from what I did running the blessing, really. The similarity seemed to amuse him. His belly shook with quiet chuckles. I have quite a list, though I can't say how much of it I'll find. Good wine, herbs, fruit, candles and lamp oil, oil cloth and wax, paper and ink. Needles, pins, oh, all sorts of things. Talonvor and Lamgwen and I are going, with some of your lady's other retainers. His lady's other retainers. Talonvor and Lamgwen were bringing out yet another chest for the women to sort through. They had to pass by the squatting clump of young fools who never offered to lend a hand. In fact, the layabouts ignored them completely. You keep an eye on that lot, Perrin cautioned. If one of them starts any trouble, if he even looks as if he will, you have Lamgwen crack his head. And if it was one of the women, they were just as likely, maybe more so, Perrin grunted. Bayil's retainers were going to tie his belly into permanent knots yet. Too bad she could not be satisfied with the likes of Master Gill and Megden. You didn't mention Balwer, as he decided to go on alone? Just then, a shift in the breeze brought him Balwer's scent, an alert smell very much at odds with the fellow's almost desiccated exterior. Even for so reedy a man, Balwer made surprisingly little noise on the dried leaves underfoot. In a sparrow brown coat, he offered a quick bow, and his tilted head added to the image of a bird. I am staying, my lord, he said cautiously. Or maybe that was just his manner. As your gracious lady's secretary, and yours, if it pleases you. He stepped closer, very nearly a hop. I am well versed, my lord. I possess a good memory and write a good hand, 
and my lord can be assured that whatever he confides in me will never pass my lips to another. The ability to keep secrets is a primary skill of a secretary. Don't you have pressing duties for our new mistress, Master Gill? Gill frowned at Balwer, opened his mouth, then closed it with a snap. Spinning on his heel, he trotted away toward the tent. For a moment, Balwer watched him go, head to one side, lips pursed thoughtfully. I can offer other services as well, my lord, he said finally. Knowledge. I have overheard some of my lord's men speaking, and I understand that my lord may have had some difficulties with the children of the light. A secretary learns many things. I know a surprising amount about the children. With any luck I can avoid white cloaks, Baron told him. Better if you knew where the prophet is, or the Shonchan. He did not expect any of that, of course, but Balwer surprised him. I cannot be certain, of course, but I think the Shonchan have not spread far beyond Amador as yet. Fact is difficult to sift from rumor, my lord, but I keep my ears open. Of course, they do seem to move with unexpected suddenness. A dangerous people with large numbers of Terabana soldiers. I believe from Master Gill that my lord knows of them, but I observed them closely in Amador, and what I saw is at my lord's disposal. As to the prophet, there are as many rumors concerning him as the Shonchan, but I believe I can say reliably that he was recently at Abila, a largish town some forty leagues south of here. Balwar smiled thinly, a brief, self-satisfied smile. "'How can you be so sure?' Perrin said slowly. "'As I said, my lord, I keep my ears open. The prophet reportedly closed a number of inns and taverns, and tore down those he considered too disreputable. Several were mentioned, and by chance I happen to know there are inns of those names in Abila.' I think there is little chance another town would have inns with the same names. He flashed another narrow smile. He certainly smelled pleased with himself. Perrin scratched his beard thoughtfully. The man just happened to remember where some inns that Masima supposedly had torn down were located. And if Masima turned out not to be there after all, well, these days rumors sprouted like mushrooms after rain. Balwar sounded a man trying to build up his own importance. Thank you, Master Balwer. I'll keep that to mind. If you hear any more, be sure to tell me. As he turned to go, the man caught his sleeve. Balwer's skinny fingers leaped away immediately, as though burned, and he made one of those bird-like bows, dry-washing his hands. Forgive me, my lord. I hesitate to press, but do not take the white cloaks too lightly. Avoiding them is wise, but it may not be possible. They are much closer than the Shonchan. Eamon Valda, the new Lord Captain Commander, led most of their numbers toward northern Amadisia before Amador fell. He was hunting the Prophet also, my lord. Valda is a dangerous man, and Radam Asunawa, the Grand Inquisitor, makes Valda seem pleasant. And I fear neither has any love for your own lord. Forgive me. He bowed again, hesitated, then went on smoothly. If I may say so, my lord's display of Manetherin's banner is inspired. My lord will be more than a match for Valda and Asinawa if he takes care. Watching him bow himself away, Perrin thought he knew part of Balwar's story now. Clearly, he also had run afoul of the White Cloaks. That could take no more than being on the same street with them, a frown at the wrong time, but it seemed Balwer had a grudge. A sharp mind, too, seeing right away about the Red Eagle. And a sharp tongue with Master Gill. Gill was on his knees beside Megden, talking rapidly despite Linny's effort to hush him. Megden had turned to stare after Balwer as the fellow hurried through the trees toward the carts. But now and then her gaze swung to Perrin. The rest of them clustered close to her, P. 
peering now at Balwer, now at Perrin. If he had ever seen a group of people worried about what somebody else had said, it was they. But what were they worried he might have heard? Backbiting, probably. Tales of resentments and misdeeds, real or imagined. People cooped up together tended to start pecking at one another. If that was it, maybe he could put a stop before somebody drew blood. Talonvor was fondling his sword hilt again. What did Fael intend to do with the fellow? Aram, I want to go talk to Talonvor in that lot. Tell them what Balwer said to me. Just slide it into the talk, but tell everything. That should soothe fears of tail-bearing. Fael said servants needed to be made to feel at home. Make friends with them if you can, Aram. But if you decide to moon over one of the women, be sure it's Linny. The other two are taken. The man had a smooth tongue for any pretty woman, but he managed to look surprised and offended both. As you wish, Lord Perrin, he muttered sulkily. I'll catch you up quickly. I will be over with the Aiel. Aram blinked. Ah, yes. Well, it might take a while at that if I'm to make friends with them. They don't look like they much want friends to me. This from a fellow who stared suspiciously at anyone except Fael who came near Perrin, and never smiled for anyone not wearing a skirt. Nevertheless, he went over and squatted on his heels where he could speak to Gil and the others. Even from a distance their standoffishness was plain. They continued with their work, only now and then saying a word to Aram, and they looked at each other as often as at him. Skittish as green quail in summer, when the foxes were teaching the cubs to hunt. But at least they were talking. Perrin wondered what mischief Aram had gotten up to with the Aiel. There did not seem to have been any time for it. But he did not wonder long. Any serious trouble with Aiel usually meant someone dead and not the Aiel. In truth, he was not so eager to meet the wise ones himself. He walked around the curve of the hill, but instead of climbing the slope, his feet carried him all the way to the Mayenners. He had stayed away from their camp as much as possible, too, and not simply because of Verilane. There were disadvantages to having too keen a nose. Fortunately, a freshening breeze was carrying most of the stink away, though it did little for the heat. Sweat rolled down the faces of the mounted sentries in their red armor. At the sight of him, they sat up even more rigidly in their saddles, which was saying something. Where the two rivers men rode like fellows heading out to the fields, the Mayenners usually were statues on horseback. They could fight, though. The light said there was no need. Javi and Norella came running, buttoning up his coat before Perrin was well past the sentries. The dozen or so other officers followed at Norella's heels, all coated and some fastening the straps of their red breastplates. Two or three carried helmets with thin red plumes tucked under their arms. Most were years older than Norella, some twice his age, graying men with hard, scarred faces. But Norella's reward for helping to rescue Rand had been to be named Galien's second, his first lieutenant, they called it. The first hasn't returned yet, Lord Perrin, Norella said making a bow mirrored by the others. A tall, slender man, he did not look as young as he had before Dumai's wells. There was an edge to his eyes, which had seen more blood than most veterans of twenty battles. But if his face was harder, there was still an eagerness to please in his scent. To Javi and Norella, Perrin Ebarra was a man who could fly or walk on water as he chose. The morning patrols saw nothing. Those that are back... I would have reported otherwise. Of course, Perrin told him. I just wanted to look about a bit. He simply meant to walk around until he could work up his nerve to face the wise ones, but the young Mayenner followed him with the rest of the officers, anxiously watching for Lord Perrin to find some flaw in the winged guards, wincing whenever they came on bare-chested men tossing dice on a blanket, or some fellow snoring away with the sun on the climb. He need not have bothered... To Perrin, the camp looked laid out with a plumb line and level. Each man had his blankets and his saddle for a pillow, not more than two paces from where his horse was tied to one of the long ropes drooping between chest-high poles, set upright in the ground. A cook fire stood every twenty paces, with lances stacked in steel-tipped cones between. 
The hole made a sort of box around five peaked tents, one striped golden blue and larger than the other four combined. All very different from the two rivers men's every which way arrangement. Perrin walked along briskly, trying not to look too much a fool. He was not sure how much success he was having. He itched to stop and look over a horse or two, just to be able to pick up a hoof without somebody practically fainting. But mindful of what Aram had said, he kept his hands to himself. Everyone seemed as startled as Norella at his pace. Tough-eyed bannermen chivied men to their feet, only to have parents stride by with a nod before they were all upright. A puzzled murmur trailed in the air behind him, and his ears caught a few comments about officers, lords in particular, that he was just as glad Norella and the others missed. Finally he found himself on the verge of the camp, staring up the brushy slope toward the wise one's tents. Only a few of the maidens were visible among the scattered trees up there, and some of the guy shine. Lord Perrin, Norella said hesitantly, the I said I. He stepped closer and lowered his voice to a hoarse whisper. I know they swore to the Lord Dragon, and I've seen things, Lord Perrin. They do camp chores. I said I. This morning, Masuri and Seonid came down to fetch water. And yesterday, after you returned, yesterday I thought I heard someone up there crying out. It couldn't have been one of the sisters, of course, he added hurriedly, and laughed to show how ridiculous the idea was. A very shaky laugh. You... you will see that everything is all right with them? He had ridden into forty thousand Shido, leading two hundred lancers, but talking about this had him hunching his shoulders and shifting his feet. Of course, he had ridden into forty thousand Shido because an Aes Sedai wanted him to. I'll do what I can, Perrin muttered. Maybe matters were worse than he had thought. Now he had to stop them getting worse still, if he could. He would rather have faced the Shido again. Norella nodded as though Perrin had promised all he had asked and more. That is well, then, he said, sounding relieved. Casting sideways glances at Perrin, he worked himself up to say something else, but apparently this was not so touchy as the eye said I. I heard that you let the Red Eagle stay. Perrin very nearly jumped. Even for just around the hill, news had traveled fast. It seemed the thing to do, he said slowly. Berylane would have to know the truth, yet if too many knew, that truth would spread from the next village they passed, the next farm. This used to be part of Manetherin, he added, as if Norella did not know that perfectly well. Truth. He had gotten so he could bend truth like an Aes Sedai, and to men on his side. Not the first time that flag's been raised around here, I'll warrant but none of those fellows had the dragon reborn behind him. And if that did not set the necessary seeds, he did not know how to plow a furrow. Abruptly he realized that what seemed every last one of the winged guards was watching him with their officers, no doubt wondering what he was saying, after all but running through that way. Even the lean, balding old soldier Galien called his dog robber had come out to stare, and Bear Lane's maids, a pair of plump, plain-faced women, garbed to match their mistress's tent. Perrin had hardly seen a thing, but he knew he had to give some sort of praise. Raising his voice enough to carry, he said, The winged guards will do my end proud if we ever face another Dumai's wells. Those were the first words that came to mind, but he winced at saying them. To his shock, shouting rose straight away among the soldiers, cheering, Perrin Golden Eyes, and Mayen for Golden Eyes, and Golden Eyes and Manetherin. Men danced and capered, and some snatched lances from the stacks to shake them so the red streamers waved in the breeze. Grizzled bannermen watched them with arms folded, nodding approval. Norella beamed, and not only him. Officers with gray in their hair and scars on their faces grinned like boys praised at their lessons. Light, he was the only sane man left. He prayed never to see another battle. Wondering whether this was going to cause trouble with Berylane, he made his goodbyes with Norella and the others, 
and tramped up the slope through dead or dying brush, none of it waist-high. Brown weeds crackled beneath his boots. Shouting still filled the Mayenna camp. Even after she learned the truth, the first might not be pleased to have her soldiers cheering him this way. Of course, that could have good points. Maybe she would be angry enough to stop pestering him. Short of the crest, he paused, listening to the cheers finally fade away. No one was going to cheer him here. All of the side flaps were down on the wise one's low gray-brown tents, closing them in. Only a few of the maidens were in sight now. Squatting easily on their heels beneath a leather leaf that still showed some green, they eyed him curiously. Their hands moved quickly in that way they had of talking among themselves with signs. After a moment, Sulan rose, shifting her heavy belt knife, and strode in his direction, a tall, wiry woman with a pink scar across her sun-dark cheek. She glanced back down the way he had come and seemed relieved that he was alone, though it was often hard to tell with Aiel. That is good, Paranebara, she said quietly. The wise ones have not been pleased that you make them come to you. Only a fool displeases wise ones, and I have not taken you for a fool. Perrin scrubbed at his beard. He had been keeping clear of the wise ones and the Aes Sedai as much as possible, but he had had no intention of forcing them to come to him. He just found their company uncomfortable, to put it mildly. Well, I need to see Adara now, he told her, about the Aes Sedai. Perhaps I was mistaken after all, Sulin said dryly. But I will tell her. Turning, she paused. Tell me something. Terrell Winter and Furin Alhara are close to Siona Tryon, like first brothers with a first sister. She does not like men as men, yet they offer to take her punishment for her. How could they shame her so? He opened his mouth, but nothing came out. A pair of Gaishine appeared from the reverse slope, each leading two of the Aiel's pack mules. The white-robed men passed within a few paces, heading down toward the stream. He could not be sure, but he thought both were Shido. The pair kept their eyes meekly down, barely looking up enough to see where they were going. They had had every opportunity to run away, doing chores like that without anyone to watch. A peculiar people. I see you are shocked, too, Sulin said. I had hoped you could explain. I will tell Adara. As she started for the tents, she added over her shoulder, You wetlanders are very strange, Perinebara. Perrin frowned after her, and when she vanished into one of the tents, he turned to frown at the two guy shine, leading the horses to water. Wetlanders were strange? Light. Cinderella had been right in what he heard. It was beyond time to stick his nose into what was going on between the wise ones and the eye eye. He should have before this... He wished he did not think it would be the same as sticking his nose into a hornet's nest. It seemed to take a long time for Sulin to reappear, and she did little to help his mood when she did. Holding the tent flap for him, she flicked his belt knife contemptuously with a finger as he ducked through. You should be better armed for this dance, Paranebara, she said. Inside, he was surprised to find all six wise ones sitting cross-legged on colorful tasseled cushions, their shawls tied around their waists and their skirts making carefully arranged fans across the layered rugs. He had hoped for just Adara. None looked to be more than four or five years older than he, some no older at all, yet somehow they always made him feel as if he were facing the oldest members of the women's circle, the ones who had spent years learning to sniff out whatever you wanted to hide. Separating one woman's scent from another's was all but impossible, but he hardly needed to. Six sets of eyes latched onto him, from Janina's pale sky blue to Marlene's purple twilight, not to mention Navarin's sharp green. Every eye could have been a skewer. Adara brusquely motioned him to take a cushion himself, which he did with gratitude, though it put him facing them all in a semicircle. Maybe wise ones had designed these tents to make men bend their necks if they wanted to stand upright. Strangely, it was cooler in the dim interior, but he still felt like sweating. 
Maybe he could not pick one from another, yet these women smelled like wolves studying a tethered goat. A square-faced guy, Shine, who was half again as big as he was, knelt to offer a golden cup of dark wine punch on an elaborate silver tray. The wise ones already had mismatched silver cups and goblets. Unsure what it meant that he was being offered gold, maybe nothing, yet who could say with Aiel, Perrin took it cautiously. It gave off the scent of plums. The fellow bowed meekly enough when Adara clapped her hands and bent himself out of the tent backward, but the half-heeled slash down his hard face had to date from Demise Wells. Now that you are here, Adara said as soon as the tent flap dropped behind the guy shine, we will explain again why you must kill the man called Masima Dagar. We should not have to explain again, Dolora put in. Her hair and eyes were nearly the same shade as Megden's, but no one would call her pinched face pretty. Her manner was pure ice. This Masima Dagar is a danger to the Karakan. He must die. The Dreamwalkers have told us, Peranebara. Corella certainly was pretty, and though her fiery hair and piercing eyes made her look as though she had a temper, she was always mild, or a wise one, and certainly not soft. They have read the dream. The man must die. Perrin took a swallow of plum punch to gain a moment. Somehow the punch was cool. It was always the same with them. Rand had not mentioned any warning from the dreamwalkers. The first time Perrin had mentioned that, only the once, they had thought he was casting doubt on their word, and even Corella had gone hot-eyed. Not that Perrin thought they would lie. Not exactly. He had not caught them in one anyway. But what they wanted for the future, and what Rand wanted, what he himself wanted for that matter, might be very different things. Maybe it was Rand who was keeping secrets. If you could just give me some idea what this danger is, he said finally. The light knows Masima's a madman, but he supports Rand. A fine thing if I go around killing people on our side. That will certainly convince people to join Rand. Sarcasm was lost on them. They looked at him unblinking. The man must die, Adara said at last. It is enough that three dreamwalkers have said so, and six wise ones tell you. The same as always. Maybe they did not know any more than that, and maybe he should get on with why he had come. I want to talk about Sionid and Missouri, he said, and six faces turned to frost. Like these women could stare down a stone. Setting the wine cup beside him, he leaned toward them stubbornly. I'm supposed to show people I said I sworn to Rand. He was supposed to show Mosima, actually, but this did not seem a good time to mention that. They aren't going to be very cooperative if you lot beat them. Light, they're I said I. Instead of making them haul water, why don't you learn from them? They must know all sorts of things you don't. Too late, he bit his tongue. The Aiel women did not take offense, though. Not that it showed, anyway. They know some things we do not, Dolora told him firmly, and we know some they do not. As firmly as a spear point in the ribs. We learn what there is to learn, Perrin Ebara, Marlene said calmly, combing nearly black hair with her fingers. She was one of the few Aiel he had seen with such dark hair, and she often toyed with it. And we teach what there is to teach. In any event, Janina said, it is none of your affair. Men do not interfere between wise ones and apprentices. She shook her head over his foolishness. You may stop listening outside and come in, Siona Trigon, Adara said suddenly. Perrin blinked in surprise, but none of the women batted an eye. There was a moment of silence, then the tent flap twitched aside, and Sionid ducked inside, kneeling quickly on the rugs. That vaunted Aes Sedai serenity was shattered in her. Her mouth was a thin line, her eyes tight, her face red. She smelled of anger, frustration, and a dozen more emotions, all whirling about so quickly that Perrin could barely separate any out. "'May I speak to him?' she asked in a stiff voice. 
If you take care what you say, Edora told her. Sipping her wine, the wise one watched over the rim of her cup. A teacher watching a pupil? A hawk watching a mouse? Perrin could not be sure. Except that Adara was very sure of her place, whatever the pairing. So was Sionid. But that did not carry over to him. She twisted around to face him on her knees, back going straight, eyes heated. Anger raged in the smell of her. Whatever you know, she said angrily, whatever you think you know, you will forget. No, there was not a shred of serenity left in her. Whatever is between the wise ones and us is for us alone. You will stand aside, avert your eyes, and keep your mouth closed. Amazed, Perrin raked his fingers through his hair. Light, you're upset because I know you got a switching, he said incredulously. Well, he would have been too, but not alongside the rest. Don't you know these women would as soon cut your throat as look at you? Slit your throat and leave you by the side of the road? Well, I promised myself I wouldn't let that happen. I don't like you, but I promised to protect you from the wise ones or the Ashimano Rand himself. So come down off that high horse. Realizing he was shouting, he drew a deep, embarrassed breath and settled back on his cushion, snatched up his wine cup and took a long drink. Siona went stiffer by the word with indignation, and her lip curled well before he finished. You promised, she sneered. You think I said I need your protection? You— Enough, Adara said quietly, and Sionid's jaw snapped shut, though her hands made white-knuckled fists clutching her skirts. What makes you think we would kill her, Perrin Ebara? Janina asked curiously. Aiel seldom showed much on their faces, but the others frowned at him, or looked with open incredulity. I know how you feel, he replied slowly. I've known since I saw you with the sisters after Dumai's wells. He was not about to explain that he had smelled their hatred, their contempt, every time a wise one looked at an Aes Sedai back then. He did not smell it now, but no one could maintain that level of fury for long without bursting. That did not mean it was gone, only that it had sunk deep, maybe into the bone. Dolores snorted, a sound like linen ripping. First you say they must be cuddled because you need them, and now because they are Aes Sedai and you have promised to protect them. Which is truth, Perrin Ebara? Both. Perrin met Dolores' hard gaze for a long moment, then eyed each of the others in turn. Both are true, and I mean both. The wise ones exchanged glances the sort where every flicker of an eyelid held a hundred words and no man could make out a one. Finally, in a shifting of necklaces and readjusting of tied shawls, they appeared to reach agreement. We do not kill apprentices, Paranebara, Navaran said. She sounded shocked at the idea. When Randall Thor asked us to apprentice them, perhaps he thought it was just to make them obey us, but we do not speak empty words. They are apprentices now. They will remain so until five wise ones agree they are ready to be more, Marlene added, sweeping her long hair over her shoulder. And they are treated no differently than any others. Adara nodded over her wine cup. Tell him the advice you would give him concerning Masima Dagar, Sionid Trigan, she said. The kneeling woman had practically writhed during Navarin and Marlene's short speeches, gripping her skirt until Perrin thought the silk might rip, but she wasted no time complying with Adara's instructions. The wise ones are right, whatever their reasons. I do not say this because they wish it. She drew herself up again, smoothing her features with a visible effort. A touch of heat still flared in her voice, though. I saw the work of so-called dragon sworn before I ever met Randolph Thor. Death and destruction to no purpose. Even a faithful dog must be put down if he begins to foam at the mouth. Blood and ashes, Baron grumbled. How can I even let you in the sight of the man after that? You swore fealty to Rand. You know that isn't what he wants. What about that? Thousands will die if you fail. 
Light of Missouri felt the same. Then he had to put up with Aes Sedai and wise ones for nothing. No worse. He would have to guard Masima from them. Masuri knows Masima for rabbit as well as I, Sion had replied when he put the question to her. All of her serenity had returned. She regarded him with a cool, unreadable face. Her scent was sharply alert, intent. As if he needed his nose, with her eyes fixed on his, big and dark and bottomless. I swore to serve the dragon reborn, and the best service I can give him now is to keep this animal from him. Bad enough that rulers know Masima supports him. Worse if they see him embrace the man. And thousands will die if you fail to get close enough to Masima to kill him. Perrin thought his head would spin. Again an Aes Sedai whirled words about like a top, made it seem she had said black when she meant white. Then the wise ones added their bit. Masuri Sakawa, Navaran said calmly, believes the rabid dog can be leashed and bound so he may be used safely. For an instant, Sion had looked as surprised as Parent felt, but she recovered quickly. Outside she did. Her scent was suddenly wary, as if she sensed a trap where she had not expected one. She also wishes to fit you for a halter, Perrin Ebara, Corella added, even more casually. She thinks you must be bound also to make you safe. Nothing on her freckled face told whether she agreed. Adara raised a hand towards Theonid. You may go now. You will not listen further, but you may ask Garadin again to let you heal the wound on his face. Remember, if he still refuses, you must accept it. He is Gaishine, not one of your wetlander's servants. She invested that last word with depth of scorn. Seonid stared icy augurs at Perrin. She looked at the wise ones, her lips trembling on the brink of speech. In the end, though, all she could do was go with as good a grace as she could muster. Outwardly, that was considerable, an Aes Sedai being Aes Sedai, fit to shame a queen. But the scent she trailed behind her was frustration sharp enough to cut. As soon as she was gone, the six wise ones focused on Perrin again. Now, Idara said, you can explain to us why you would put a rabid animal next to the Karakan. Only a fool obeys another's command to push him over a cliff, Navarin said. You will not listen to us, Janina said, so we will listen to you. Speak, Perrin Ebara. Perrin considered making a break for the door flaps, but if he did, he would leave behind one Aes Sedai, who might possibly be of some doubtful help, and another, along with six wise ones, who were all set to ruin everything he had come to do. He put his wine cup down again, and settled his hands on his knees. He needed a clear head if he was to show these women he was no tethered goat. Chapter 10 Changes When Perrin left the wise one's tent, he considered removing his coat to see whether his hide was still attached and whole. Not a tethered goat, maybe, but a stag with six she-wolves on his heels, and he was unsure what fast feet had gained him. For certain, none of the wise ones had changed her mind, and their promises not to take any action on their own had been vague at best. About the Aes Sedai, there had been no promises, even foggy ones. He looked for either of the sisters and found Masuri. A narrow rope had been tied between two trees and a fringed red and green rug draped over it. The slender brown was flailing away with a bent wood beater, raising thin clouds of dust, motes that floated glittering in the mid-morning sun. Her warder, a compact man with dark receding hair, sat on a fallen tree trunk nearby, watching her glumly. Robert Kirkland normally had a ready grin, but it was buried deep today. Missouri caught sight of Perrin, and with barely a pause in her rug beating, shot him a look of such frozen malevolence that he sighed. And she was the one who thought as he did. As close to it as he was likely to find, anyway. A red-tailed hawk passed overhead, riding rising currents of hot air from hill to hill without flapping its outstretched wings. It will be very nice to soar away from all this, the iron in front of him, not dreams of silver. Nodding to Sulin and the maidens, who might have taken root under that leather leaf, Perrin turned to go and stopped. Two men were climbing the hill, 
one an eye eel in the grays and browns and greens of the cotton sore, his cased bow on his back, a bristling quiver at his belt, and his spears and round hide buckler in hand. Gaul was a friend and the only man among the Aiel who did not wear white. His companion, a head shorter in a broad-brimmed hat and coat and breeches of a plain dull green, was no Aiel. He had a full quiver at his belt, too, and a knife even longer and heavier than the Aielman's, but he carried his bow, much shorter than a Two Rivers longbow, though longer than the horn bows of the Aiel. Despite his clothes, he did not have the look of a farmer or a city man either. Perhaps it was the graying hair tied at the nape of his neck and hanging to his waist, the beard fanning across his chest, or perhaps just the way he moved, much like the man at his side, slipping around the brush on the hill so that you were sure no twigs snapped in his passing, no weeds broke under his foot. Farron had not seen him in what seemed a very long time. Reaching the hilltop, Elias Machera regarded Perrin, golden eyes shining faintly in the shadow of his hat brim. His eyes had been that way years before Perrin's. Elias had introduced Perrin to the wolves. He had been dressed in hides then. Good to see you again, boy, he said quietly. Sweat glistened on his face, but little more than on Gaul's. You give away that axe finally? I didn't think you'd ever stop hating it. I still do, Perrin said, just as quietly. A long time ago, the one-time warder had told him to keep the axe until he stopped hating to use it. Light, but he still hated it. And he had added new reasons now. What are you doing in this part of the world, Elias? Where did Gaul find you? He found me, Gaul said. I did not know he was behind me until he coughed. He spoke loudly enough to be heard by the maidens, and the sudden stillness among them was solid as a touch. Perrin expected at least a few cutting comments. Io humor could near draw blood, and the maidens seized any chance to dig at the green-eyed man. But instead, some of the women took up spears and bucklers to rattle them together in approbation. Gaul nodded approval. Elias grunted ambiguously and tugged his hat down, yet he smelled pleased. The Aiel did not approve of much this side of the dragon wall. I like to keep moving, he told Perrin. And I just happened to be in Gieldan when some mutual friends told me you were traveling with this parade. He did not name the mutual friends. It was unwise to speak openly about talking to wolves. Told me a lot of things. Told me they smell a change coming. They don't know what. Maybe you do. I hear you've been running with the Dragon Reborn. I don't know, Perrin said slowly. A change? He had not thought to ask the wolves anything more than where large groups of men were, so he could go around them. Even here in Gieldan, sometimes he felt blame among them for the wolves dead at Dumai's Wells. What kind of change? Rand is surely changing things, but I couldn't say what they mean. Like the whole world is turning somersaults, and never mind him. All things change, Gull said dismissively. Until we wake, the dream drifts on the wind. For a moment he studied Perrin and Elias, comparing their eyes, Perrin was sure. He said nothing about them, though. The Aiel seemed to take golden eyes as just one more peculiarity among wetlanders. I will leave you two to talk alone. Friends long separated need to talk by themselves. Sulin, Archiad, and Bane about... I saw them hunting yesterday and thought I might show them how to draw a bow before one of them shoots herself. I was surprised to see you come back today, the white-haired woman replied. They went out to set snares for rabbits. Laughter rippled through the maidens and fingers flickered rapidly in hand talk. Sighing, Gaul rolled his eyes ostentatiously. In that case, I think I must go cut them loose. Almost as many maidens laughed at that, including Sulin. May you find shade this day, he told Perrin, a casual farewell between friends, but he clasped forearms formally with Elias and said, My honor is yours, Elias Machera. Odd fellow, Elias murmured, watching Gaul lope back down the hill. When I coughed, he turned around ready to kill me, I think. Then he just started laughing instead. 
You have any objections to going somewhere else? I don't know the sister who's trying to murder that rug, but I don't like taking chances with Aes Sedai. His eyes narrowed. Gaul says there are three with you. You don't expect to be meeting up with any more, do you? I hope not, Perrin replied. Masuri was glancing their way between slashes with the beater. She would learn about Elias's eyes soon enough and start trying to ferret out what else linked him to Perrin. Come on, it's time I was back in my own camp anyway. Are you worried about meeting an Aes Sedai who knows you? Elias's days as a warder had ended when it was learned he could talk to wolves. Some sisters thought it a mark of the Dark One, and he had had to kill other warders to get away. The older man waited until they were a dozen paces from the tents before he replied, and even then he spoke quietly, as though he suspected someone behind them might have ears as good as theirs. One who knows my name will be bad enough. Warders don't run off often, boy. Most Aes Sedai will set free a man who really wants to go. Most will. And anyway, she can track you down however far you run if she decides to hunt. But any sister who finds a renegade will spend her idle moments making him wish he'd never been born. He shivered slightly. His smell was not fear, but anticipation of pain. Then she'll turn him over to his own Aes Sedai to drive the lesson home. A man's never quite the same after that. At the edge of the slope, he looked back. Masuri did seem to be trying to kill the carpet, focusing all her rage on attempting to beat a hole through it. Elias shivered again, though. Worst thing would be to run into Rena. I'd rather be caught in a forest fire with both legs broken. Rena's your eye, said I. But how could you run into her? The bond lets you know where she is. That nudged something in Perrin's memory, but whatever it was melted away at Elias's reply. A fair number can fuzz the bond, in a manner of speaking. Maybe they all can. You don't know much more than she's still alive, and I know that anyway, because I haven't gone crazy. Elias saw the question on his face and barked a laugh. Light, man. A sister's flesh and blood, too. Most are. Think about it. Would you want somebody inside your head while you cuddled up with a likely wench? Sorry, I forgot you were married now. No offense meant. I was surprised to hear you'd married a Saldean, though. Surprised? Perrin had never considered that about the water bond. Right. For that matter, he had never really thought about Aes Sedai that way. It seemed about as possible as... as a man talking to wolves. Why surprised? They started down through the trees on this side of the hill, not hurrying and making little noise. Perrin had always been a good hunter, accustomed to the forests, and Elias hardly disturbed the leaves underfoot, gliding smoothly through undergrowth without shifting a branch. He might have slung his bow on his back now, but he still carried it ready. Elias was a wary man, especially around people. Why? Because you're a quiet sort, and I thought you'd marry somebody quiet, too. Though you know by now Sardaeans aren't quiet, except with strangers and outsiders— Set the sun on fire one minute, and the next, it's all blown away and forgotten. Make our felon look stolid and Domani downright dull. Elias grinned suddenly. I lived a year with a Saldean, once, and Muria shouted my ears off five days in the week, and maybe heaved the dishes at my head, too. Every time I thought about leaving, though, she'd want to make up, and I never seemed to get to the door. In the end, she left me, said I was too restrained for her taste. His rasping laugh was reminiscent, but he rubbed at a faint, age-faded scar along his jaw reminiscently, too. It looked to have been made by a knife. Fail's not like that. It sounded like being married to Nynaeve. Nynaeve with sore teeth. I don't mean she doesn't get angry now and then, he admitted reluctantly. But she doesn't shout and throw things. Well, she did not shout very often, and instead of flaring hot and vanishing, her anger started hot and dragged on till it turned cold. Elias glanced at him sideways. If I ever smelled a man trying to dodge hail... You've been giving her soft words all the time, haven't you? 
mild as milk water, and never lay your ears back? Never raise your voice to her? Of course not, Baron protested. I love her. Why would I shout at her? Elias began muttering under his breath, though Perrin could hear every word, of course. Burn me. A man wants to sit on a red adder. It's his affair. Not my business if a man wants to warm his hands when the roof's on fire. It's his life. Will he thank me? No, he bloody well won't. What are you going on about? Perrin demanded. Catching Elias' arm, he pulled him to a stop beneath a winterberry tree, its prickly leaves still mostly green. Little else nearby was except for some struggling creepers. They had come less than halfway down the hill. Fail isn't a red adder or a roof on fire. Wait until you meet her before you start talking like you know her. Irritably, Elias raked fingers through his long beard. I know, Saldaeans, boy. That year wasn't the only time I've been there. I've only ever met about five Saldean women I'd call meek or even mild-mannered. No, she isn't an adder, but what she is is a leopard, I'll wager. Don't growl, burn you. I'll bet my boots she'd smile to hear me say it. Perrin opened his mouth angrily, then closed it again. He had not realized he was growling deep in his throat. Bayil would smile at being called a leopard. You can't be saying she wants me to shout at her, Elias. Yes, I am. Most likely, anyway. Maybe she's the sixth. Maybe. Just hear me out. Most women, you raise your voice, and they go bugle-eyed or ice. And next thing you know, you're arguing about you being angry, never mind what put the ember down your back in the first place. Swallow your tongue with a Saldean, though, and to her, you're saying she isn't strong enough to stand up to you. Insult her like that, and you're lucky she doesn't feed you your own gizzard for breakfast. She's no far-matting wench, to expect a man to sit where she points and jump when she snaps her fingers. She's a leopard, and she expects her husband to be a leopard, too. Light, I don't know what I'm doing. Giving a man advice about his wife is a good way to get your innards spilled. It was Elias's turn to growl. He jerked his hat straight unnecessarily and looked around the slope frowning as though considering whether to vanish back into the forests, then poked a finger at Perrin. Look here. I always knew you were more than a stray, and putting what the wolves told me together with you just happening to be heading toward this prophet fellow, I thought maybe you could use a friend to watch your back. Of course the wolves didn't mention you were leading those pretty Mayenner lancers. Neither did Gaul till we saw them. If you'd like me to stay, I will. If not, there's plenty of the world I haven't seen yet. I can always use another friend, Elias. Could Fayil really want him to shout? He'd always known he might hurt somebody if he was not careful, and he always tried to keep a tight rein on his temper. Words could hurt as hard as fists. The wrong words... Words you never meant, let loose in a temper. It had to be impossible. It just stood to reason. No woman would stand for that, from her husband or any man. A bluefinch's call brought Perrin's head up, ears pricking. It was just at the edge of hearing, even for him. But a moment later the trill was repeated closer, then again, nearer still. Elias cocked an eyebrow at him. He would know the call of a borderland bird— Perrin had learned it from some Shinarans, Masima among them, and taught the two rivers men. We have visitors coming, he told Elias. They came quickly. Four riders at a fast canter, arriving before he and Elias reached the bottom of the hill. Berylane led the way, splashing across the stream with Anura and Galien close behind, and a woman in a pale hooded dust cloak at her side. They swept right by the Mayenner camp without a glance, not drawing rain until they were in front of the red and white striped tent. Some of the Kyrianan servants rushed to take bridles and hold stirrups, and Berylane and her companions were inside before the dust of their arrival settled. All in all, the arrival created quite a stir. A buzz rose among the two rivers men that Perrin could only call anticipatory. The inevitable gathering of Fayil's young fools scratched their heads and stared at the tent, chattering excitedly among themselves. 
Grady and Neil watched the tent through the trees, too, now and then leaning together to talk, though nobody was close enough to hear anything they said. Looks like your visitors are more than casual, Elias said quietly. Watch Galien. He could be trouble. You know him, Elias? I'd like you to stay, but if you think he might tell one of the sisters who you are... Perrin shrugged in resignation. I might be able to stop Siona or Missouri. He thought he could. But I think Anura will do whatever she wants. And what did she really think about Masima? Oh, Bertin Galien doesn't know the likes of Elias Machera, Elias replied with a wry grin. More fools know Jack Fool than Jack Fool knows. I know him, though. He won't go against you or behind your back, but Berlane has the brains between them. She's kept Tyr out of Mayenne by playing the tyrants against the Ilianas since she was sixteen. Berlane knows how to maneuver. All Galien knows is attack. He's good at it, but he never sees anything else, and sometimes he doesn't stop to think. I'd figured that out about both of them, Perrin muttered. At least Berlane had brought a messenger from Aleandra. She would not have come rushing in that way with a new maid. The only question was why Aleandra's reply needed a messenger. I had best find out whether the news is good, Elias. Later we'll talk about what lies south. And you can meet Fail, he added before turning away. The pit of doom lies south, the other man called after him, or as close to it as I expected to see below the blight. Perrin imagined he heard that faint thunder in the west again. Now that would be a pleasant change. In the tent, Brianna was carrying a silver tray about with a bowl of rose-scented water and cloths for washing faces and hands, curtsying stiffly as she presented it. With even stiffer curtsies, Megden was offering a tray holding cups of wine punch, made with the last of the dried blueberries by the smell, while Linny folded the newcomer's dust cloak. There seemed something odd in the way Fayil and Verlaine stood to either side of the new woman, and Anura hovered behind them, all focused on her. Somewhere in her middle years, with a cap of green net gathering dark hair that fell almost to her waist, she might have been pretty if her nose had not been so long, and if she had not carried it so high. Shorter than Fayil or Verlaine, either one, she still managed to look down that nose at Perrin, coolly examining him from hair to boots. She did not blink at sight of his eyes, although nearly everyone did. Majesty, Berylaine pronounced in a formal voice as soon as Perrin entered. May I present Lord Perrin Ebara of the Two Rivers in Andor, the personal friend and emissary of the Dragon Reborn. The long-nosed woman nodded carefully, coolly, and Berylaine went on with scarcely a pause. Lord Ebara, give greetings and welcome to Alejandra Maritha Kegarin. Queen of Gieldan, blessed of the light, defender of Garen's wall, who was pleased to receive you in person. Galien, standing near the tent wall, adjusted his eye patch and raised his wine cup to Perrin with a smile of triumph. For some reason, Fael shot Berylaine a hard look. Perrin's mouth nearly dropped open. Aleandra herself? He wondered whether he should kneel, then settled for a bow after too long a pause. Light. He had no notion how to deal with a queen, especially one who turned up out of the blue with no escort, without a jewel in sight. Her dark green riding dress was plain wool, lacking a single stitch of embroidery. After the recent news, Aleandra said, I thought I should come to you, Lord Ebara. Her voice was calm, her face smooth, her eyes aloof, and observant, or he was a Taran ferryman. Best to step warily till he knew how the path lay. You may not have heard, she continued, but four days ago Ilion fell to the dragon reborn. Blessed be his name in the light. He has taken the laurel crown, though I understand it is now called the crown of swords. Fael, taking a cup from Megden's tray, whispered under her breath, And seven days ago the Shonshan took Ebudar. Even Megden did not notice. If Perrin had not already taken hold of himself, he truly would have gaped. Why did Fayil tell him this way instead of waiting for it to come from the woman who must have told her? 
In a voice that everyone could hear, he repeated her words. A hard voice, but that was the only way to keep it from shaking. Abu Dar, too. Light. And seven days ago? The day Grady and the others had seen the one power in the sky. Coincidence, maybe? But would he rather it had been the Forsaken? Anura frowned over her cup, pursing her lips, before he finished speaking, and Berylin gave him a startled look that vanished quickly. They knew he had not known about Ebu Dar when they rode into Bethal. Aleandra merely nodded, every bit as self-possessed as the Grey. You seem remarkably well informed, she said, coming closer to him. I doubt the first rumors are reaching Johanna with the river trade yet. I myself learned of it only a few days ago. Several of the merchants keep me abreast of events. I believe, she added dryly, that they hope I can intercede for them with the prophet of the Lord Dragon, if such becomes necessary. At last he could pick out her scent, and his opinion of her changed, though not for the worse. Outwardly, the queen was all cool reserve, but uncertainty shot through with fear filled the smell of her. He did not believe he could have held his face so calm had he felt that. Always best to know as much as you can, he told her, half distracted. Burn me, he thought. I have to let Rand know about this. In Saldea we find merchants useful for information, too, Bayil said, implying that was how Perrin knew about Ebu Dar. They seem to learn what happened a thousand miles off weeks before the rumors begin. She did not look at Perrin, but he knew she spoke to him as much as Aleandra. Rand knew, she was saying. And anyway, there was no way to get word to him in secret. Could Vayu really want him to? No, it was unthinkable. Blinking, he realized he had missed something Aleandra had said. Your pardon, Aleandra, he said politely. I was thinking about Rand, the dragon reborn. Of course it was unthinkable. Everyone stared at him, even Linny and Megden and Brianna. Anura's eyes had gone wide, and Galien's mouth hung open. Then it hit him. He had just called the queen by name. He took a cup from Megden's tray, and she rose from her curtsy so quickly that she nearly knocked it from his hand. Waving her absently away, he wiped his damp hand on his coat. He had to concentrate here, not let his mind wander in nine directions. No matter what Elias thought he knew, Bayil would never... No! Concentrate! Aleander recovered her equilibrium quickly. In truth, she had appeared the least surprised of anyone, and her scent never wavered. I was saying that coming to you in secret seemed the wisest course, Lord Ebara, she said in that cool voice. Lord Telebin believes I am keeping private in his gardens, which I left by a seldom-used gate. Passing out of the city, I was Anura Sadai's maid. Brushing fingertips across one skirt of her riding dress, she gave a small laugh. Even that about her was cool, so at odds with what his nose told him. A number of my own soldiers saw me, but with the hood of my cloak pulled up, none knew me. Times being what they are, that was probably wisest, Perrin said carefully. But you will have to come into the open sooner or later, one way or another. Polite and to the point, that was the thing. A queen would not want to waste time with a man who blathered, and he did not want to disappoint Fayil by acting the hayfoot again. Why come at all? All you had to do was send a letter or just tell Berylane your answer. Will you declare for Rand or not? Either way, have no fear about getting back to Bethel safely. A good point, that. Whatever else frightened her, being here alone must. Fayil was watching him, pretending not to, sipping her punch and directing her smiles at Aleandra, but he caught the quick flickers of her eyes in his direction. Berling made no pretense, watching quite openly, eyes slightly narrowed and never leaving his face. Anura was just as intent, just as thoughtful. Did they all believe he was going to trip over his own tongue again? Instead of answering the important question, Aleandra said, The first told me a great deal about you, Lord Ebara, and about the Lord Dragon Reborn, blessed be his name in the light. 
That last sounded by rote, in addition she no longer had to think about. I cannot see him before I make my decision, so I wish to see you, to take a measure of you. It's possible to tell much about a man by those he chooses to speak for him. Tilting her face down toward the cup in her hands, she peered at him through her lashes. From Berylane that would have been flirtatious, but Aleandra was cautiously watching a wolf, sure as he was standing in front of her. I also saw your banners, she said quietly. The first did not mention them. Perrin scowled before he could stop himself. Berylane had told her a great deal about him. What had she said? The banners are meant to be seen. Anger put a roughness in his voice that required some effort to force down. Now, Berylane was a woman who needed shouting at. Believe me, there are no plans to set up Manetherin again. There. His tone was as cool as Aleandra's. What is your decision? Bran can have ten thousand soldiers, a hundred thousand, here in the blink of an eye, or near enough. And he might have to. The Sean Chan and Amador and Abu Dar? Right, how many were they? Aleandra sipped delicately at her wine punch before speaking, and again she dodged the question. There are a thousand rumors, as you must know, and even the wildest is believable when the dragon is reborn, strangers appear claiming to be Otter Hawkwing's armies returned, and the tower itself is broken by rebellion. A matter for I said I. Anura said sharply. It concerns no one else. Berylane flashed an exasperated look at her, which she affected not to notice. Aleandra flinched and turned her shoulder to the sister. Queen or not, no one wanted to hear that tone from an Aes Sedai. The world is turned upside down, Lord Ebara. Why, I've even had reports of Aiel sacking a village right here in Gieladan. Abruptly, Perrin realized there was more here than anxiety over offending Aes Sedai. Aleandra watched him, waiting. But for what? Reassurance? The only Aiel and Gieldan are with me, he told her. The Shan Chan may be descendants of Arter Hawkwing's army, but Hawkwing is a thousand years dead. Rand dealt with 